Section 1 of Travels to Oaxaca. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. Travels to Oaxaca, capital of the province of the same name, in the Kingdom of Mexico by Monsieur Nicholas Joseph Thierry de Menonville, advocate to Parliament and botanist to the King. An anonymous translation from the French. Section 1. After communicating to the Minister of His Majesty, at the head of the Naval Department, the plan I had laid of naturalizing the Nopal and cochineal insect in the French colonies, and receiving with his approbation of my design the means requisite for ensuring its success i made all diligence to put this plan in practice in this view i embarked for port a prince and arrived there after a passage equally tedious and fatiguing of sixty-six days tired and disgusted with the sea I determined on enjoying ease for the space of a month or two on shore, a relaxation for which length of time appeared to me necessary towards my becoming acquainted with the mode to be adopted for penetrating into the interior of the Spanish territory bordering on that belonging to France, whence I expected to find a more ready conveyance to Veracruz or to Honduras already i had formed schemes for proceeding to santo domingo or at any rate for seeking at the cape an opportunity of reaching havana by the vessels of the asiento company which pass between that place and the cape in the traffic for slaves but i could not disguise from myself that either of these two plans was attended with inconvenience in the first place I might experience a tedious delay by waiting at the Cape till a vessel should sail for the Havana. On the other hand, a journey to Santo Domingo would present many difficulties to an individual unacquainted either with the roads or the usages of the inhabitants. And naturally alarmed by the accounts he received of the little intercourse subsisting between the colonists of the two nations i was still wavering in opinion respecting the most prudent plan to adopt when by one of those fortunate events which occasionally in my travels i was so happy to experience i was relieved from all perplexity i learned that a merchant of port au prince was about to dispatch a brigantine to havana for the purpose of recovering the cargo of a vessel which had been wrecked in its vicinage Instantly, altogether mindless of the comforts I began to enjoy in a country which I had so ardently desired to see, disregarding the want even which I physically experienced of some repose, I resolved to avail myself of this opportunity. Repairing, therefore, to the intendant of the colony, I obtained from him a passport in which I was designated botanist and physician this latter title to which i had just pretensions possessing a diploma for the practice of physic i conceived would enable me to travel with additional pleasantness and render me less suspected than i might otherwise be in my incursion into new spain to conclude i received in lieu of six thousand livres promised me by the minister of the navy no more than four thousand a circumstance occasioned by the deficiency of money in the treasury however small this sum i refrained from all contentions in the matter i was indeed far more fearful of not undertaking the voyage than of the want of comforts to which i might be exposed nay after a nice computation of the amount i might need i decided on carrying with me no more than two thousand livres nor let my decision be charged with arising from a sordid parsimony 
it was not for my individual benefit i thus made a retrenchment from the expense incident on an undertaking of such importance and resolved on submitting to every sacrifice to ensure its completion no by thus acting i preserved a resource in case of the failure of my first attempts eventually i might meet with opposition to my views at the havana and waste there much time and money in which case i should have means left for trying other expedients seeing that porto bello cartagena and st thomas de honduras were so many other roads i might attempt with prospect of success indeed i computed on no other heavy expenses than those which the different charges for passage would occasion as i made up my mind beforehand to subsist on bread and water on my journey supported by the pleasing reflection that should i meet with shipwreck i yet had two planks remaining one in the hands of a trusty friend and the other in the royal treasury my preparations were simply and speedily effected a few clothes some fruit and other refreshments but especially a number of vials flasks cases and boxes of all sizes comprised the whole of my little cargo i embarked on the twenty first january seventeen seventy seven on board the brigantine dauphin pierced for sixteen guns and an excellent sailor at ten p m we weighed anchor and by eight the next morning under favor of a breeze from the east were abreast of the point of gonave we steered on different tacks the whole of the twenty second in the channel of gonave by eight p m we were under mount lewis and attempted to double the point of st mark the wind blew from the northeast and enabled us to effect this object in course of the night which was remarkably fine a meteor resembling an arrow of fire shot horizontally from east to west through the atmosphere at an elevation of eight hundred toises five thousand feet its course marked by a broad train of light by morning on the twenty third we had passed point st mark and distinguished the bay of gonave and the table of st nicholas mole at noon we perceived from one point gonave point maisi in the island of cuba and the crazy cape cape afu of st nicholas mole the shores of cuba on this eastern side seem to me of equal elevation with those of santo domingo the twenty fourth at ten in the morning i observed two very light and broken clouds resembling reeds spreading through the space of a league and crossing each other at obtuse angles whence i conjectured that in the upper regions of air two very different currents existed one of which by obtaining predominance over the other would necessarily cause the wind to change which at that period filled our sails this day we coasted along the whole of the southeastern shores of the island cuba in length at least thirty leagues the lands in this part are so high that during almost the whole day the clouds floated below the summit of the mountains the coast very lofty towards the east becomes insensibly less steep as you proceed southwest until at length it sinks into a low shore at cape cruz the country has a barren appearance the mountains are steep and craggy with many black rocks which project considerably and there is no appearance either of cultivation or inhabitants we were but four leagues off this coast and distinguished at the time that of jamaica when the moon rose we noticed a repetition of the phenomenon of the crossing clouds on the twenty fifth a moderate wind assisted by the currents carried us out of sight of the shores of cuba we caught a fish two feet long 
weighing six pounds and beautifully marked with blackish vertical stripes at eight p m the wind freshened to that degree we were obliged to lower our main top gallants take in our sweeps and reef our topsails the sea ran high and the vessel pitched terribly fortunately the moon now at her full afforded us a welcome light the wind during the twenty sixth still continued violent with a heavy sea but this gradually became more calm as the wind which was from the northeast abated of its force the wind continued on our quarter during the remainder of the day so that we made nine knots an hour at noon we discovered the island of caymans very low almost covered by the sea and apparently four leagues distant we were now on the parallel of the jardin de la reina expecting on the morrow to see the island of pozos of wells at eight we caught a carank a kind of perch the evening was serene the wind abaft from the west at eight o'clock more than five hundred porpoises were seen frolicking before us in the water of these one was taken five feet long this which was a female i dissected and described at three p m on the twenty seventh we perceived el jardin de la reina low islands adjacent to that of pines we therefore had made a progress of sixty leagues from yesterday the whole night we had fair weather with a good breeze but as all the currents off this coast run towards the shore we were under necessity of steering southwest till daybreak with little sail out on the twenty eighth we again steered northwest by eight in the morning we made the island of pines this is a very long island on it are three mountains and a flat country covered with lofty trees and seemingly adapted to cultivation at three p m we distinguished the eastern cape preceded by a chain of mountains some of them separate from the others this cape consists of low lands which stretch into the sea the distance of six leagues we made off here ten knots an hour with a brisk gale from the north northeast in the evening we distinguished cape st antonio but as there are breakers four leagues out at sea we dared not venture to double it during the night we therefore steered with little sail till eleven at night making frequent tacks but the man at the helm being overcome with sleep by two a m we found ourselves steering for land a league only ahead immediately we changed our tack and backed sails at five a m we resumed our course and doubled the cape at a league distant the lowlands of this cape appear fertile being covered with large and beautiful trees at eleven o'clock we were near the shallows on which we perceived the vessel whose cargo we came to demand these shallows abound in little islets and extend from seven to eight leagues out to sea in a direction north and south the water above them is of an emerald green brilliant and pellucid when looked at in a glass the color of the surrounding sea is a deep blue the greatest depth of water in this bank does not exceed eight feet so that not the smallest craft dare venture to cross it at right angles when upon the skirts of this shallow we saw distinctly the bottom veined black and white though there was fifteen fathoms of water we immediately veered about and steered northwest and saw a french vessel imitate us we were obliged all night long to steer upon different tacks first northwest and then southwest the wind being adverse the thirtieth the wind blew still from the same point with less or greater violence whether the men at the helm had steered false during the night or whether the ship had deflected from her course owing to the currents we found ourselves three leagues to leeward of our reckoning 
indeed we again distinguished the vessel belonging to the owner of our ship near the shore bearing southeast and by it a boat leaving a cove in its vicinage the thirty-first we found ourselves fifteen leagues from the shoal in fact after tacking by four p m we again had sight of cape st antonio four leagues before us in the evening a mizzling shower obscured objects from our view but after the rain the wind veered to the north when we steered eastward the first of february in the morning the wind blowing from the southeast we directed our course northward during the whole night we ran along the coast steering east northeast but out of sight of land the winds were this day so adverse that spite of our reckoning we were much embarrassed to know where we were but supposed ourselves near to land and being unwilling to continue out of sight of it we steered southeast under easy sail throughout the night on the second at daybreak we made land three leagues distant but were unconscious what part by noon however we clearly distinguished a sorry hamlet composed of a few straw houses which we ascertained to be Batayuda. we now continued our course with all sails set and under main and mizzen top gallants nevertheless we were unable to fetch the havana though we had a highly picturesque prospect in our run of twelve leagues along the coast of very lofty mountains with sudden and most pleasing intervals the mountains from the effect of shade occasionally appeared perpendicular at length night came on when we found ourselves opposite a very large mountain here we backed sails the whole coast bounded by shoals the whole distance from cape st antonio appears to be very unhealthy we remained opposite this mountain the whole night for fear of passing the havana the precise site of which was unknown to us in order not to near the land too close taking care to keep constantly sounding the wind on this occasion which was very violent and the strength of the currents gave us constant trouble and much fatigued our crew on the third at dawn we had deflected nearly ten leagues toward the east southeast and were opposite marion's table a remarkable object the form of which is described in the journal of a previous voyage this table is the annunciator of the havana which is situate three leagues beyond and is readily distinguished by two hills near to each other in the shape of the female breast we now unfurled all sails and by nine in the morning distinguished the city as soon as within sight of it we hoisted the french flag an instant after we saw three flags raised as signals on a bastion of fort moro the view of the city the havana occasioned in me a singular emotion the cities of our colonies resemble nothing better than an assemblage of fishermen's huts constructed in lines but the fortresses of the havana its numerous domes its lofty steeples the red tops of its houses its high and white buildings all give it the appearance of an european town and powerfully awakened in me the recollection of my darling country from the rampart we were directed through a speaking trumpet to cast anchor but the noise of the waves breaking against the rocks the whistling of the wind and the clamor of the crew combined to prevent our comprehending exactly what was prescribed and consequently our obedience of the prescription nay allowing that the injunctions had been fairly understood as we could not conceive the necessity of them they yet would have been disregarded hence partly from chance partly from design availing ourselves of the wind and tide which carried us forward through the narrow strait almost in spite of exertion we steered under full sail into the mouth of the port 
thus by one of those adventurous darings which are common perhaps to frenchmen alone we cut short many ceremonies it is indeed true had the commander of the fort been a man more inclined to form and severity than the one who fortunately for us was in station we should not have acted thus without imminent risk of a few ungrateful salutes from twenty-four pounders the whole city assembled to enjoy the spectacle of a foreign ship entering the port without first casting anchor the captain who afterwards carried me to vera cruz was among the number he told me that our temerity occasioned him the utmost astonishment and that ours was the only vessel which had ever made so bold an attempt without having cause for repentance be this as it may beyond the moro fort we were met by the barge of the captain of the port making towards us with great speed and which completed our pilotage to an anchoring by him we were conducted into the basin and placed in front of the government house under the cannon of the captain of the port we had scarcely cast anchor before we were surrounded by a number of boats in which were many idlers and inquisitive individuals who immediately boarded us four officers of the customs came in the number who were succeeded by a major of the navy with four soldiers from the ship of the admiral of the port a vessel of sixty-four guns finally the aide-major of the place with a sergeant and four fusiliers seconded them our brigantine was crowded and resembled a prize the officers of the contadores and those belonging to the navy and the land service separately interrogated us and received our declarations in writing of the motives of our voyage for my part i stated that i was a botanist and came with intention of herborizing in reply to the consequent question if we had not plants in our own country i acknowledged that we were not deficient in that respect but that those of the havana had the credit of possessing superior virtues this like all those representations which flatter spanish vanity attracted towards me a degree of consideration which was the more augmented when by a viso of my passport they noticed i was a regular physician at this instant also a passenger secretly and in confidence imparted to some of the spaniards that i was not only a physician but one also of great eminence who however wished to hide my abilities fearful if they should become public that i might be impelled to exercise them in the city this communication much increased the respect shown to me from several quarters while at anchor we had notice given that we could not be permitted to land and two guards belonging to the contador were left on board until orders should be received from the governor who was absent and not expected to return before a week should pass learning this we resolved on addressing a memorial to him but were void of expectation of any answer before the lapse of two days we were consequently obliged to arm ourselves with patience one of our passengers having ventured to land and proceeded so far as to pass for the captain of the ship was detected in his imposture and sent back under a guard of four musketeers this act of imprudence was nigh being of serious injury to us it caused us to be looked upon with suspicion and we in consequence were very narrowly watched for three successive nights i observed their boats which relieved one the other every hour and were constantly rowed round our ship sounding with grapplings to determine whether or no anything had been cast overboard in the daytime also nothing was allowed to leave the ship without being first subject to the nicest scrutiny so little congenial with my feelings was this mode of life 
that it caused me to look upon our ship as a prison. The fancy had a powerful effect on me. Whether to this, whether to the thick and heavy air we breathed in the port, enclosed as it is by hills on every side, the complaint was to be ascribed, I felt a violent headache and breathed with great difficulty, succeeded to these symptoms of fever with prognostics of a serious disorder. I immediately had recourse to a strict diet and pectoral and refreshing potations, and the very day wrote to Monsieur Dorira, the intendant of the port, to the Marquis de la Tour, the governor, and to Don Juan Davo, the king's lieutenant, exposing in my letters that my profession was one which could give no room for suspicion, and my state of health, such as rendered confinement on board the ship not only very irksome, but even dangerous. I represented to them, moreover, the persuasion I felt from the high opinion held of them by the public in general, that under the circumstances I detailed, they would offer no objection to my request to be allowed to go on shore. By eight o'clock in the morning next day, I dispatched my letters, and as early as nine, I received a most obliging and favorable answer from the intendant. But already the king's lieutenant, apprehensive for my health, the injury I sustained, which had been confirmed to him, sent the aide major of the place on board to bring me on shore and offer me the house of one of his friends for my residence until I should recover. I immediately left the ship, leaving my effects on board, fearful of the arrival of some counter order, and afterwards paid a visit to the two gentlemen mentioned for the purpose of returning them my thanks. In Monsieur Dorira, formerly consul at Bordeaux, I noticed a highly prepossessing physiognomy, a serious but at the same time mild deportment, accompanied by much affability, every appearance of a worthy character, and finally somewhat French in his manners. He is a knight of the Order of St. Charles, and respecting his deserts, his integrity and benevolence, there exists but one and that a highly flattering opinion. Don Juan de Vaux is one of those veteran and gallant military characters whom experience has rendered consummate in his duty, full of frankness and possessed of that noble-mindedness which is almost ever the concomitant of real bravery. He is a brigadier of the armies and general inspector of the colony. Both these gentlemen received me in the most handsome manner, begging my pardon for their ignorance of my indisposition. They proffered their services to me in every respect, and to confirm definitely the order for my landing, which hitherto had been but provisional. I held a long discourse with the intendant on subjects regarding natural history, commerce, and manufactures. On his part, he related to me with much gratification to himself the fact of certain bees which had accidentally been transported to the Havana from Florida, having multiplied to such a degree as to produce a very important branch of commerce and taxation, and this in the very limited space of six years. For the king's lieutenant, he made many inquiries respecting the population of our colony in Saint Domingue, its actual strength in European soldiers, colonial troops, and militia. He frankly exposed to me those of the island of Cuba, and testified a full confidence in the perpetuation of the alliance subsisting between France and Spain. He was so obliging to admit my request of being allowed to pay my respects to him, as also was the intendant. He even solicited me to make my visits frequent, an invitation of which I availed myself with much satisfaction during my stay. On leaving them, I took a lodging in an inn in the Great Square, where then the Palace of Government was building. 
and where already the office of accounts contadoria had been completed the land air liberty the grateful reception i experienced these combined had a very salutary influence on my health which was almost instantly evinced three days were sufficient to effect my perfect restoration i then had opportunity of surveying the whole of the town and its environs and began to augur favorably of my travels end of section one Section 2 of Travels to Oaxaca by Nicholas Joseph Thierry de Menonville, an anonymous translation from the French. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the return of the governor, I hastened to pay my respects to him. The intendant had already acquainted him with my landing. He received me with kindness and granted me permission to herborize within the precincts of the city. But while the appeal of humanity to his finer feelings enacted a grant of wider extension, the imperious obligation of the law forbade the allowance. He even in express terms prohibited my advancing further inland than ten leagues from the city. I returned him thanks in the most cordial manner for the license I received, and not only at my request obtained leave to pay my respects to him but after taking coffee was politely invited to dine with him the succeeding day i found him surrounded by many persons of rank as well military as others to whom he introduced me and especially don luis huet director general of the engineers and of fortifications whom he informed me was of french extraction on my praising a very beautiful squirrel from Mexico, of which, as well as of a parrot, I begged his permission to take a likeness, he insisted on my accepting both the one and the other, but this excess of liberality I declined. Shortly after, he made me withdraw into his cabinet to converse respecting France. His questions, as well as his easy and noble manners, stamped him distinctly a Finnish courtier. Our conversation afterwards turned on the arts. On this occasion he led me to an alley he had planted with trees, and which I had previously seen. I frankly imparted my disapprobation of the manner in which the ground was laid out, and after giving my reasons why, in such a burning climate, it ought rather to be covered with turf he felt conviction the stage formed the next subject of our discourse he showed me the design for the curtain of the opera house he had built and on the boards of which he had succeeded in causing the dido of metastasio to be represented the design was a delicately flattering compliment paid the governor by the inhabitants and one that for an american city might justly be considered of lively invention but the execution of the draft by no means corresponded phoebus was represented in the chariot of day leaving the palace of the hours and illuminating with his beams the city of the havana personified under the figure of a female seated at the foot of a tree near the margin of the sea and fronting the moro castle she was crowned with towers and battlements and rested her right hand on a shield displaying the arms of the city while with the other she wantoned with genie the fault in the execution chiefly consisted in the forced compliment intended for the marquis and the consequent inappropriate representation of the gorgeous palace of the sun here the name of the governor being de la tour the sun was represented issuing from a very small tower the gate of which disproportionately small resembled more that of a dungeon rather than a port for the passage of the radiant car of the sun and its four impetuous coursers 
I pointed out this defect to the governor, observing at the time that seemingly the painter was ignorant of the metamorphoses of Ovid, and the pompous description of the Palace of the Sun in that work, beginning Regia Folis Erat. He sought excuse for the painter, and recommended me to go to the opera. At length I left him, greatly pleased with my reception, and perfectly easy respecting my sojourn at Havana. The following day I visited the opera. The interior constructed on the plan of that at Naples is truly handsome, and possesses an airiness and elegance peculiar to itself, arising from the circumstance of the boxes being separated from each other only by delicate balustrades very wide apart. Through every part of the house, sound is conveyed distinctly, and from every quarter there is a perfect view of the stage. Add to these, the pit has the advantage, uncommon in France, of seats for the spectators. The opera was performed in a manner, in my opinion, superior to any I had ever seen before. Aeneas was represented by an Italian virtuoso, of exquisite voice, a most elegant figure, and noble countenance. And with these prepossessions in his favor, who thoroughly comprehended his part, and acted in the first style. A Castilian was the dido of the piece. Her confidant, a mulatress, and Yarbe was given by a Spaniard. These three actors, a circumstance certainly not very common, alike sang with taste and precision, and admirably played alike the different characters. This was the first opera at which I had been present, where in lieu of the repeated thumps of a clumsy and noisy truncheon, the time was led by a violin of extraordinary power and precision, played by the secretary of the governor, which inspired the whole of the performers with an accuracy, a truth of expression, that rendered the harmony complete. Through the whole piece I found no room for the slightest blame, except on the introduction of a solo intended no doubt to display the superior abilities of the exquisite violin, and which perfectly affected this end, but which at the same time interrupted the concatenation of the piece, and necessarily caused a diminution of interest in it among the audience. However pleased with the opera, with their comedia, I was far from satisfied. So many things in it occurred opposite to the taste and rules by which we are guided in France, that I saw nothing but ridiculous defects, of which these are some specimens. The name of God, of Jesus, of the Virgin, and of various saints occur in almost every phrase. The actors generally, but especially the women, never make their appearance without a rosary of beads. In every scene a duel is introduced. Do two lovers meet? The scabbard must of consequence be emptied and between two parentheses you read, Sacar la espada. All pieces, whether comic or tragic, are not only comedias, but comedias famosas, however wretched the piece, however despicable the author. To complete the picture, the titles of their pieces are ridiculously silly, as an instance, La Caballera, de Absalom, the long hair of Absalom. The comedia which succeeded the opera was of a singular description. A single actor kills a dozen men, women, and children without the slightest resistance on their parts, and ranges them in a row as he stabs them. The work complete he calmly wipes his dagger on the upper leather of his shoe. This scene, so strange is the depravity of Spanish taste, was regarded as very fine. For my part, 
as it was carnival time, I imagined that this was an emblematic representation of the horrors attendant on drunkenness. But inquiring of one near me, I learnt I was mistaken. Still, notwithstanding what I have observed, I have since discovered in their works of this kind abundance of wit, and many passages remarkable for their spirituality, delicacy, and gallant bearing. The author most admired at present is Calderon de la Barca. The following day I again paid a visit to the governor, and spoke to him of what I had seen, when the account I rendered appeared to give him great satisfaction. I presented to him, as I had previously to the intendant, a small packet of seeds for the kitchen garden, and flower seeds. These he divided, giving part to Don Luis Uet, who dined with him that day. And, as I afterwards understood he was a planter, I begged his acceptance of another packet. He expressed with great civility the inclination he felt to form an acquaintance with me. In consequence, I invited him to my apartments, and a few days after he came in his carriage to take me to his country house. Here I found his lady, a Genoese of noble birth and extraordinary merit, one of his daughters, and an officer of the artillery. After breakfast we went into the garden and sowed all the seeds which I had presented to him. Our pastime was truly a festival, enlivened by gaiety, wit, well-merited compliments, and the most pleasing conversation, in which due regard was maintained to decorum. In short, so agreeably sped the moments that we passed through four hours of toil and scarcely thought them one. After our gardening was finished, a very delicate dinner was served up in the French style. Cards were then introduced, and when we had taken a walk through the plantation, we returned to town. This villa is situate under the canon of Fort Principe, which was planned by Don Luis Huet himself, and the works of which he pointed out to me with as much confidence as if we had been for years acquainted. The soil is stony and dry. Still, manioc, called by the Spaniards yucca, is cultivated here, and such is the industry of the proprietor of the ground that its produce yields an annual revenue of 3,000 piastres. Don Luis Uet is a man of high esteem for ability in his profession as well as for his partiality to literature. With the confidence of the court, he enjoys the respect of the people, and his rank of colonel places him in a condition to look forward to a still more distinguished appointment. His house was that where I most frequently visited at the Havana. Occasionally I went to pay my respects to the governor, the intendant, and the king's lieutenant. The rest of my time was employed in botanical excursions round the town, in studying the Spanish language, and pondering on the most material, the chief object of my travels. Still, I must confess, time flew with leaden wings during my stay at the Havana, a stay of more than six weeks. The promise of the exterior of the city of the Havana is belied by its internal appearance, which has little in it pleasing. Its length is about a mile and a half, 1,240 toises, its breadth three-quarters of a mile, 600 toises. Its site is on a rock on the seaside, and its form a semicircle, or rather semi-ellipsis, the greater diameter being along the shore. The houses are all of them built of stone, from one to three stories high. It contains four very extensive squares, which, however, are only half finished, possess little symmetry, and are covered everywhere with rubbish. The streets are regular and straight, but narrow, 
with a foot pavement on each side and an unpaved road in the midst in which two carriages can scarcely pass abreast as the city is on a dead level the water frequently stagnates on the rock in which deep ruts have on progress of time been formed by the wheels of carriages a plan has been proposed for repairing the road paving it and giving it a slope but the mode of paving projected a specimen of which i saw in some of the streets near the government house is too singular to pass unmentioned the material employed is blocks of iron wood ten inches square connected with other blocks longitudinally laid like a floor the solidity of this pavement is such that notwithstanding the roads thus made have been traveled over for two years by a vast number of carriages no trace on the wood of any wheel is seen nor have the blocks in any part been disturbed from their original position should the plan be carried into effect and the whole city be thus paved it will display a very curious and special singularity towards the land side the havana is not strong as it is defended merely by a simple curtain flanked by bastions and almost in every part without a ditch owing to the immense labor requisite to excavate the rock it is however now secured from any attack on this side by the fort del principe built eight hundred toises nearly one mile in advance on an eminence which stretches to the town on the side next the fort it is inaccessible the port one of the most beautiful and spacious in the world is a basin nearly circular which receives several small rivers it runs a league in depth from the neck to the extremity the entrance is protected on the town side by a fort opposite to the wall and sides of three bastions which placed one above the other in tiers command the anchorage in the road on each of the flanks of these bastions there are commonly mounted eighteen twenty-four pounders on the side fronting the country a wall built on a rock till the arrival of the english before it considered impregnable defends the entrance of the port the cabana another fortress newly constructed above the wall commands both the port and city and its fire crosses that of fort del principe finally two other small forts at the bottom of the port two tiers of guns on low batteries beneath the wall the cabana along the shore and a battery level with the water rendered this city extremely formidable it is supposed that its different defenses mount altogether eight hundred pieces of cannon chiefly twenty-four pounders nor will it be attempted on the part of any nation to force the channel for such an attempt would be madness two english frigates which ventured the hazardous enterprise during the siege of the place were in consequence sunk nothing more beautiful than the appearance of the forts can possibly be imagined their construction being on the most profusely expensive scale the only recommendation of the houses of the town is a certain air of grandeur large gates and courts wide windows projecting two feet over the street supported on pilasters heavy balconies of wood covered with tiles on the upper stories palisades of wood coarsely fastened and of enormous size all these give something heavy somber and repulsive to the look of the houses internally they have commonly a vast court surrounded by gothic arcades large and in the moorish style the gallery formed by these communicates with large but ill-disposed apartments badly furnished the doors and windows of them resembling those of a fort or dungeon as much by the thickness of the portals 
as by their gothic structure in the vestibule or in the chief apartment of the house it is common to have the arms of the family blazoned in manner of trophies a usage derived from the time of chivalry which if occasionally it be but vain parade yet again oftentimes serves to excite true bravery and a spirit capable of any daring enterprise the houses of the lower orders have rarely any flat ceilings and all even those belonging to people of easy circumstances instead of being favored with wood or squares of tile or stone have merely an earthen floor which by preserving humidity i found of injurious effects to health with the wealthy the furniture of the rooms is of wood partly gilt curtains of crimson damask with gold fringe and some japanned works paintings and glass lusters the beds are very simple and no pure glasses or other mirrors are seen no inlaid work of wood for floors and neither carpets or tapestry in short nothing corresponding with the sumptuosity or elegance of french apartments the spaniard is as modest in his dwelling as he is sober in his mode of living the english have taught him the method of cooking certain dishes and the use of different pieces of furniture of the talents of the disciple a judgment may readily be formed by reflection on who were his masters the men wear coats of the french fashion but the cut of the body is so short that the pockets are nearly under the arm above this coat generally of cotton or taffeta a cloak is worn of burradilly or camblet those who seek to render themselves conspicuous wear a blue or scarlet cloak embroidered or trimmed with gold this is a sumptuosity however not within the compass of every one as such a cloak costs five hundred piastres still those at the height of fashion decline wearing it preferring the french dress the hair which is rarely seen powdered or frizzled is enveloped in a net and covered with a broad brimmed hat such is the dress of the men the women seldom wear gowns but almost always are dressed in a corset and petticoat with an apron of gauze or muslin and a few ribbons they wear no powder nor is their hair frizzled but braided and turned up or worn in chignon under their cap to this is added attached above the hair a sprig of rue or absinthe their ornaments consist of crosses rings gold necklaces and large bracelets of massive gold that weigh a quarter of a pound happy she who wears a bracelet on her left wrist but how much happier if one on each she amuses herself constantly in fastening and detaching them as well as in pulling off and drawing on her glove and all for the purpose of attracting attention to her beautiful and well-turned arm french women paint for the spanish ladies they have a black patch of a round or oval form at each temple these at night are removed and white patches are substituted which pretty well resemble a plaster in the morning they wear instead the leaf of an orange tree few handsome women and still fewer who had pretensions to elegance were seen by me at the havana they never go abroad but in the morning to mass and the evening for a ride hence they are not to be seen either in the streets shops or any public room constantly shut up in their apartments the pleasure of enjoying an airing out of the city is the only enticement can induce them to leave them this indeed is their favorite pleasure nor is it costly four hundred piastres for a coachman a hundred and fifty for a mule five hundred for a chaise 
in all about a thousand piastres pay every expense hence the city swarms with carriages even the meanest clerk drives his chaise and it is as common to present one to a mistress as in france a box of sweetmeats it must further be observed that in no part of the world is money so plenteous as at the havana it circulates in talegas resembling those bags of a hundred pistoles in course at paris and the counters of the officers of revenue are covered with piles of reals of plate which they exchange for hard dollars with singular dispatch the markets are plenteously supplied with every kind of provision but especially vegetables which are quite as good as in france fish and turtle are extremely cheap beef sells at a real the four pounds excellent malaga and tinto wine at two reals the bottle indeed no town in america is better furnished with means of good living or at a more reasonable rate this advantage is to be attributed in great measure to the division of the real into cuartillos of tin for nothing is more favorable to economy than small coin end of section two Section 3 of Travels to Oaxaca by Nicholas Joseph Thierry de Menonville, an anonymous translation from the French. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The trade of Havana and Mexico is in the hands of the Catalans, whose commonly active, laborious, enterprising, and persevering disposition have acquired for many of them considerable fortunes. They are, in consequence, an object of envy to Spaniards at large, who seek to disguise this feeling under a veil of contempt, an assumed sentiment as little commendable as that which is the real one. For one Castilian engaged in trade, there are thirty Catalans. Intoxicated with success, however, they prayed for exclusive privileges, a kind of monopoly but too common in Spain. They had proposed as speculators to supply the colony altogether with wines from Malaga and Alicante at a real the bottle, whereas the actual price is two reals. But their petition was rejected, as it was accompanied by a request of being the only ones allowed to introduce and sell the commodity. The articles of trade are iron, linen, ironware, silks clocks and watches wines and spices at the havana as in mexico little other is seen than brittany linen the coarsest of which sells at a dollar the vara a measure somewhat less than a yard english the ironware is all of it imported from germany the clocks and watches from england the small quantity of indian and persian goods consumed which are not the fabrics of Mexico, are derived from France. The Genoese, for whom the Spaniards evince great partiality, furnish them with all silk articles. For veils, cassocks, black hoods worn by the women on going to church, mantles for priests, etc. Their iron is partly drawn from Sweden, partly from old Spain. Spain, likewise, sends hither oil wine and paper of detestable quality what is highly singular neither at havana nor at vera cruz can gray paper be procured i wanted some quires to dry my herbs between but was only able to procure a few sheets in which certain goods had been enveloped and which notwithstanding i was charged for at a very extravagant rate Neither at the Havana nor in any part of America is such a thing known as a public promenade planted with trees. Monsieur le Marquis de la Tour attempted to form one round the ramparts, but it did not succeed, and nothing but the walk remains, unsheltered. 
another attempted at an earlier period and planted with orange trees is likewise gone to ruin the havana contains about twenty five thousand inhabitants the whole population of the island including negroes and mulattoes does not exceed a hundred and sixty six thousand souls according to the statement in possession of the governor which i saw and from a french engineer from vera cruz who had lived a length of time at mexico i learnt that all this vast empire of spain in america contains no more than a million inhabitants at the time i was there the havana contained no more than three thousand regular troops there was however in addition to these a body of militia excellently disciplined consisting of sixteen hundred men not a single church did i observe worthy an account of its architecture to be noticed all of them are long buildings dark as dungeons ornamented on the right and left with innumerable chapels with frontispieces composed of a medley of orders of architecture wretchedly encumbered with useless trappings and still more wretchedly disfigured by the utter absence of all proportion in the most revolting and superstitious confusion though profusely covered with gilding not one of these chapels but will have cost upwards of ten thousand piastres and in every church are at least thirty or forty at this time the church of the jesuits designed for a cathedral is nearly complete on surveying it you would imagine before you a structure of the ninth century each of the thirty churches contained within the city has seven or eight brotherhoods who are constantly making processions out of number but these most especially at the period of carnival at this time the ceremonies on which occasion i had before noticed in france and saint domingue at this time i say there could not have been here less than three thousand processions nothing could be seen but processions and no other talk or noise was heard but of which these were the cause of them they were everlasting from morning to night general processions and processions of individuals of parishes communities and of every brotherhood the members of these patrolled the streets with lanterns deafening the ear with the discordant notes of hoarse bassoons and twanging guitars and driving the god of sleep from every eyelid as long as they lasted finally were processions of every father of a family followed by his wife his children and domestics who chaplet in hand repaired to their particular chapels every house has its chapel at which every month a particular festival is celebrated the festival of the dedication of the different churches and still more particularly that of their several patrons are grand celebrations the evening before by nine o'clock the steeple is illuminated and a grand concert is given to which it is usual to listen from the roofs of the neighboring houses the succeeding day this same steeple exhibits a variety of streamers of different colors the body of the church is filled with tapers to such extreme as not badly to represent a fiery furnace through the aisles of which bad music is badly heard but in which also splendid offerings are made the bishopric of the havana reputedly produces forty thousand piastres don fulano echevarria who is the present incumbent is apparently high in favor at court he caused an order to be published which bore for title encuentra la execrable crimen de los contrabandistas against the execrable crime of smuggling i could not refrain from asking a priest of my acquaintance who happened to be his secretary if such an offence was entitled execrable 
what epithet was in reserve for the crime of treason but my question remained unsolved nothing can be conceived more rigid than the ordinances against nor more harsh than the punishments for smuggling since the very first delinquency detected renders both body and goods of the culprit liable to confiscation notwithstanding this nothing is more common than contraband traffic all alike pursue it burghers priests and soldiers does a vessel arrive it instantly swarms with faces utterly unknown and whose only business is to inform you that such and such articles are prohibited and officiously and out of pure good will to render you the service of conveying surreptitiously on shore your boxes of gold lace or other unlicensed articles of import nor presume to show or entertain the least mistrust and infidelity in instances of this kind is a matter unheard of for readily are all in league to evade a law so barbarous and unjust false coining is punished by the stake in short everything is either farmed or otherwise monopolized which multiplies not only the temptation but the necessity of smuggling the baker of havana is obliged to buy a license to prosecute his trade for which he pays a hundred piastres to the government paper gunpowder wine tobacco all are farmed throughout the whole of mexico and what is still more singular still more odious the tobacco and cacao grown in one province are prohibited articles in another on the miserable and verily most miserable shores of yucatan i have seen the trade for boats cables cordage and even hammocks exclusively engrossed by farmers under the government thus it is by erroneous calculations that the spanish government annihilates the commerce the population and comforts of its subjects hence flow discouragement in activity and wretchedness the infallible precursors of weakness uncleanliness disorders and death to these causes no doubt is to be ascribed the endemic leprosy of cartagena mentioned by the abbe reynal already it has spread to the havana where a leper hospital has been constructed for the reception of a hundred and fifty patients in this very hospital are at the same time admitted such as are afflicted with venereal complaints i made a visit to it in company with a physician of the country but confess the sight filled me with horror and that i had need of great exertion and the preservative of a flask of strong vinegar with which i took care to be provided to qualify me to support the disgust by which my senses were assailed the management of the hospital is but indifferent for though surrounded with walls the doors are constantly kept open in the daytime and the sick are perpetually going in and out without any restriction even from their traversing the whole of the city though france can boast of but little commerce with the havana it is much to be apprehended that this frightful malady may eventually be introduced into her colonies to effect this but little intercourse is required and communication to a certain extent is continuous i could not look on a negress whom i saw at port au prince and who was completely covered with an elephantitis without shuddering at once with pity and horror i saw the poor wretch abandoned by her owners begging through the streets and markets where thousands of slaves were liable to receive the infection and cannot refrain from observing that much greater attention than is ought to be paid to the prevention of those terrible consequences to which this and similar occurrences might lead 
for want of wells all the houses at the havana have cisterns two of the squares are adorned with fountains which stream forth water conducted by subterraneous channels from a small river the course of which is defended by the fort del principe so that an enemy would be unable to cut off this supply from the city in case of a siege without first taking the citadel the air of the city is generally pure and healthy the winds from the north which prevail throughout half the year on the coast cool the atmosphere to that degree that i always felt cold at night and even in the morning until by ten the sun's warmth dispersed it raising the thermometer of bourbon to five or six degrees above the freezing point note lange de bourbon was a noted french maker of thermometers already had six weeks elapsed since my arrival at the havana during which i had incessantly been tormented with the desire of completing my enterprise the time appeared to me in consequence intolerably tedious i delayed thus long the prosecution of my plan merely to prevent my being suspected by a people naturally jealous and mistrustful and whose eyes were constantly upon me the better to lull suspicion respecting the real object of my researches i constantly affected the heedlessness of a man intent on herborizing but at length weary of the state of incertitude in which i lived and yielding to the impulse which directed me to vera cruz i began to think seriously of the means of reaching that city i thought it prudent still to use stratagem and pretending to be actuated by that volatility and inconstancy of disposition oftentimes with so little propriety ascribed to frenchmen and which occasionally is so favorable a cover to deep designs i feigned to be overcome with ennui from my long stay at the havana and the two narrow limits prescribed me as a botanist i readily obtained belief and met with commiseration and by this trick partly and partly by a fortunate occurrence of which i availed myself i succeeded to the height of my wishes one day don manuel feliz ruic the factor of the asiento company at whose house i had twice before been to obtain change for some joao portuguese coins inquired if the report he had heard was true of my being a pupil of mr jesui antonio laurent de jesui a french botanist on my satisfying him in the affirmative he informed me that he himself had been secretary to don antonio ulloa one of the literary characters dispatched by the king of spain in company with our academicians to peru that he had been very intimate with him an account of his intelligence and social virtues that he had a more tender regard for him than any man alive this subject of our conversation gave room for my observing that i also should have been delighted with an opportunity of visiting peru but that as my time was limited and my means deficient for this purpose i should feel much pleasure if any chance should enable me to traverse mexico don ruic instantly tendered me his service towards procuring me the facility of making this journey he was already highly interested in my favor from my intimacy with mr jesu promising me letters for don antonio ulloa at that time general of the fleet at vera cruz and generously proffered to become my surety in a bond of a hundred thousand dollars this certainly was a very lucky incident and a handsome progress towards the effectuation of my designs but this was not all i yet feared lest the governor should object to grant me a passport notwithstanding he had promised he would upon the inclination i expressed of seeing a country 
in the praise of which he was no less lavish than the rest of his countrymen prone to think well of their possessions i perhaps mistrusted him unjustly but certainly not without some grounds for my fear as amid the caresses and kindnesses i experienced from don luis uet and his lady i was able to trace a fund of curiosity and was subject to questions natural enough in themselves and especially so coming from a woman i communicated my doubts to don huic which he easily dispersed and even promised to speak on the subject the succeeding day to the marquis de la tour i now made preparations for my departure without communicating my intentions to any one breathing not even my host the packet for vera cruz was to sail in three days time and short as the notice i resolved not to miss the opportunity before me the next day was sunday a day on which the governor holds a levy at his palace the superior officers on this occasion the municipal officers of police and finance repair to the palace between the hours of ten and eleven the governor grants them audience and receives their respects in the government hall it may safely be said that if this custom establishes and reminds the courtiers of subordination it lessens the humiliation which the high-spirited man lost in the crowd must feel at being obliged to render homage to individuals undeserving either of affection or esteem for this levy also furnishes an occasion for soliciting and obtaining trifling favors and for expediting affairs of little moment which would only tend to perplex or clog those particular audiences held for matters of graver import this was the first time of my being present at a similar audience and the object of my attending it was to solicit my passport but finding here don manuel ruic who represented the promise he had made me of speaking himself on the subject to the marquis de la tour i judged it expedient to leave the management of my solicitation with him and withdrew well satisfied with the prospects before me in the afternoon the militia cavalry was to be reviewed i saw the marquis in company with don luis uet and both bent to me with great civility this appeared to me of good omen and i hastened to the government house as i ascended the steps i met don luis who was leaving the hall and who inquired if i repaired thither in view of asking any favor i answered in the affirmative informing him of as much as was proper of my design upon this he proffered to accompany me to second my request at the same time adding he thought his interposition would not be needed in consequence i thanked him for his politeness and took my leave of him i waited but little ere the governor approached towards me with that benignant look his features commonly wore and inquired what my wishes i took the liberty of reminding him of the promise he had made of granting me a passport for mexico and stated i had come for the purpose of obtaining it he gave it me at the instant and without making it dear as is but too common with his equals by thousands of difficulties and delays he merely told me he was fearful i might not eventually meet with that gracious reception from the viceroy of mexico which he himself desired concluding with wishing me success on my voyage i thanked him for his kindness and after paying my respects withdrew this excellent man remained a long time in the vestibule to see me depart and when on the last stair of the flight of steps i turned again to make my last salutation i had the satisfaction to see him return it testifying by his features and gesture the interest he took in my welfare man in place how easy is it for you to engender love and veneration whence can you ever choose to be distant harsh and rude 
in possession of my passport the liveliness of my joy was proportioned to the inquietude i had felt respecting the possibility of my procuring it folded in my pocket i kept it as the dearest treasure and woe to him should dare to ravish it from my possession that it might be perfectly secure i flew to place it in safety i hastened light as air to don huic who gave me his letters for don antonio ulloa i embraced him while i assured him of my devotion and gratitude and returned to my host to sup with a feeling of contentment which defies expression then only did i speak of my departure though apparently grieved to lose me as he reckoned upon my longer stay mine host yet condescended to share the joy i expressed and gave me letters for a merchant at vera cruz and a settler at teochitlan on the road to mexico i had now to treat for my passage the master of the packet would take no less than a hundred hard dollars the demand was exorbitant but it was vain to reason his avarice was inflexible to all my arguments he opposed a truly spanish phlegm and gravity and coolly pocketed my money without once taking his cigar from his mouth we were to have sailed the following day but his departure was procrastinated three days longer during which i made my farewell visits at length on the eleventh march seventeen seventy seven we went on board and weighed anchor at eight in the morning saluting the city and the seven citadels with one gun what then and at all times seemed to me incredible was the small number of vessels in this famous port during the six weeks of my stay i noticed no more than fifteen of from eighty to two hundred tons including the packet from vera cruz and in this last port though i remained there afterwards ten weeks i saw no greater number with what pleasure as i left the port did i contemplate those tiers of batteries the citadels and forts which line the approaches to the havana and the innumerable mouths of thundering cannon with which they are furnished on my arrival i fancied them all directed against me all pointed towards the prevention of my scheme of obtaining the cochineal insect how much then must i not have felt elated how grateful the self-applause i enjoyed at having had the temerity of braving and the great good fortune of avoiding their terribly menacing rows no when the english captured this important place they experienced no higher satisfaction at their success like them i thought i held the key of mexico all future obstacles vanished from my sight and already i possessed in idea the precious treasure which i sought end of section three Section 4 of Travels to Oaxaca by Nicholas Joseph Thierry de Menonville, an anonymous translation from the French. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The vessel on board of which I sailed was a brig of 60 feet keel, called the Vera Cruz Packet. It carried four carronades, two cannon, and a crew of nine persons. We had scarcely left the fort before a twelve-oared cutter rowing towards us hailed us on part of the governor what was my consternation i instantly imagined that repenting of having suffered my departure the marquis had sent orders for my being relanded this apprehension threw a deadly pale over my countenance and occasioned such a trembling in my frame that had i been observed i should necessarily have been taken for a criminal di diac quam mali est extra legem viventibus 
quick quid meriurent semper expectant the vicious never pass their time but ill always expecting what will follow still petronius i was however quit from the panic i experienced the mission of the cutter was merely to deliver letters on the part of the governor for vera cruz the sky was serene a favoring wind rippled the easy sea and the vessel was an excellent sailor we kept in with the coast steering as close to the west as possible and at day fall were already eighteen leagues from the city the wind increased during the night and veered from southwest to east southeast and we lost sight of land and by noon on the twelfth march were parallel with the shoals which bound cape san antonio from the period of our departure we had constantly run six knots an hour with all sails set in the afternoon the sea which had been very rough became more calm and its surface was entirely covered by those mollusks called by sailors galeres we saw several large trunks of trees which had floated down the mississippi into the gulf of mexico and which by the currents of the bahama straits had been sped hither i had before remarked others similar on the coast of cuba where they had been cast by a tremendous storm from the north among these was one which exceeded a hundred and twenty feet in length and of a diameter so considerable that although on shore i was unable to ascend it otherwise than by the branchy end i conjectured from the nature of the knots on the tree that it belonged to the family of pines of the larch kind from time immemorial the whole coast of vera cruz has been covered with them and some are so completely buried in the sand which increases in this port daily that nothing now but the roots are seen these trees are dangerous no doubt to approach in the night but they serve as resting places to an infinite number of aquatic fowl who find rich pasture in the sea insects which engender on them and the shellfish which as to rocks fasten on the trunks roots and branches at six in the evening we had a dead calm the whole night long we sailed with the wind slack but abaft at five in the morning of the thirteenth we were again becalmed but a wind arose with the sun on that as well as on the succeeding day though throughout both notwithstanding we had the wind abaft and the line showed a run of ten knots an hour we did not advance an inch the sea through which we cut at a great rate foamed and broke hard against the ribs of our ship like where the wheel of a mill is violently acted upon by a rapid torrent the vessel bore on the same tack riding very heavily but with great celerity we still on the fourteenth continued opposite to the same mountains of cuba we had seen the night of our departure in short we actually had no change of position a consequence when the violence of the current is adverse and equivalent to the impetus of the wind nothing can be conceived more vexatious and tiresome than such a predicament fortunately we had good hammocks and an excellent table the strictest discipline and most profound silence reigned on board and the captain a prime sailor was at the same time though rather taciturn extremely obliging he assured us that for eleven years that he had frequented these seas he never before experienced currents so powerful he added moreover that the worst months for navigating the gulf are september october november and december on account of the prevalence of north winds that in june calms are frequent and that the months of june july and august the rainy season are subject to storms and hurricanes from these observations i determined on returning if possible in january but at any rate and at furthest by august or september 
At length on the 15th in the morning, after having doubled the shoals during the night, we lost sight of land, and by reckoning had also doubled Cape San Antonio. At noon the wind had much increased. We furled our stay sails and top gallants and directed our course southwest. From this time we constantly had the wind either abaft or on the beam, that is to say, east or southeast. On this day I saw Venus, the sun being at that time five degrees above the horizon. The 16th, we were on the bank of Yucatan, in the Gulf of Mexico. On sounding, we met with fine white sand mixed with shells in 23 fathoms of water. In the Gulf, the winds were east and southeast. From 10 in the morning, they insensibly turned to the westward, and after 4 p.m., revolved from west to east. Our line showed the run six knots, and as we were only a hundred leagues from Veracruz, we hoped, if the wind should continue favorable, to reach it in four days. In the three days preceding, we had seen a number of fish of the Focus seal tribe, and three or four hundred porpoises, and small Focus sported and rolled about our ship, occasionally preceding it, and seemingly endeavoring the one to outstrip the other in velocity of swimming, now springing to the height of a fathom above the surface, and falling with a dashing noise, now advancing in pairs by the side of the ship, and apparently caressing each other, while at a distance their dams were seen, half as large again as their offspring, seemingly pointing out to them the course they ought to take. How far more pleasing sure the innocent enjoyment of such a scene than amusing oneself as is customary in pursuing, harpooning, and destroying these interesting animals. Fortunately for them, our sailors had not leisure for such an amusement, and separately from this circumstance they lived too well to seek for better fare. At 4 p.m. we again heaved the lead and found 30 fathoms on a bottom of remarkably white sand. The 17th, with similar ground, we had but 20 fathoms. From midnight till noon the wind had slacked, and we made only three knots. But on its veering to the north after midday, it freshened so as to double our speed. The sky, covered with clouds at sunrise, became again serene. We distinguished certain white birds the size of a duck with the end of their wings fringed with black. I likewise remarked a pelican or frigate bird with a complete tail. All this announced to us the neighborhood of land. During the whole night of the 18th, the wind blew strong. On sounding, the lead showed first 22, then 20 fathoms with fine blue sand mingled with shells. We saw a vast number of porpoises at 10 a.m. At noon, the wind, which had been south, changed to southwest and sunk into a calm. We availed ourselves of this to throw out lines to the bottom of the sea. These lines have each a hook attached to them with about an ounce of bacon and are precipitated by means of two shot of a pound weight. This little exercise is diverting and profitable. In an hour's time, we had caught 200 weight of excellent fish. They were of three species, but all of the perch kind. One denominated the negro, another a beautiful red sardine, the third with long pectoral fins. At four, a wind sprung up from the north and blew from that quarter the whole night through, but afterwards reverted to the southeast. We made six knots an hour. On the 19th, we had 45 fathoms of water. From this, we conjectured we were but 80 leagues from Veracruz, and that in three days' time we might anchor before the town. This was the ne plus ultra of our wishes, but they were not so soon to be gratified. In the evening, we were becalmed. The sun on setting was dimmed by a vapor, which, though it did not eclipse its light, diminished the vivacity of its rays. 
the sky as well as the horizon wore a gloom prognosticating somewhat sad and mournful from seven till eleven the wind was north and our course four knots by two in the morning it increased to a gale the sea ran frightfully high we took in all sails chained up the rudder and left the ship to the mercy of the waves a thousand times did they deluge the deck of our fragile vessel which now rode on their backs and now was enveloped by their overtopping spray the whole of the twentieth the weather was horrid never in europe had i experienced the like in these seas the winds from the north blow with violence for the space of four and twenty hours after which they abate for thirty more and cease for three days they are piercingly cold and very frequent so much so that it is rare a fortnight passes in these regions during the winter without their being felt on the twenty first the wind was less violent and veered to the northwest the morning misty at noon it blew northeast and for three hours it continued to rain in the space of eight and forty hours we had not advanced twenty leagues and we yet had fifty to pass which we no longer expected to make in less than three more days the night of the twenty second was rather a bad one the wind was incessantly changing from southwest to southeast and as well as the mist with which we were eight different times enveloped was every now and then succeeded by a dead calm the rolling of the ship throughout the day was dreadfully fatiguing in the morning a poor little bird of the size of a wren but the color of a green finch came and roosted on the vessel it endeavored skimming on the surface of the sea to fly against the wind but constantly overpowered returned to us again others made their appearance one of which was taken the residue were driven out to sea by the violence of the hurricane at one o'clock a butterfly paid us a visit and was greeted as an infallible index of our nearing the land a trust to which we gave ourselves up with pleasing reliance at night the uncheckered sky was spread before us in all its magnificence a dead calm prevailed and the rolling of the vessel affected us exceedingly at length on the twenty-third we had sight of land the captain at first had doubts but these were soon dismissed it bore south and we found ourselves twenty leagues on leeward of old vera cruz we should by this time have been at the mouth of the port had my advice been taken which was on the twenty-second to sail direct before the wind from the north what induced me to give this counsel to the captain was a knowledge that in the gulf of mexico the north wind is but of three days duration now as that was then the third and the regular winds blow from the southeast by steering from north to south at the risk of overreaching new vera cruz on the twenty third the south wind which prevails throughout the whole day would have been favorable to our increasing our latitude and recovering the lost way instead of which by being now to leeward of the port we had to beat up against the wind and could scarcely hope to reach the port even on the succeeding day we steered within seven points of the wind and made but slender progress the lands of the coast we saw are more lofty than those of santo domingo they run west and north at night we were but ten leagues off and the sight of them diffused joy and satisfaction through every breast but the wind continuing as little favorable as ever when within two leagues of land we tacked and ran all night through to sea the shore we by this means avoided is that of las tierras leones which stretches to the mountains of alvarado from the midst of which of a sugar loaf form rises the volcano orizaba which we distinguished the day before though distant five and forty leagues 
the country had a beautiful appearance, but for the space of forty-five leagues, that is to say, as far as to old Vera Cruz, it is notwithstanding unpeopled. The twenty-fourth in the morning we had made about a league of progress. By noon the wind again came to the east, nearly large, and inspirited us with expectations of entering Vera Cruz on the succeeding day. At four it freshened from the northeast. At six abated. By eight we distinguished the reefs in the vicinage of the port. We fired a gun, and immediately after distinguished a light, which we conjectured to be from the castle of St. John de Ulloa, and we answered it by a light at our main top gallant, and fired a second gun. We then perceived a second light, presumed from the ship of the admiral of the port. I thought it advisable another gun should be fired, but was fearful of communicating my opinion to the captain, mindful how little attention had been paid to my former observation. No doubt, had a third gun been fired, the major of the fleet, who in a galley with thirty men on board, had left the port in search of us, would not have missed his way. We, however, made some way, but with little sail set, and constantly sounding, the fathoms indicate the passage into the port, for the reefs by which it is bounded render it very difficult of access. At ten at night we were boarded by two boats, each with thirty men on board, furnished with cables for mooring us, and with anchors and grapplings in case of need. They inquired after the major of the port, whom they expected to find with us, as he had sailed before them. They towed us along by dint of oars, favored by a light wind. We threaded the tortuous labyrinth of the entrance, through which, at length, by midnight, we reached the port. We anchored under the cannon of the ship belonging to the captain of the port, itself at anchor a half cable's length from the castle. All night long it rained, and we were exceedingly incommoded by the hot and moist atmosphere of this climate, as also by the vapors from land. At five in the morning I was preparing to land when the major of the fleet joined us. This gentleman was Don Pedro de Verthuizen, with whom it will be seen I afterwards was on terms of closest intimacy. At this instant I paid but little attention to him, for, judging after the French manner, I esteemed him, from the old coat he wore, covered by a rusty surtout overcoat, to be no better than a sergeant of marines. He requested my passport, which I gave him, and he kept, and I obtained permission to go on shore. Uneasy in extreme, respecting the reception I should meet with here, I put my baggage into the boat and traversed the port, on landing at a jetty about ten fathoms broad and a hundred in length, which terminates at one of the gates of the city, I found there a numerous guard, contadores, officers of the port, and a multitude of curious idlers. It was requisite my trunks should be opened, but they were very loosely examined. As soon, however, as they came to my books, they refused to let them pass, before a permit for that purpose should be obtained from the vicar general of the Inquisition. I hastened to him and found him a little old man with an air of a perfect saint, mounted on a chair near a table and reciting his breviary. He held out his hand to kiss. For my part, but little accustomed to a ceremony of this kind and not aware at the instant of his intention, I shook it in a cordial manner. He requested of me a catalogue of my books. I answered that they merely consisted of works relative to physic and natural history, suitable to a medical man and a botanist, and were so few in number that I had made out no catalogue of them. He was satisfied with my answer and the bare mention of the names of the authors and immediately gave me a license for their entry. 
instantly the gates were opened to me. I awaited on Don Thomas Taqueria, for whom my host at the Havana, Don Bernardin Liagotera, had given me letters. The merchant of Vera Cruz appeared to feel perplexed at this recommendation, and informed me that he had no other knowledge of Liagotera than what was derived from certain commercial intercourse and i set him much at his ease by informing him that for the present all that i expected from him was the kindness of indicating to me some good inn he pointed out to me one opposite to the gate of mexico which i afterwards learnt was the best in town but after this remark what will be thought of the rest when i make known that the only furniture of my apartment consisted of a table four feet by three and that two benches six feet by three formed the only bed worthy indeed of a spanish gentleman as for mattresses chairs looking-glasses etc all these no doubt are regarded either as superfluities or conveniences of too extravagant a nature as soon as I had safely deposited my effects in this charming apartment, I repaired to the general of the fleet, Don Antonio Ulloa. At his gate I found a guard of ten men. His secretary introduced me into a large hall with furniture of very ancient date, and announcing me as a gentleman who brought letters from Don Manuel Feliz Ruiz, a little man, at most but four feet ten inches high, speedily made his appearance dressed in an old jacket of nankeen with silver buttons gray-headed and his hair without either powder or pomatum tied and hanging over his shoulders his countenance was bad but his looks extremely mild and affable and his eyes lively a little diamond cross of the order of saint jacques suspended from a buttonhole bespoke a man of rank such was don antonio ulloa i saluted him as i presented my letters these explained the object of my journey and entreated his assistance to obtain a passport for me to mexico he read them attentively promised immediately to write on my behalf to the viceroy and advised me to write at the same time myself he invited me to be a frequent visitor at his house and table, admonishing that dinner was regularly served at half-past one, and insisted on my dining with him that very day to begin. Finally, he caused me to be presented to the governor by the major of the fleet, whom I recognized for the same personage who had demanded my passport. On repairing to the governor's, Major Don Pedro de Vertuizen, was so kind as to tell me my acquaintance would be very agreeable to him to this compliment i made a suitable reply and i had full occasion to prove it perfectly sincere don fernan palacio governor of vera cruz was a very different character to the general of the fleet his sour looks his rough tone of voice and rude speech predisposed one against him at once he readily granted me permission to reside at vera cruz and botanize in his government but refused to return my passport which the general recommended me to ask for and at my departure pretended even it was mislaid i afterwards learnt that he assumed the governor of the havana had no privilege to grant similar passports and intended to avail himself of mine to his discredit for which purpose he was so obstinate in refusing it me i left him much chagrined at the reception i met with it however occasioned me the less surprise on learning as i did afterwards that he was on unfriendly terms with don ulloa the next day the general did me the honor of introducing me to doña fulana de butillos the lady of the late intendant she was a woman of fifty who had been a perfect beauty 
and still retained traces of her former charms her lively and natural flow of wit and her noble and open character endeared her to every one the recommendation of the general was undoubtedly of use for that very day she offered me repeatedly her service la casa es de usted my house is yours she several times observed and that in a manner so cordial as persuaded me of her sincerity she afterwards presented me to her daughters and informed me that the youngest was on the point of marriage with monsieur de vertwiesen in short she insisted upon my becoming as one of the family at the instant her son made his appearance don juan de butillos a captain of the regiment of the crown soon as she saw him hither my son she exclaimed beckoning him here is a gentleman from your own country this young man in fact had been educated in france and had all the amenity peculiar to our youth such qualifications endeared him but more to his mother who was as partial to the activity politeness and tolerant principles of the french as disgusted with the idleness want of nicety in dress and the fanaticism of the spaniard young butillos was soon on terms of closest intimacy with me he acted as interpreter between me and all of the family and especially the ladies his sisters who were constantly exacting french songs from me i translated for them the romance of berkin at which they were softened even to tears and i made hence the conclusion that this little piece is truly as excellent as individually it appeared to myself observing the effect it had on sensible minds though foreigners some days after at the same house i met with monsieur de Fersen, son of the lieutenant-general of that name he advanced towards me and embraced me inquiring news from paris where he was born he added that being apprised of the arrival of a frenchman in the country he had for three days wandered in search of me with all the anxiousness natural to a fellow countryman when we left the house the lady of it was so obliging to state as m de Fersen kissed her hand that as we were both frenchmen we ought not to be separate and that it was a province he ought to fill the bringing me with him and rendering me partaker of those moments of recreation he occasionally passed at her house this amiable youth led me to his house where i found m du parquet a gentleman from dauphinois as well as himself a captain in the corps de genie engineering corps they made me stay dinner and here i was not a little surprised at finding our beverage cooled with ice nor less at learning that this enjoyment ample compensation for a thousand privations experienced here is obtained for a trifle at vera cruz daily eight mules relieved at regular stages arrive at this city laden with frozen snow from the mountain orizaba distant about forty leagues by this plan a pound of ice is obtained for a real of plate and ice creams a la anana pineapple or a la zapotilla four times as large as in paris those charged fourteen sous may be had for an equal sum the dinners given by the lady of the intendant were served up equally well in town as in the country and what tended to render them the more grateful to me the cookery and style were french in parties formed by the individuals noticed i spent my leisure hours but my botanical excursions were not forgotten they occupied daily the interval between four and ten in the morning End of section 4section five of travels to oaxaca by nicholas joseph thierry de menonville an anonymous translation from the french 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the earliest of my walks, I found the convolvulus halapa of Linné. I gathered as many seeds of it as I was able, pulled up several roots, and had them verified by the druggists of Veracruz, who, without knowing whence they came, pronounced them the real halap. Their opinion, as it conformed with the description of Miller, convinced me of this plant being the true halap of Mexico. I presented seeds of it to the general, and with them a root weighing five and twenty pounds. He caused it to be planted in a box for the purpose of transporting it to Europe, and inquired if it was common in the environs of Veracruz. Nothing, however, could equal his surprise when I informed him that, if he was anxious for such a measure, I could engage to freight the vessel with it that bore his flag from the exclusive produce of the vicinage. Such is the idleness, the ignorance of this people, that they give three reals a pound for this root at Jalapa, while they might have it for a quarteto at Veracruz, if they would but take the pains to collect it. A discovery like this rendered me famous throughout the city. I was looked upon as a most extraordinary character in thus being able to discover a treasure in the very custody of those who were ignorant of its value. The esteem this gave me was grateful, and the good disposition of the people generally towards me, which my discovery occasioned, I endeavored to maintain and augment not only by the earnestness of my study of nature, which was no irksome task, but also by a species of quackery, which I reckoned serviceable towards concealing my definitive projects. Whether in the fields or in the streets, I constantly had plants in my hand, and either employed myself in observing them through a magnifying glass or in dissecting them with nicest care. My room was overspread with papers covered with plants, and my tables with vials and boxes containing seeds. This policy, indeed, was requisite to form an excuse for my customs and the walks I undertook, which else had been looked upon as purely vulgar, for the pride and vanity of the Spaniards was not a little shocked at seeing me journeying on foot every morning the distance of four or five leagues loaded with a portfolio and attended merely by a single negro who carried my books a hatchet a mattock and my breakfast i succeeded even beyond my wishes in conciliating the admiration of every rank and was known by no other denomination than the French physician. The sailors and soldiers laid in wait for me to ask advice for their complaints. At first, with the best intentions, I prescribed remedies, but when this became irksome to me, from their repetition and intemperance, I got rid of them by charging the cause to themselves. The constant disorders to which these folks are subject are a permanent spasm occasioned and maintained by the practice of smoking tobacco and the brandy and rum which they take without moderation in consequence i proscribed the use of these articles and forbade the applicants coming again to me for advice until after an abstinence of three days the prescription speedily disgusted them and they came to me no more still I constantly saw and noticed them pointing me out to their companions with signs of great respect. A number of other persons, tradespeople and individuals of whom I had no knowledge, followed my steps with their eyes and exclaimed with a kind of wonder, Do but see that Frenchman, why he is going to Medellin on foot. Unhappy people! so corrupted by ease and idleness were they, that these excursions, delightful to me, 
appeared to them unsupportable nay to such a pitch is their inertness carried that their meanest servants cannot go a quarter of a league without requiring a horse nor enter a wood till cased in leather to preserve their skin from mosquitoes la medellin is a hamlet six leagues from vera cruz whither it is common to resort in order to bathe in the river of that name the spot itself has nothing to recommend it but its happy site which draws thither many of the inhabitants of vera cruz the bathing season begins in may for the houses they are but wretched huts almost lost in the aspiring grass and for refreshments scarcely is there a fowl or an egg to be had for money here however i passed two days in the most agreeable manner in company with the general of the fleet and the family of the intendant's lady but it is time now i should give some idea of vera cruz this city stands in the gulf of mexico on the margin of the sea in a sandy and barren plain not the slightest culture embellishes its neighborhood on the south infectious exhalations from stagnant marshes contribute to render it exceedingly unhealthy on the north where from the arid sand salt in crystals may constantly be collected is the road to mexico which for seven or eight leagues runs parallel to the sea on the west dunes of sand ejected by the waves obstruct the view of all but the loftiest trees in proportion as this sand heaped up by winds from the east and north becomes dry it is again dispersed by the same winds and thrown forward either into the town so as to cover all the houses or further inland to this circumstance are to be attributed the dunes by which it is surrounded whirlwinds by raising this sand occasionally obstruct the sight and render breathing difficult beyond this sandy plain and the mountains by which it is enclosed are woods full of wild beasts and meadows covered with flocks vera cruz is built in a semi-oval form its largest diameter along the seashore measures from six to seven hundred fathoms it is surrounded merely by a wall or parapet six feet high by three broad surrounded by a palisade of ironwood in bad condition this wall at intervals is flanked by six indifferent bastions or square towers twelve feet high by twenty each side some of them terraced but the rest empty the wall has neither ditch counterscarp nor any outward work on the seashore on the southeast and northwest of the town are two redoubts or rather terraced bastions more regular than the others with a cavalier and a battery of cannon the entrance into the port is commanded by these bastions the whole of the houses are of stone the lime which mixed with sand forms the cement is obtained from madrepores corals drawn up from the bottom of the sea as for the stone for the houses it is brought from campeche monsieur abbe reynal led into error no doubt by the information he received respecting this city describes it as being built of wood but i have the evidence of my senses for the contrary and the engineers to whom i showed the passage in his philosophical history assured me that the whole place did not contain a single wooden house it cannot even be affirmed that such ever was the nature of its structure as i have seen at least twenty houses mayorazgos noble estates which devolve in the male line in perpetuity which have lain in ruins for fifty years the whole of the walls of which were of mason's works i however imagine that persons have been induced to commit an error thus gross in their description 
from noticing the heavy and massive balconies of wood which entirely surround the houses as at the havana and which principally exciting and engrossing their attention will have caused them to make the statement they have done the houses are neither built with greater regularity nor are they more elegant than those of the havana but the streets are wider and less close they are straight perfectly well paved with pebble level and well kept which contributes to their neatness and gives them better appearance the only remarkable buildings are the churches like those of the havana they are rich in silver plate as are the houses in porcelain and other furniture from china in this consists the whole of the luxury of the inhabitants for they are so temperate that chocolate and sweetmeats constitute almost the whole of their food vera cruz has three gates that of la medellin that of orizaba and that of mexico its only inhabitants are a slender garrison the agents of government sailors and a certain number of merchants or rather factors for the vanilla aniseed and cochineal which could not be exported by the galleons the chief commerce for european goods being transacted at jalapa iron only excepted which is taken from vera cruz this collective population may amount to from six to seven thousand persons among whom if the governor be accepted the administrators and the officers belonging to the land or sea service there are very few you can visit on social terms the men are generally speaking lofty-minded and proud either from this being the specific character of their nation or owing to their excessive wealth in a country where gold stamps so much value on its possessor they comprehend trade very well but here as elsewhere their natural indolence and their rooted habits and superstition render them irremediably averse from labor incessantly are they seen with their chaplets and relics on their arms and round their neck their houses are filled with statues and paintings of saints and their life is a series of devotional practices the women live recluse in their apartments above stairs to avoid being seen by strangers though it is by no means difficult to perceive that but for the restrictions imposed on them by their husbands they would be far more easy of access whenever they go abroad it is constantly in a carriage as i have before noticed is the case at the havana and as for those who have no carriage they are wrapped up in a large cloak of silk which covers them from head to heel and has merely a small opening on the right to enable them to see their road within doors they wear over the shift nothing but a small silk corset laced with a gold or silver cord the whole art of dressing their hair is confined to braiding it turning it up and fastening it on the top of the head still though so simple their dress they wear a gold necklace bracelets at the wrist of the same metal and at their ears pendants of emeralds of greatest value so true is the observation that fashion and a taste for luxury is prescribed by no rule generally speaking the fair in this city are not handsome for however rich their dress they show a deficiency of grace and fancy and under an apparent reserve are strongly inclined to lasciviousness the only amusements are the neveria a sort of coffee-house whither the genteeler sort repair to take ice creams and some imitations of bullfights for the vulgar unless indeed under this denomination be comprised the processions and flagellations of the holy week a period at which i arrived at vera cruz twenty times during this week was i called to my window 
by the clinking of chains what a shocking spectacle presented itself now a penitent in a woman's dress in a petticoat and body of linen cloth of a slate color with arms extended and fastened tightly in a horizontal position his back and shoulders supporting seven old swords such as are used for signs by our armorers and whose points collected in a fluffed pad pressed on the cossack's tailbone his legs loaded with chains and iron weights and in this garb marching slowly along through the city and paying his devotional visits to every church an instant after this miserable object was succeeded by another mask likewise in a woman's dress but in white muslin and naked to the waist a handkerchief covering the bosom the legs loaded with chains but the hands left at liberty this penitent in the left hand held a crucifix and in the right a rough whip with which at every hundred steps he lacerated his shoulders and back till streams of blood ran from the wounds and crimsoned the petticoat he wore in the space of a week i reckoned not less than eighty masks of this description the processions present nothing more attractive every chapel has its patron saint modeled in wax of the natural size but a frightful aspect which is carried on a litter by eight men who are relieved at intervals all are dressed in women's apparel the petticoat the corset and the mask of all are similar that is to say of linen cloth of a bluish slate color they hold those exhibitions in such esteem that penitents are to be seen thus accoutred all day long nay even from the evening before the next and the following day among these processions is one which on account of the object of it is deserving of mention it was instituted on occasion of a fund of six thousand piastres established to portion off annually four poor marriageable girls but by an abuse too common the lot now falls by means of connivance very often on those in easy circumstances and at times on children of seven or eight years of age and while the object of the institutors of this benevolent charity was the solace of misery and the inculcation into these future mothers of children of a spirit of religion and of a modest deportment the intent of the ceremony appears rather to be the instilling into their minds a taste for expense and a love of frivolity the chosen parties are conducted to church in superb carriages covered with cloth of gold or silver trimmed with magnificent lace and adorned with the richest pearls and diamonds which opulent ladies take pride in lending for the occasion a squire or a kind of sponsor one of the most respectable persons in the city gives the female his hand and leads her as in triumph in the procession which follows the nuptial blessing during my stay i twice witnessed this celebration but out of the eight elected i certainly would have refused to have taken seven for servants fronting vera cruz at the distance of four hundred fathoms is an island on which the castle of st john de ulloa is built the fire of the batteries of which cover and defend the town this fort long after its first erection was strengthened by more regular fortifications it is a parallelogram composed of four large bastions and three demi-loons half-moons with ditches counterscarp covered way palisades and glacis from the southwest to the southeast where the island is daily increasing owing to the accumulation of sand shells and madrepores on the south the port forms a sufficient fosse 
as the ship of the captain of the port is anchored at half cable length from the rampart which has an elevation of from 35 to 40 feet nevertheless to prevent a landing and the approach of boats under cover of the cannon the whole of the curtain wall which is bare as well as of the flanks of the two bastions bearing on the port are frazzed with stakes of a remarkably hard wood as black as ebony which sharpened and rising a foot and a half out of the water hinder any vessel approaching within musket shot here are three hundred pieces of cannon carrying balls of from twelve to thirty-six pounds still the place is not impregnable spite of the reefs which bound it on one side and the fort by which on the other it is defended and in this opinion i was confirmed by the casual glance of a french engineer with whom i conversed on the subject for while he supported the contrary he cast his eyes toward the southeast where in fact is a landing place of much less length from the fort than the principal one and off which vessels assailing would not so long be exposed to the fire of the batteries which crown the fort from the southeast to the northwest and might even anchor under the curtain wall a vestige of ancient fortifications raised very high the fire from which would hence be of no avail a square tower sixty feet high above the rampart or the bastion of the southeast side commands the city the port the whole road and the entire vicinage and serves for exhibiting signals which are repeated by the ship of the captain of the port i ascended this on the first story is a terrace on which is a battery of four brass twenty-four pounders with a guard house of ten men on the last story is a sentinel who is relieved every half hour and gives advice of all he observes and from his account it is verified by the corporal of the guard that the signals are made at the time i was there there was but one battalion in garrison with one company of artillery and about a thousand convicts employed on public works the port of vera cruz is closed by this castle and the island on which it stands from forty to sixty ships of war and a hundred merchant ships may anchor here in from four to ten fathoms the reefs which surround it as far as the island of sacrifices toward the southeast and the northeast break the waves and render it secure against winds blowing from the intervening points but two winds from the northeast to the west northwest the port is exposed and the north wind which blows with great violence frequently drives ships from their moorings and casts them on shore to this road however it is the only one in the gulf of mexico that all ships laden with goods for mexico repair and hence also is remitted to europe the precious metals and merchandise rendered in exchange for these extensive countries seen from the castle the city presents a very handsome appearance on the south it has a natural meadow which forms an agreeable promenade except in the rainy season when it is overflowed by a rivulet which forms a marsh at about a mile from the town and furnishes the city with water as however the rivulet is not the produce of a spring but arises from filtrations from the neighboring dunes which collect and form a marshy pond the water is neither fresh nor palatable whence that which is preferred by the inhabitants during the rainy season is kept in cisterns in the castle but in dry weather when the water is filtered through a greater depth of sand and consequently more purified it is conducted to the city by means of a stone aqueduct though this rivulet can boast but little depth of water it nevertheless nourishes caimans alligators from seven to eight feet long 
I have myself frequently traced their footsteps and even seen them plunge into the pool, but they are by no means dangerous. Veracruz has but one suburb, which is very small, and lies southeast of the town. It contains two chapels, a bowling green, and some few gardens, but these are in bad cultivation and without any ornaments. The lemon, the palm cabbage, and a few cacao trees are all the productive ones that are seen. A bombax or cotton tree with red flowers, the azadarach or bead tree, and pistachio trees, plumaria, with red, white, and yellow blossoms are the only trees pleasing to the eye. Hence, the city is rendered so dull and sterile of aspect that but for the meadow on the south, which serves as a resort for carriages, and the verdure of which recreates the eye, Veracruz would be one of the most tiresome residences in the universe. Fortunately, nature, so niggard of her boons in the vegetable kingdom, has compensated in the animal by a large display of bounty. The city and surrounding country swarm with birds, whose various plumage and enlivening song at once delight the eye and charm the ear. The streets of Veracruz abound in innumerable flocks of magpies of three different species, all of them of a jet black. The smallest is of the same size, as lively and as numerous as our sparrows, but less noisy and less troublesome. The second, of the size and color of our blackbird, resembles it so much as often to deceive one as to its species. The third, called in our colonies Boudita, is a kind of parrot. These three species of birds are remarkably tame and highly entertaining by their different antics. They never attack the seeds of plants, but prey on insects and the dung of mules, horses, etc. Larger than these three species succeeds the vulture, so well described by Mr. Jacquin. The name of this animal would induce a supposition of its being formidable. It is, however, one of the least daring and most stupid of all the birds of prey, and never pounces on anything alive. It is of the size of a turkey poult, and much resembles it by its brown color and bare head covered with a carunculated skin, and it has just sufficient courage to steal and fly away with pieces of meat from kitchens. For this purpose it lays an ambush until nobody is at hand when it scuds swift and lightly in at the door or window snatching up whatever chances to be in its way and flies out at the opposite openings its most assured reliance is however on the sewers the slaughterhouses and the chance of the country occasionally it is seen partaking with dogs when these happen not to be very hungry the carcass of a mule the zopilote thus the indians denominate our vulture is incessantly eating and when at length full, sleeps by the carrion, nor leaves it till it picks the very bones. I have on a morning seen a dead mule lying in the road, and at night noticed only the skeleton remaining, though on the sand where it laid I could not discern the minutest trace of the footstep of a dog. The carcass, consequently, must have been devoured by vultures. This bird is so little timid that it will scarcely trouble itself to remove from the way of a passenger, but at the same time it is so fearful when caught that it instantly disgorges the contents of its craw, which forms a resource for its enemy, the frigate bird, a species of pelican. The zopilote is easily taken, rises but to a small height from the ground, and the scent of a piece of meat takes from it all inclination to fly away. If, then, this bird be pursued, all it relies on for escape is its legs, when it is easily run down. The cooks and children then amuse themselves with it, 
and after fastening tight round its wing a little bell a bladder or a ribbon release it again for the spaniards more humane than frenchmen take no pleasure in destroying life we know very well that instead of the flocks which now enliven the air if vera cruz were peopled by the former nation not a bird in time would be seen el tomar sol enjoyment of sunshine so much the delight of spaniards appears to be not less grateful to these birds to witness the seeming pleasure they receive from the presence of the god of day they should be seen at sunrise as at the summit of a tree or the top of a steeple they simultaneously or in succession extend their wings and keep in this attitude to receive on every part its warming rays and again when they rise in air at noon and skim over the town in swarms which almost obscure the sky end of section five section six of travels to oaxaca by nicholas joseph thierry de menonville an anonymous translation from the french this librivox recording is in the public domain on the margin of the sea skimming incessantly over the waves and the shore is seen a species of laris or gull which has the gait and flight of a snipe but which is scarcely half its size and of a grayish blue plumage does a temporal make its appearance or a shark seek its prey in the port instantly swarms of little fish smaller than our gudgeons throw themselves out of the water onto the sands then does this little gull after a most amusing spectacle as it pounces down with the rapidity of lightning from the regions of air rises again and repeats this evolution incessantly for the space of a quarter of an hour i once had the curiosity to reckon the descents of one of these little birds in the lapse of seven minutes i counted eighty it is indeed true that its extreme impatience oftentimes causes the loss of its prey but nothing can be conceived more admirable than its excellent management and dexterity in seizing the fish at the surface of the water without even moistening its wing the boys in the sea and the bowsprits of the vessels of the port are covered with onocrotalus the pelican with a large craw denominated by Linné the true pelican boobies and ducks of every species on shore the rivulets and marshes are inhabited by swarms of spoonbills four species of storks as many of divers and coots and snipes more than twice the size of those that are seen in europe the meadows are covered with beautiful starlings of a black color with the shoulders and half the wing a blood red on the bushes and hedges the male and female heron appear to form three species equally rare in their kind the male from the splendid hues of its plumage and the female from the blue mantle which forms its summer garb and which in winter changes to gray here too is seen the cardinal as bright and shining a red as that of louisiana its song not so varied nor so melodious as that of the nightingale is yet as powerful and as bold here a lark of the size and color of the whitwall or golden thrush but more handsomely feathered and of sweeter song than our european lark the ramphastos toucan whose beak marked with yellow and black is longer than its body from head to tail honeysuckers or hummingbirds trochili of all colors and of various size one species of them which soars aloft in air singing like the rising lark has its head and belly which it proudly displays of a scarlet color in another species it is of the most splendid azure in the woods are found a kind of partridge as large as and of plumage 
much resembling that of our guinea fowl another species no larger than quails cracks or ocos of two species with crops and crests of the color of wax as large as turkeys and truly a royal dish green parrots no larger than sparrows macaws amazonian parrots of a green and yellow hue four kinds of turtle doves in which class is that species denominated ortolans by the colonists of santo domingo vast numbers of bulls and cows almost in a wild state rove through the forests a species of rabbit makes these likewise its haunt it is smaller but in far greater plenty than with us bucks and does more than two feet high are here so common that venison is sold in the markets at only three reals the pound tortoises are very numerous land crabs too as large as a man's head which leave the forests for the town penetrate into the houses and climb into the granaries another species is met with so audacious that when surprised instead of attempting to escape raised on two claws it defends itself with the others a kind of squirrel much larger than ours and perfectly of an ash color is another inhabitant of the sylvan kingdom with iguanas or lizards which grow to the prodigious size of two feet in length by ten inches in breadth and furnish an exquisite dish for those not affected with venereal complaints finally the sea swarms with fish of most delicious flavor which are sold almost for nothing in the markets such are the riches i remarked in this country where my stay was limited to but one season and where on this account and owing to the important object of my mission i was enabled to pursue my remarks to no greater length such are the objects it presents so worthy of the curiosity of a naturalist and so well calculated to render interesting a sojourn at vera cruz though the general assured me that the country produced rattlesnakes i met with none whether my deviations were among the marshes or whether i strolled through the woods but everywhere was i pestered with gnats mosquitoes and chicos or garapatas had i ever the misfortune to brush with my clothes the branch of a tree or any herbage i was instantly covered with these insects the shirt of the centaur nessus that so fatal present of deinara to hercules had not a prompter or more tormenting effect than the intolerable itching occasioned by the bite of this last tribe of insects they penetrate in an instant through wool and silk and the spaniards in order to preserve themselves from the torture they occasion are constantly accustomed to clothe themselves in pantaloons of orizaba leather and boots and never venture through woods except where they cross the roads they have to pass what however is extraordinary this species of woodlouse the garapata is only found in the neighborhood of the sea the interior of the country ten leagues inland being free from its tormenting persecution these insects at first occasioned me dreadful sufferings three or four times on my botanical excursions was i obliged to pull off my breeches and boots and scrape them off me with a knife on reaching my lodgings i was used to strip in haste and throw all my dress into water and found full employment during a couple of hours in washing myself and separating with a penknife these insects from my skin these are truly the dragon multiplied to infinity which guards the fruit of the hesperides i had now been six weeks at vera cruz nor would my stay have seemed so long to me but for the anxious the impatient desire i nourished in the inmost recesses of my heart of penetrating deeper into the country 
and attaining the end of all my secret prayers. Not all of this delay, however, was thriftless. As a furtherance of my designs, I listened to all I heard, and put opportune questions occasionally, as if on a matter of indifference, and merely for the satisfaction of an idle curiosity, and by such means succeeded, without the least indiscretion, in forming conception of the measures by which my enterprise might be carried into effect. One day, while conversing with Monsieur de Fersen on the subject of the riches of our colonies and the commerce they induced, he inquired of me if we cultivated cochineal. I answered in a careless manner, Yes, certainly. What? replied he with astonishment, mingled with vexation strongly depicted in his countenance. Do the French then mean to deprive us of this branch of commerce hitherto exclusively our own? Why not? rejoined I, smiling and railing him. Do you then fancy yourselves privileged wholly to monopolize this excellent boon of nature? And in what part of Santa Domingo then is cochineal cultivated? inquired he. At Fonda Negra, I boldly answered, for having already deviated from fact, I thought it improper to draw back, and was at that time far from being aware of speaking the real truth and that the white or wild cochineal did indeed exist at the time at mole st nicholas but i wish to prepare resources against surprise and mistrust in case of being in the end detected in bringing away the insects at another time the major of the fleet who had repeatedly promised to show me the cochineal in the vicinage of vera cruz took me an airing with him along the meadow, and, proud of his rare knowledge, pointed out to me on a cactus called by the Spaniards Tunas for the cochineal insect, a sort of caterpillar enveloped in white cotton, which turned out to be merely the worm of the moth which preys on the precious insect, and from which I had so much difficulty in cleaning my nopals i positively denied that it was the cochineal and this mistake of my preceptor led me into a direct error i mean to say a persuasion opposite to the fact that the insect did not exist in the neighborhood of vera cruz a wrong persuasion which prevented my pursuing my search for it any further here the major undoubtedly related to don ulloa what occurred during our ride for the next day while at dinner with the general he inquired if i had not seen cochineal the day before i was apprehensive that this question was meant as a snare and this the rather as i fancied he was observing me as he looked in the glass before which with his back towards me he was adjusting part of his dress and assuredly, if such had been the case, he must have seen my confusion. I endeavored, however, as well as I could, to compose my countenance, and answered that what I had seen was not cochineal, but a worm, that worms were without feet, and that the one which had been shown to me was long and cylindrical, whereas either the cochineal must have legs and a body of hemispherical figure, or the works of Lene and of Pedro Gassa and Hernandez, both Spanish naturalists who had thus described the insect, deserved to be given to the flames. I had scarcely escaped from the peril I have related before I had to encounter another. In the course of dinner, the general of the fleet offered to procure for me from the governor of mexico the appointment of botanist on board the fleet then equipping at acapulco for the purpose of making discoveries northwest of california and to insure me a salary of two thousand dollars a year 
with besides a thousand in hand for my equipment he dwelt strongly on this proposition and offered to present me himself to the viceroy of mexico to whose court he was about to repair by accepting this offer i must necessarily belong to the sovereign of spain as a botanist but i did not suffer myself to be persuaded by the great advantages held out to me from serving my country the hope of rendering it a service weighed with me more than the seductive offers of don ulloa i however returned him unfeigned thanks and excused myself without evincing any disdain of the proposal he again pressed for my acquiescence when i replied that having sustained no wrong having no cause of complaint against the country to which i had the honor to belong i could not esteem myself justified in abandoning it and that being a subject of the king of france it was not allowable on my part at least without his permission to dispose of my services to any other prince i added moreover that being unprepared for any such expedition i could not resolve on creating in my whole family and especially in a father who felt for me the tenderest solicitude that uneasiness which would follow the ignorance of what had become of me and where i was at last as his solicitations were still continued with much earnestness i waived the conversation and began some other topic we spoke of the paraguay tea from the description of it given to me i was unable to comprehend further than it was the leaf of some tree i asked the governor in a joking manner whether the consumption being so very considerable there was no tax on it when sold and he answered laughingly that it really was in contemplation after which solicitous of turning the conversation on cochineal he added that it was about to be farmed in mexico the very mention of cochineal startled me and i was upon my guard i am unaware whether my refusal had or not engendered any ill will towards me in the general but some days after he affected to speak of botany in a very slight manner he could not conceive he said how any one could take the trouble of making collections of plants for his part had he the finest herbal in the world he should think it of no other value than to light fires with hurt at an attack so rude i looked at him with attention and warmly answered that for my part i was so unfortunate as to be ignorant of mathematics of astronomy and navigation but that if perchance a book treating of those subjects fell into my hands far from committing it to the flames i should carefully preserve it for my children or for some other person who might better than myself be capable of appreciating its value i could not observe that don ulloa felt any ways offended at the firmness of my remark nay i have generally noticed that the spaniards though naturally lofty and proud despise those who have not the hardihood of thinking or expressing themselves with becoming boldness and dignity still had i to ascribe to this conversation the afflicting consequence that though he never gave me occasion for complaint the general never after seemed to entertain the same esteem for nor confide in me to the extent i wished and that for the future i should have to place little reliance on his interest i felt the uneasiness this assurance occasioned me materially increased upon reflecting on the observation of the captain of the quarter-deck who one day dining with the general in a naive manner confessed that when a lieutenant he had been appointed in conjunction with one of his comrades to accompany the abbot de la chope on his journey from vera cruz to mexico apparently as a mark of distinction but in reality 
for the purpose of watching his movements and preventing his visiting the works of the fortress of Pierrot in the vicinage of Jalapa, which were then under hand. I drew as a conclusion from this, with greater reason as I had come to the country without a passport from the court, that I also was beleaguered with spies. These, I reckoned, could be no other than my officers of the engineering corps, and under this impression it was not without much disquiet I observed their noticing everything and ferreting every corner of my apartment. However, reflecting that I had had the prudence of concealing my plan from everybody and that no papers I had could betray me, I became less alarmed. I even passed my time very pleasantly with my fancied spies, visiting them very frequently, and professed great attachment to and confidence in them. They told me much respecting the abbot Chop de la Roche. They themselves had made corresponding and simultaneous observations in the province of Sonora at the time of the expedition against the savages, while the abbot was observing the transit of Venus over the disk of the sun. The arrival of learned men in this dull country is so remarkable that it is traditionally preserved in the memory of everybody and forms an epoch as noted as the appearance of the celestial bodies they come hither to observe. A Peruvian marquis whom I met with at the Havana never swore by any other name than de la Condamine. Note Charles Marie de la Condamine, 1701-1774, was a French explorer who spent ten years in South America. Condamine was indeed generally well beloved, and his departure was seen with sentiments of regret by all the Peruvians. This by Don Ulloa was not, however, attributed to any honorable desert in him. He told me that he was a jocose character, much addicted to pleasantry in his conversation, and complimentary even to adulation towards the Peruvians, whose friendship and affection he was solicitous of captivating, that at bottom he was a shallow-brained fellow, full of presumption, and ready to sacrifice everything to the acquirement of fame. He added that he had the meanness to obtain a classical description from Monsieur Jusso of Quinine and robbed him thus unfairly of the honor due to him of its discovery. I availed myself of the opportunity a conversation on this head afforded to learn the truth of the relation given by M. de la Condamine of the murder of Seigneurd, respecting which I had always had my doubts. I consequently put many questions on the subject to Don Ulloa, the result of which was as follows. Seigneurd fell in love with a tradesman's daughter, who was under promise of marriage to an alcalde of the place. He met a return, and even more than a return to his passion. But, satiety cooling his warmth, he fancied he could not show his gratitude towards the lady in a better manner than by endeavoring to renew the engagement between her and the alcalde. Now, in matters of this nature, the Spaniards are to the full as delicate as the French. The alcalde turned a deaf ear to all suggestions on that head, and Seigneurd threatened compulsory measures in the erai, or else. As ill luck would have it, Seigneurd went to a bullfight and was seated in his mistress's box. At the instant the spectacle was beginning, and the alcalde was issuing his orders for all the masks to leave the arena. The father of his Dulcinea, obstinately determining to remain, was greeted with a threshing, and the daughter in the box where she was seated recognized him by his cries, wrung her hands in greatest trepidation and alarm. "'My God! My God!' she screamed out. "'It is my father they are beating!' At these words, Another Don Quixote, Seigneurd, jumps into the arena out of the box, and, sword in hand, cutting and pushing, 
attempts to force a passage through the posse of officers the number of aguacils increases and the mob fly to their assistance disorder and tumult are at their height and though the alcalde issues no other order than for the arrest of senor he gets killed in the fray in this event there is nothing but what is perfectly natural and what might be expected from the petulance common to frenchmen and the arrogance of a young surgeon who intoxicated by a fortunate opening succeeded by the most happy success imagined in himself a right to do as he pleased with the peruvians and injure them in their very homesteads don ulloa further assured me that no one but m de la condamine would have instituted the process which followed he likewise related to me the adventure of the night passed in pinchincha by m de la condamine who out of bravado had separated from his party and lost his way and how he jeered him upon it in the morning on his reaching the rendezvous drenched with wet benumbed with cold and dying with hunger what a fine night this eh monsieur de la condamine said he what a precious page for your journal on another occasion the conversation turned to the duchess of pompadour with whom he had acquaintance when in france from the affectionate manner in which he spoke of her i guessed he was indebted to her interference for his advancement at the spanish court what however to me was far more interesting than all was his account of the affair of new orleans note this affair was then recent history in seventeen sixty two at the end of the seven years war france ceded louisiana to spain and don ulloa had been appointed governor of the territory the french colonists rebelled against ulloa and expelled him and his wife from louisiana in seventeen sixty nine his successor alejandro o'reilly crushed the revolt and executed the ringleaders End note. though ulloa might appear to me inclined to relate facts in a manner widely different from that used by certain enthusiasts the unaffected manner in which he described the rude treatment he had to endure the little animation or vivacity he mingled in his recital persuaded me that the revolution was no other than as he assured me the effect of misconduct and imprudence and that it was kindled and blown into a flame by the cupidity of the chief administrators of the affairs of the colony the revenge taken by the spanish court was not merely a consequence of the representations of don ulloa it was a merited punishment of what was considered an act of rebellion and such as in any other nation would probably have been extended to a far greater number of delinquents the general agreed that the vexation of the people at seeing themselves turned over like inanimate beings or animals sold in a market to another master in louis the fifteenth was not without foundation but then he observed as governor what had i to do with this vexation how could i remedy it or how even the king of spain himself sufficiently chagrined at being obliged to be content with so small a compensation circumstances added he alone were to blame and the hard necessity to which and to the insistence of a powerful monarch he was obliged to submit while for the new government it has not after all been either injurious or severe to those by whom it was opposed i have heard much fault found with don ulloa but all the subjects of complaint that were alleged against him were charges of familiarity unworthy of his rank and a shabby meanness in his domestic concerns he has never given room for any one accusing him of injustice or cruelty and he was in fact the log of fable his excessive patience made him despised and dismissed o'reilly who succeeded him was the stork however much amused by these narratives of the general 
i never lost sight of the object i had in view i frequently visited don atenas and don lobo two spanish merchants but saw them thus often merely for putting myself in the way of hearing matters relating to my plan End of section six. Section seven of Travels to Oaxaca by Nicholas Joseph Thierry de Menonville, an anonymous translation from the French. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. One day, while in company with my French engineer at the house of the latter merchant, I saw him examining certain packages of vanilla. I inquired, as if casually, from what quarter it was obtained, and learnt that it came from Guadalajara, sixty leagues distant, or from Oaxaca, the distance of which latter place was a hundred leagues from Veracruz, also that it was cultivated by the Indians. They next talked about cochineal. I did not as may well be conceived begin this subject but i profited by what i heard i learnt that the cochineal from oaxaca was preferable and yielded a more beautiful colour than that from tlaxcala or guadalajara which made me resolve on choosing oaxaca for the spot i should repair to i had moreover two other reasons equally weighty for this decision the first the better opportunity i should have of obtaining the most perfect information respecting the cochineal in a country of where it is largely cultivated the second the circumstance of this road being less frequented than that leading to mexico by tlaxcala and guadalajara and this circumstance affording me a greater facility in avoiding highwaymen and inquisitive eyes it is a certain matter in fact that resolved as i was on the journey though i should not even obtain my passport and in spite of all the viceroys in the world i ran much less risk of discovery on the road to oaxaca on which i should not be suspected than on that of mexico the only city worth seeing that only for which i had sought a passport and on which i should be sought after the first notice of my departure thus with a resolution if i should obtain a passport for mexico to use it merely for oaxaca the route to which i had adroitly learnt from a frenchman who had been in the service of the late viceroy i waited with impatience an answer to the three memoirs which in succession i had addressed to the viceroy of mexico to obtain the so much wished for passport even spaniards themselves from whatever part of the world they arrive at vera cruz are not allowed to leave it without a passport from the viceroy and i ceased to frequent the house of don ulloa except to inquire respecting it at length on wednesday the thirtieth may seventeen seventy seven he in a very cool manner before dinner announced that he had received an answer from don bucarelli in which he plainly signified it was not in his power as i was a foreigner to admit of my entering el famoso reino the famous kingdom except by special order from the court of spain note however ungrateful to me the name of this nobleman i here give it for reasons which it may not be difficult to comprehend he was called el excelentissimo senor y beato fraile don antonio bucarelli y ursua teniente general de los reinos de nueva españa viceroy general of the kingdoms of new spain this news affected me far more in reality than i chose to show and i made a very bad dinner though without attending to what i did i devoured a great deal the general did not fail to inquire what i meant to do i pretended to be satisfied 
and to be determined to demand the necessary passports through the court of france and wait for them at vera cruz or in case of my being sent out of the country to go myself in search of them but i had already made up my mind in case of such an event occurring as had happened as don ulloa had a quarrel with the governor i naturally concluded that the latter would have no knowledge of the objection raised by the viceroy and decided on requesting of him a distinct passport for orizaba which was within his jurisdiction and about forty leagues from vera cruz by means of this passport to the license in which i meant to give the trifling extension of sixty leagues i hoped to reach oaxaca but hardly to itself did my soul unburthen this design and with much more reason was it then reserved from others i went in consequence to mr Furson, and concealing from him the refusal i had experienced intimated how impatient i was to reach mexico what vexation so much tardiness occasioned me and how happy it would make me if even i merely obtained permission to herborize on the volcanic mountain of orizaba he stopped me upon this and proffered in the handsomest manner himself to solicit the governor for the favor i sought i flew into his arms embraced him in the most affectionate manner and that very evening as a token of my grateful feelings sent him certain books which he had manifested a desire to possess i saw him the next day he had dined with the governor and obtained the passport on saturday he brought it me in good order i concealed from him in a great degree the transport i felt lest he should recognize the great importance i attached to this paper and be anxious to search into its motive the next day sunday i passed in preparations for my journey and dined with the general that he might have no suspicion of my project monday i was to have hired horses in order to set off the next morning the morning of this day this fatal monday i rose in raptures of traitorous joy and gayer than ever before i repaired to the dwelling of mr Furson for letters of recommendation to orizaba breakfasted with him and returned home to complete the packing of my things of a sudden i perceived a man in a blue coat with a red cockade enter my apartment he was quite out of breath and looked wild sinister and angry as soon as he was able to speak he announced himself as the secretary of the governor and ordered me in spanish in the name of the king to give up the passport which the governor had entrusted to mr Furson, these words which i but too well comprehended affected me as would have done an electric shock i alternately became pale and red and feigned in order to have time for recollecting myself that i could not understand what he said but he so often and so distinctly repeated to me el papel que el señor gobernador entregó al señor don francisco de Ferson, that i thought it vain any longer to turn a deaf ear then all at once with another turn of features and assuming a gay and gracious air as if i began to comprehend him i said i was incapable of making any improper use of a kindness i might receive from the governor and delivered up the papel so much sighed for by me begging him at the same time to present my respects with my thanks i wished as he seemed much fatigued to induce the secretary to rest himself but he begged to be excused assuring me that he had express orders to make no stoppage anywhere until he had brought back my passport and not to appear before his master unless he took it with him 
i readily conceived from these words that some alarming storm was bursting over my head but still using dissimulation i asked him apparently with the utmost indifference what possibly could be the motives of so sudden a change in the sentiments of the governor he answered that the post that day had brought certain orders from the viceroy concerning me in virtue of which he verbally notified that i was forbidden in the king's name to leave the district of the city of vera cruz i hastened to mr Furson with such impatience that i almost flew i saw i heard nothing and was unable but hastily and in half ejaculated words to relate to him my disastrous adventure conjuring him at the same time to conduct me to the governor in order to have this matter elucidated we repaired to the palace and found there the governor for his part perfectly satisfied with recovering his papel and repeated to me the forbiddance before announced by his secretary of exceeding the limits of the jurisdiction of the city an injunction he said which by order of his superiors he was bound to communicate m de Furson joked with him observing that if i had taken his advice he would have found the bird flown but afterwards in a more serious tone he inquired what possibly could have originated so rigid an injunction in answer don palacio exhibited to us the letter of the viceroy written after a deliberation of the audiencia real of mexico and the conclusion of the procurator general grounded among other matters on the apprehension of opening to strangers the secrets of the rich culture of the country here my heart panted so violently that i no longer heard anything but the order for my leaving the country an order quite the reverse of that i solicited beginning perro de regresar a su tierra on this the governor who read the whole with much emphasis laid still greater stress reading it even thrice over and showing me the letter where it was written in fine he was expressly enjoined to be himself present at my going on board to draw up a declaration to that effect and certify the same to the viceroy he then speaking for himself desired i would inform him when i meant to depart and what ship i meant to sail in this i promised after which he took leave of me making a thousand excuses and professions and even going the length of calling me hijo mio or son but i was not his dupe on leaving the palace i took a hasty leave of mr Furson in the street and repaired to my lodging deadly sick at heart i walked backwards and forwards now threw myself on a seat and now into my cot swinging it from one side to the other with such violence as to risk breaking my head against the ceiling not the least ray of comfort beamed on my mind in vain did i exclaim to myself aloud if possible that i might listen and become less distracted in vain did i exclaim be calm thou madman poor intemperate fool take pity on thy intellects art thou not yet at vera cruz hast thou not reached this distance on thy road and dost thou not still remain oh yes retorted anguish but thou art ordered hence and must go and empty-handed go thy ways thy plan of four years standing even in the very port now falls to wreck four years are lost of the profession thyself selected that hope of fortune vanishes so fondly pictured in thy mind the advances made by thy family the bounty of thy sovereign are vain and foolishly gone thou failed in an affair undertaken in contradiction to the advice of thy father thy friends and every one an affair which for four years has subjected thee to nothing but alarms chagrin mortification 
toil, and dangers of every description. And what a blessed profit hast thou gained! Thou hast rashly pledged thyself to the minister, and what account hast thou to render? Shame, humiliation, ridicule, contempt will be thy lot on every side thou turnest, and worst of all, thy object will remain unaffected. The Spaniards exclusively possess their cochineal. Thinkest thou of this, and dost not die of anguish? What then is grief so little to be feared? Is it so powerless of suffocation? I pass the whole morning a prey to such tormenting reflections, and under the greatest agitation, swallowing three quarts of lemonade, but without the least appetite for food. No, the smallest morsel would certainly have choked me. At length, tired and overcome by the weight of so much affliction, my mind made a last effort for relief. By dint of perpetual repetition, thou art still at Veracruz. The fundamental point of a desperate project presented itself to my ideas. I calculated that as no appointed time was fixed for my departure, and as there was no ship in the port which would sail for three weeks to come, I might, in a fortnight's time, complete a stolen journey. Thou absolutely must, said I to myself, penetrate into the interior, though destitute of passport, must bear away the fleece for which thou hast sailed despite of all the dragons in the way. Inflamed by this idea, the very apprehension of being unable to realize it threw me into a cold sweat. Je la no la vene, bolon y spiritu, frozen veins, boiling spirits. But this beam of light dispersed the former gloom and brought with it a portion of tranquility. I now thought of nothing but developing my plan and digesting its detail. I walked out in the evening to take an airing and went to the Nieveria, where I treated my engineers. They complimented me on forgetting so soon the vexation to which I had in the morning been subject. I suffered them to remain in their error and returned home, where, without taking any supper, I passed the night in reviewing the plan I had projected in my mind in retrenching, adding, and changing its minutinae, and calculating on probabilities and accidents. At length I fell asleep, and refreshed after three hours, found my spirits less heated and my head more clear. At daybreak, however, I reflected with some surprise that there was no room left for any alteration in the plan projected the night before a circumstance arising from my peculiar and constrained position. Malum est concilium quad mutare nequit, says Tacitus. It's a bad plan that admits of no modification. This I repeated to myself, but in vain. I could find no plan better than the whole I had in mind, and no choice left but either to put it in execution or return unsuccessful. The latter, to me, was more dreadful than death itself, and this at once justified in the eye of reason the evident rashness of the attempt. I rose in the morning rather less content than on the morning before, but sufficiently so to look on the maximum of danger I risked with a dispassionate eye. I found the worst that could happen to me, in case of arrest, would be to be sent back, tied hand and foot, to Veracruz, and there to be imprisoned in the fort, or on board the ship of the general of the port, until my embarkation. In short, merely a failure, that probably might not take place in my object, which would be the case, however, at certainty, if I did not attempt the journey." Everything tended to strengthen me in my last resolves, though I reflected upon many obstacles I should have to encounter. In the first place, nothing less than a miracle, on a road over which so many pikemen were dispersed for the purpose of arresting deserters and strangers, 
could guard me from being asked by someone or other of them for my passport in the second place my dress was not that of a spaniard and this inconvenience neither time nor my means allowed of my remedying this circumstance showed me a foreigner and exposed me the more to the looks of curiosity thirdly an appendage to the last noticed predicament i spoke the spanish language very indifferently in the fourth place i was almost entirely ignorant of the road and it was only by the merest chance and nicest management i was enabled to learn by what gate i had to leave the town finally it was necessary i should set out on foot in a climate where i should have much to encounter from the season of the year and the sands through which i had to travel i must also go unprovided with linen provision change of dress and books and without instruments to reap the possible result of my excursion in increasing our knowledge of natural history the plan i framed for remedying these inconveniences was as follows i shall travel on foot said i to myself as a botanical physician resident at vera cruz in search of simples i shall assume the appearance of taking a walk rather than being on a journey shall lodge only in the poorest huts of the indians and in places away from the high road pretending to have lost my way i shall avoid all towns hamlets and villages where possible and where not pass through them by night i shall declare myself a catalan from the frontiers of france which will explain the reason for my speaking french well and the spanish but indifferently i shall always go neatly dressed wear some trinkets jewelry affect a good-natured and free disposition and pay liberally for all i take with all these precautions i must indeed be unlucky if i should be taken for a foreigner or a deserter in fine after some little provision against the most urgent wants for example a broad-brimmed hat a net for the hair a rosary an indispensable article etc and after setting aside about three hundred gourds in quadruplets coins i fixed upon the friday night following for my departure in the meantime i visited my friends and acquaintance whom i apprised in a loose manner that i meant to pass the remainder of my stay with madame de boutillos at medellin on the friday i dined with the general to whom i related the trick i had played the governor it seemed to please him greatly and he assured me if i had suddenly made my departure after obtaining the passport no notice had been taken of the matter the remainder of the day i passed with the engineers and returned home to reflect a few moments on my undertaking it was about nine o'clock when after carefully locking up all my effects i departed as if merely to take a walk i soon reached the rampart scaled it and bade adieu to the city for a long time i travelled briskly along through the sands under favour of the light afforded by the stars but a violent wind effacing all traces of the road and the sky being overclouded i found myself wandering i knew not whither at the distance of more than a league from the town undecided i went first one way then another to the crowing of the cocks and observed the rising of smoke but all in vain though i had twenty times before travelled over these spots night by enveloping all objects with the same shadowy veil disfigured the rallying points which otherwise might have struck my memory i climbed large amounts of sand some firm and others movable until i was utterly exhausted at length anxiety combined with fatigue made me determine on re-entering the city but now was the embarrassment to find it for i no longer distinguished its fires 
at length i saw one in the distance of three hundred twafts i ran thither it was the cabin of a free negro whom i had seen before in my neighborhood i told him i had lost my way in returning from medellin he directed me on the right road and i was exceedingly surprised at finding myself a quarter of a league south of the city while i imagined myself in the west i immediately scaled the rampart and returned to my home terribly fatigued and still more vexed at my bad beginning however after changing my linen i threw myself into my hammock and enjoyed a sleep as sweet as it was necessary the next day at three in the morning i left home a second time and again scaled the ramparts this time with some risk of breaking my neck and behold now don quixote in the country end of section seven section eight of travels to oaxaca by nicholas joseph thierry de menonville an anonymous translation from the french this librivox recording is in the public domain i used every precaution not to miss the road but directing my steps too much towards the north i again strayed from my way and was lost nearly an hour in the sands however recognizing in the heavens the ear of corn of the constellation virgo and mars and saturn which were already in the east i directed my steps westward till daybreak at four i overheard the country people going to market and guided by their voice kept on a parallel with the road but about a hundred fathoms distant to avoid being seen at length by dawn of day the road taking through a forest i was obliged to enter it but i took the precaution to slacken my pace as often as i distinguished any indians negroes or spaniards after they had passed i made up for lost time at five o'clock i had cleared the forest and was two leagues and a half from vera cruz here the road divided and occasioned a new embarrassment perceiving a muleteer with a train of a hundred and twenty mules advancing i put questions to him with caution and learnt that he came from oaxaca by the road of monte calabaza which he pointed out to me observing at the same time that he passed it the day before after this very good said i to myself to-night i shall sleep at calabaza and sauntering leisurely along till he was out of sight proceeded on my way but when no longer visible to the muleteer i got on at such a rate that by eleven o'clock i had travelled nine german leagues i drank a glass of brandy and ate a biscuit in a tavern by the roadside near the forest this satisfied me till nine o'clock when i was parched with thirst i was walking in a level savanna thinly strewed with copses of mimosa cornigera bombax saba and wild fig trees save where these made their casual appearance the earth was bare for we were now at the close of winter that is to say of the dry heats which parch all the herbage and the cottagers had set fire to the dry grass to admit of the young blades pushing after the rain it was to me a spectacle truly pleasing to behold already from the plain where i stood the mountains alvarado on the south those of orizaba on the west and the sierra leona on the northwest forming a natural rampart extending the space of a hundred and fifty leagues and which mountains i trusted soon to surmount but in the meantime i was dying with heat and thirst i met two muleteers conducting two hundred and fifty mules i entreated them to sell me some water they answered they were not water sellers but at the same time one of them unfastened from the pommel of his saddle a bottle full and presented it to me when i had drunk after this fashion 
much at my ease i pulled out my purse but flicking the spurs into their mules the muleteers merely called out vaya usted con dios god be with you i continued my way by eleven i found myself as thirsty as ever i fancied i distinguished a hut it turned out however to be only one of those mexican ornaments of which on my road i met with several formed of earth in a pyramidal shape from thirty-five to forty feet high on a base of twenty and bearing a perfect resemblance to our ice houses i looked round in vain on every side no habitation was visible nearer than six leagues toward the north i could not travel thus far out of my road i felt no fatigue the road was good but i was dying with thirst i imagined i had made a charming discovery on distinguishing in a thicket a kind of spherical cucumber it is but insipid said i to myself but it is aqueous and refreshing i ran to the spot gathered and even bit one the electric shock is not more sudden of effect i thought myself poisoned in this dry and spongy fruit i found a hot and corrosive bitterness which increased my thirst in the proportion as sulphur and bitumen would the flames of a burning pyre foolish botanist then said i to myself did you then imagine that all small gourds are the same this will teach you more carefully to study the different species the size of the fruit equal to that of our melons and its round figure completely deluded me i therefore sought some other assager of thirst i saw some fruit of a certain cactus called by the spaniards tunas it is a species of opuntia found in santa domingo with red fruit i took two or three of these figs peeled and ate them these greatly lessened my thirst when i plucked others and devoured near thirty but failing possibly of peeling them with due care their burning cottony covering occasioned my tongue and lips to swell immediately and i found myself on the point of suffocation i still continued my journey and met with no one at times the leaves of trees agitated by zephyrs struck the ear in the manner of distant waterfalls or some murmuring brook while listening to this pleasing promise the winds stilled into calm i no longer heard anything and almost resigned myself to despair in the meantime the god of day already four and twenty degrees above the horizon darted his unsheltered beams upon me a thousand times reflected by the burning plain beneath i had merely a very light sea breeze at my back before an immense plain eighty leagues deep presented to my view at the extremity nothing but lofty mountains it seemed as if all nature conspired against me i thought at one instant i plainly distinguished the roof of a hut i quickened my steps but after going three-quarters of a league in the direction i saw it I found myself in a little thicket, where, no longer perceiving the object, I fancied myself mistaken, and for once lost all patience. I halted, and looking carefully around a bombax to see if there were neither a serpent nor mosquitoes to dread, I laid down under its shade and slept nearly two hours. The sun had now passed its meridian. I rose and sad enough continued my journey but oh unlooked-for happiness i had scarcely proceeded a quarter of a league before i distinctly saw the house i thought i had seen before it was still about six hundred yards from me on the summit of a hillock near the river hamapa to reach it took but an instant and enchanted with the sight of that beautiful river i would fain have leapt into its waves i entered the cabin about three in the afternoon the host was a shepherd but i conjured as well as the hostess 
por amor de dios to give me drink and food this they did with all diligence i drank successively a quart of water two quarts of milk and as many of lemonade and devoured the wing and thigh of a turkey with three fresh laid eggs before i answered the least question the shepherd asked me if i was a spaniard castellano i answered i was a physician of catalonia i judged as much said he from your gait you europeans take longer strides than we creoles thus do those who are most nearly connected with nature observe her with keenest eye as the shepherd seemed to me rather curious and discerning i paid him and complaining of a dreadful headache threw myself on a hurdle made of branches where i fell asleep four reals which i gave my host earned me at least four thousand benedictions i slept so tranquilly that i did not wake until three the next morning the morning broke on the world here only at four still i did not fail pursuing my journey without taking leave of my hosts for fear of awakening them i descended the hill and reached the side of the river at first i was under some embarrassment respecting the means of crossing it but recollecting that it is but a branch of the same river which flows by medellin and that it is not deep i was on the point of undressing myself to wade over when about twenty fathoms higher up i distinguished a flat-bottomed canoe i jumped into it and seizing a boat hook pushed over in an instant to the other side in no part did i find more than three feet water though the river was two hundred yards broad by jumping on shore i awakened a dog which began to bark and soon after i noticed a negro looking at me over a hedge i asked him what was the fare of the ferry a real was his reply then give it me said i jokingly for having done your work for you he at this was content to receive nothing though i left him his fare at this spot i avoided the first danger i had to encounter the right passage as i learnt on my return is lower down and there a corps de garde is stationed and a picket of pikemen my ignorance of the right road thus freed me from many interrogatories after passing this river i had no other to cross for sixteen leagues i tripped along lightly by narrow but good and easy paths for the space of six leagues i saw not a single human being and should willingly have fancied myself for an instant the only one in nature but for an immense number of rabbits far from wild that gambled in my pathway few deserts are seen equally beautiful more than half the ground consists of an excellent staple of loamy earth yellow or black and well adapted to cultivation the remainder of savannas at six in the morning i heard turkeys on my right which made me imagine myself near some dwelling about seven i saw a dozen of them spring forth from some withered herbage before me and fly away with a terrible noise their flight was so rapid and so long continued that i was satisfied of their being wild turkeys a quarter of an hour after two others ran from the ground about a hundred steps from me and afterwards three more from my left circumstances which convinced me of their being an indian production or at least of their having become naturalized in the country and shook off the domestic yoke by nine in the morning i found myself within reach of what is called a rancho a sort of canteen here i found an old curious and impudent negress but neither bread nor meat nor eggs nor brandy i was fain to be content with a dish of hard beans badly stewed and a morsel of bread i had brought with me from vera cruz happy precaution 
I made myself some punch with tafia, rum, and afterwards took three hours' rest on a frame of bamboo in the shape of a bedstead. At one in the afternoon I continued my journey. The sky was overclouded and a brisk wind blew. In the morning I had crossed five arroyos, or torrent, beds, and in the afternoon passed again twelve others. Nothing can be conceived more fatiguing and unpleasant than these passes, owing to the trunks of trees, blocks of stone, and monstrous pebbles with which they are strewed. I was indeed in a slight degree indemnified by the variety of the plants I found in them. I saw a mimosa perfectly similar in leaf and port to the pomegranate tree, yuccas sixty feet high, ferns of very singular kinds, an arum with an upright but low stem and a palmated panatophid leaf, a plant of great beauty, but so large that a root would weigh ten pounds, polyanthus, amaryllis, etc., I found among these torrent beds likewise several wild horses, but very rarely any water. At length I reached Mount Calabasa by five in the evening, much fatigued. The apprehension of losing my way, and of not readily finding any other resting place, made me determine on halting here. I expected to have found it a village. It was but a rancho or hostel round which horses, horned, and other cattle were reared, and nothing but maize was sown, which serves for food as well to the cattle as their guardians. These ranchos are composed of three or four wretched huts. The de men, dependent on them, is sometimes from ten to twenty-five leagues square, in which were about a hundred horses, three or four hundred sheep, and a few hundred cows. This rancho was extensive. The farmer, a Spaniard, or at least of mixed breed, was about sixty years of age, of handsome figure, civil but grave, and of rather, as he seemed to me, a harsh character. I accosted him and entreated shelter. He granted my request, admonishing me beforehand that he kept no inn, and had neither bread, nor meat, nor wine, nor brandy. But to what he had, I was heartily welcome. I begged of him half a dozen eggs, which I ate with tortillas. These tortillas are cakes made of maize, first boiled in water, into which a handful of lime is cast to soften the exterior skin. The skin is afterwards washed off, and the peeled maize is crushed with a cylindrical stone by rolling it over a flat one eighteen inches long by ten broad. After this first process it is kneaded with the hand and rounded and flattened to the thickness of about four lines. It is then baked on a stone or iron plate heated for the purpose and turned that both sides may be properly baked. In two minutes the cake is made. It is always an insipid food, but very stomachic, never causes indigestion, and at no time occasioned me any inconvenience. In a family consisting of two women and five or six men, the former are constantly employed morning and night in preparing tortillas. Five or six are requisite for one person at each meal, and they are constantly eaten fresh. My host, who appeared to me to be an old soldier, and who, as I afterwards learnt, was really one of those pikemen whom I so much dreaded, seemed a wily old fox, at least by the questions he put to me. But as I had undoubtedly every resemblance of a physician, he could but give me credit for my tale. Notwithstanding this, he pertinaciously refused me a horse for the next day, for I thought myself now far enough from Veracruz to venture this indulgence. I was, however, forced to forego it. I offered to pay him for his supper, but he refused to take any recompense. 
Upon this I gave four reals to his wife or mistress, for though he had a number of children, I could not learn from him whether or no he was married. My liberality earned me for the night the enjoyment of an old cloak, which had once been blue, but which from service had become gray. In this I wrapped myself and laid me down on a mat on the floor of a neighboring penthouse, lean-to, but for this kindness I risked to have died of cold, for scarcely had I left the door of the hut before one of those dreadful storms of rain fell, which are termed at Santa Domingo avalanches, and of which the drops are as large and fall with as loud a sound as the most formidable hailstones of Europe. The noise they made was frightful. The rain, driven by the wind, penetrated the branches and leaves which covered the penthouse and ran through it as from so many spouts. In an instant, the whole of the interior was drenched. One would have thought a water spout had burst over the place. The weather caused me the most mournful reflections. In a country intersected by torrents and rivers, if this storm should only be the precursor of others, how should I be able to travel, especially on my return with the booty I hoped to gain? Could even the best horse in the world carry me safe among the rocks and trees which are almost always brought down from the ravines from such storms? These reflections were very far from comfortable. But having planned everything for the best, I had no other reliance than on Providence. With this conclusion, I covered my head with the cloak and enjoyed a profound sleep till four the next morning. The melancholy ideas which had afflicted me the evening before vanished with the shades of night. A clear and serene sky, a cool morning, the prospect of the mountains of Orizaba, from which I was now but twenty leagues distant, their branch, which advanced forward about eight leagues, like a steep and inaccessible rampart along the whole contour of the plain, delighted me and instilled fresh courage in my breast. From Veracruz I constantly advanced southwest. Here the mountains in front of the plain, having no opening on the west, the road bends several points towards the south. It is worthy of remark that throughout this vast plain the course of the torrents and rivers is from northwest to southeast, and that their beds, though in a country so flat as to seem level, have considerable depth. This singularity arises no doubt from their descending uniformly from the mountains of Orizaba, and from the immense volumes of water proceeding from the melted snow and the hot springs of these mountains, having, by their weight and impulse, gradually excavated the country to a vast distance, and thus, in the lapse of time, worked a slope for themselves, which they do not seem to have possessed at an earlier period. Though the rain was dreadfully violent during the night, such was the parched state of these sandy cantons, that the ground was moistened scarcely two inches below the surface. On this day's journey I found oaks with ovate leaves slightly dentated, a white amaryllis, which I brought back with me, a polyanthus, whose rasped root is used by the Indians in lieu of soap, three large flocks of sheep, twenty coveys of partridges, not so large as quails, and rabbits out of number. I had to pass, moreover, no less than sixteen arroyos. The soil appeared to me generally more fertile and of better staple than that observed the day before. Still, it is not the less uncultivated and without inhabitants. By eleven in the morning I had traveled eight leagues without eating and without drinking anything but a little lemonade that I procured of two Indians who were building a hut, and who were the only rational beings I met with. I now found myself at the foot of the first chain of mountains. 
but the steep and almost perpendicular declivity before me the projecting rocks of which were discernible through the hanging woods formed only a portion of the obstacles which nature not satisfied with this bulwark had opposed to the entrance into mexico in advance of these steeps and at the very foot of them she has formed an enormous fosse at the bottom of which runs a river ten fathoms broad of such rapid such violent current that it has dug itself a bed through ten strata of different kinds of stone of eighty feet deep over this bed it winds its course like a serpent amid the sands almost without a murmur but foaming and with the rapidity of lightning on throwing a pebble into the river i judged the depth of it to be fifteen feet when from a wretched bridge made of half rotten bavens bundles of brushwood by which this river is crossed one looks down on the torrent below the head turns dizzy at the extremity of this bridge is a rock which commands and covers it in such manner that ten men might keep as many regiments in check in the rock an angular and zigzag passage is cut through which the road lies and in which no more than two persons can march abreast add to this a few pieces of artillery placed on the summit could thence destroy an entire army venturing to force a passage half a league lower down is another river which empties itself into this called the rio de la punta or of the point this is not so deeply encased as the one it joins i found at the end of the bridge by which it is passed a spaniard who received toll as he had neither bread nor wine i resolved on proceeding to dine at san lorenzo though the distance was full three leagues the toll gatherer warned me de las aguas the coming rain i heeded him not but had cause to repent a heavy shower quickly brought me back and subjected me to his jeers on its ceasing i resumed my road and soon reached some sugar grounds which seemed to me forsaken notwithstanding the buildings were capacious the plantations very extensive and the canes fifteen feet high at length i came to a ravine the bed of a torrent a hundred and fifty fathoms broad and forty feet deep i fancied before me the enormous skeleton of some extinct river if such an expression be permitted the only one i could fancy adequate to depict the gigantic ideas enforced on my imagination by the singular spectacle of the rocks the immense trunks of trees the enormous stones of all colors rounded by long and violent friction which were piled on each other in confusion in the chasm what a horrid spectacle but yet how magnificent how terrible all these masses now motionless and surrounded by deepest silence had erst been driven with resistless impetuosity had experienced amid the noise of horrid crash and dashing foam an active change of station how mightily powerful then must have been the vast and inconceivable volume of water that thus could have made the sport of weights and bulks like these scarcely though the bed was dry was i enabled to pass these obstructions to my way picture to yourself reader this chasm winding vast and deep enclosed on either side by a forest of trees equally lofty still and sombre and ask what painter could venture the display of scenes so wild and monstrous oh vernet tis thou alone perhaps would not in vain have dared note claude joseph vernet an eighteenth-century french painter here it was i saw many pairs of those beautiful parrots of the brazils with pointed tails called arara canjas 
of the Amazons, with green plumage mixed with the yellow of the jonquil and of the size of the guinea parrot, and a bird of prey, black and white, with red feathers round the beak, the size of our buzzard. A most excellent staple, in addition, presented me on every side a vegetation equally abundant and varied. But, alas, it was impossible for me to load myself with such a mass of treasure. I therefore made the best of my way, with my eyes cast down, and solicitous almost of avoiding the sight of objects I could not choose but sigh for. At length I arrived, excessively fatigued, at San Lorenzo. The inn here is for a Spanish inn, a charming one, and to me was truly so. The mistress was civil, and I was served with diligence. I had four fresh eggs, a chicken, and some excellent bread, together with some red wine. Immediately after I departed, resolved on reaching Villa Cordoba that day, but scarcely had I left the churchyard, where I had been to examine at leisure its plumeria frangipani, with purple, rosy, and yellow-colored flowers, and thirty feet high, before the rain again began to fall. I took shelter under an Indian hut, when at the instant a negro passed me with three horses, the same I had seen before at La Punta. I did not venture to accost the negro before the Spaniard, but with Indians I was rendered bold by necessity. I asked him to let me one of his horses, and he agreed to conduct me as far as to his village, two leagues beyond, but the name of which I forget. I jumped on horseback upon this, without either boots, spur, or cloak. The negro, in order to shelter me from the rain, contrived to cover my head with a mat which hung down before and behind like a dalmatian mantle never was robinson crusoe more grotesquely apparelled end of section eight section nine of travels to oaxaca by nicholas joseph thierry de menonville an anonymous translation from the French. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. We had got at a pretty brisk pace a league on our way when my guide pointed out to me the garita or guard house of the customs officers by the side of the road. I trembled on remembrance that I had no passport. The guards had the right to stop me but we were now too near to seek to avoid them. I therefore conceived I could do no better than pretend to be asleep on my horse, and even half dead, in case they should attempt to force me to alight or speak. How over-charitable my opinion of the Spanish sentries to nourish such disquiet! The rain prevented these vigilant gentry from leaving their shelter, and even no doubt from seeing us and we reached the village by night without any accident. In the shop of a grocer I met with bread, wine, eggs, and chocolate, and went to rest after agreeing with the negro to conduct me in the morning to the city of Cordoba for thirteen reals. I slept badly. At two in the morning I ran to the hut of my negro to awaken him and hasten our departure, but in vain we were not able to set off before four. We entered the gorge of the first chain of mountains through an immense forest. It seems the Spaniards at one epoch deemed this passage of importance, for at every league we discerned the ruins of forts, redoubts, entrenchments, and other fortifications, more or less dilapidated, by which the gorge had once been defended. The gorge is about a hundred fathoms in breadth. Between San Lorenzo and the city of Cordoba, I reckoned seven of these forts, all of them built of stone, but not any of them in an integral state. In lieu of these it is, and near them, that some guard houses, called by the Spaniards garitas, have been constructed. 
never did i look upon these guard houses against smuggling in such an odious light or as such a shocking proof of the arbitrariness of power as in the new world in a country where with difficulty the most absolute necessaries of life can be obtained is it tolerable that by the exertion of atrocious barbarity an indigenous plant tobacco which nature strews beneath the very footsteps of the inhabitants for their comfort should become so far a scourge to them that they are not at liberty without the liveliest dread to stupefy themselves by its narcotic quality and steep in oblivion the memory of their sufferings the soil we travelled over consisted of a deep and inexhaustible red earth singularly fertile i saw again another sugar plantation and canes of monstrous size beyond immense fields of tobacco thus the most productive ground in nature is in the hands of a lazy people who merely cultivate a plant which can give no nourishment to its cultivator four leagues brought us to the villa de cordoba domes towers numerous steeples announced a large city and gave me great apprehension a fresh garita at the gates of the city might there not be some information given respecting me might not a troop of pikemen be waiting to put me into irons alone on foot i might have avoided the town as i intended but to act thus in the face of an enemy to implant suspicion in the mind of my guide or even to make him a confident him an african an individual of a nation the most perfidious one of the subjects of the king of spain the most devoted to his service this could never enter my head to send him back was by no means a safer plan on the contrary i treated him with great kindness i therefore resolutely entered the city but i deemed it right to play the same part i had done in the last village how little i knew of the spaniards they are by no means so vigilant or active they never inquired for my portmanteau nor subjected me to the least scrutiny i alighted at an inn in the suburbs where i fell suddenly ill i laid me down to rest and had a soup made ready for me i slept till two o'clock and arose radically cured after eating an indifferent soup made with excellent mutton i paid my reckoning and inquiring for the residence of the alcalde mayor i pretended to direct my steps toward it and traversed the whole length of the city without meeting any other than indians or negroes the city of cordoba may be a thousand fathoms square although an ancient town the lots are still at least the greater part of them gardens excepted in the centre of the city where is a large square equal in size to the palace vendome at paris with three sides of gothic or moorish arcades ornamented with a tasty fountain which jets forth a prodigious volume of exquisite water the fourth side is occupied by the great church the streets are paved broad and rectilinear three-fourths of the houses are of stone but the inhabitants are poor whenever nature is peculiarly bounteous to man there is man constantly least attentive to nature accustomed to her boons he contracts a listless lazy habit which prevents him from laying up store against her vicissitudes the city is built on a raised plain formed by a long hill between two valleys each of them bounded by lofty mountains which form the pass into mexico the opening between the mountains may be about a league wide but nowhere is such rich and beauteous vegetation apparent nowhere a field for culture which could be so luxuriantly repaid as on this long plain the soil here is a red loam from ten to fifteen feet deep in the gardens cherry trees apples peaches and apricots are intermingled with sapotillas and orange trees thus combining the fruits of both hemispheres in the hedges are elders and ash trees with a sort of arborescent convolvulus the seed of which i could not procure 
and a second kind of this plant with bell-shaped flowers which eight inches in length by a breadth of three are pendant the margin terminating in long laciniae the quantity of rain that fell at noon was considerable and the road was very slippery still in order to avoid all interrogations i determined on setting off the most difficult point was to find the road to orizaba seven leagues distant i followed one at all risk till i reached the extremity of the suburbs where i met some indians who put me on the right way from which i had deviated about a hundred steps after an hour's travelling it began to rain at this instant i met a train of more than two hundred mules their loading having been deposited under tents and as for the mules themselves they remained quietly feeding in the high road which is constantly a space two hundred yards broad covered with turf of perpetual growth but without any ruts or tracks of carriages as there are none used in the whole distance between vera cruz and tehuacan i was obliged to enter an indian cabin where i drank a glass of pineapple water a beverage if well made equally pleasant with lemonade for this i paid a real and the rain ceasing resumed my journey two leagues thence i descended a deep ravine in which i perceived a very solid stone building without any roof and long deserted but whether it had been a citadel a temple or a private house i was unable to ascertain owing to the trees and herbage with which it was covered and which concealed the plan of it i merely remarked that the walls still twenty feet high were three feet in thickness the windows resembled those of our ancient churches but of what utility a church in this position where not the smallest vestige of a village could be seen it is therefore more probable it was originally some fort intended to defend a bridge over a small but very rapid river which runs by its walls still for this purpose the site could not have been worse chosen for by ascending or descending the river the fort could easily have been avoided and it is moreover commanded by the summit of the hill on the slope of which it is constructed a few paces distant are seven or eight huts near another river which like this has its course from the northwest in the ravine in which it runs were some elders and ash trees of singular beauty a league beyond on the left and at a hundred paces from the high road i saw four mexican monuments forming a quadrangle each consisted of a pyramid about twelve yards high with a base of twenty the soil here was excellent yet notwithstanding destitute of cultivation if a little tobacco be accepted as for the pastures they were so exuberantly clothed that on a plot of about a square league i counted no less than eleven flocks of sheep each consisting of six hundred night was now drawing on when fortunately i met an indian whose directions preserved me in the right road to orizaba thanks to the rain and the shades of night i was not stopped either at the garita of the city or at another which i passed on an eminence near the ravine i was much fatigued with a march of eight leagues through the rain and over a bad road i entered three inns in succession but could meet with refuge in neither their hosts objecting to receive me and recommending me as a stranger to the casa real a kind of hospice for travellers the name of which however respectable was repugnant to my feelings so much does ignorance at times give formidable shape to names at length i entered a fourth inn called la casa grande the front of it was a grocer's shop within was a vast court surrounded by arcades which served as a corridor from top to bottom and four sides of a building the casero introduced me at first into a room bestrewed with the dung of poultry which roosted in it i looked at him indignantly with my stick raised and ready to strike him in case of his not showing me some other apartment 
it is fit i should remark that no respectable tradesman nor any one in easy circumstances vouchsafes to keep an inn inns are consequently let at so much per day to a casero a description of men regarded in a meaner light than our footmen and who may be roughly treated with impunity though less filthy the chamber he gave me was nowise better furnished a bed frame of bamboo a table a wretched seat with one of its legs rotten a doorway similar to that of a citadel and the rusty hinges of which would not admit its closing such was the lodging i had to share with a posse of flapping bats for supper i had four eggs a dish of stewed beans two spanish radishes and half a dozen lettuce leaves as for bread and wine i was obliged to seek them myself at the shop such an expenditure made me considered of consequence and for two reals i obtained a mattress my supper cost me four at dawn next day i pondered on the means of learning distinctly the route and distance to oaxaca after long meditation i entered a convent of carmelites where i begged to speak with the prior i was no doubt thought to assume above my sphere in such a request and the sub-prior came to me judging from his round and jolly countenance i deemed him a person in whom i might confide i therefore told him as in secret that being a physician and botanist my occupation was the study of natural history and plants that for three years i had been on my travels in view of perfecting myself in this branch of science that during a tempest i had made a vow to go on foot to nuestra senora de la soledad in oaxaca which till now i had faithfully executed but that feeling myself exhausted with fatigue and pressed for time in order to return for embarkation i was solicitous of learning whether such a favorable interpretation of my vow could be admitted as would allow my completing the residue of my pilgrimage on horseback in presenting as was but reasonable for the indulgence of deviating from the letter of my vow certain pious offerings and alms after a learned discussion on this point my carmelite was of opinion that i certainly might by means of prayers and alms acquit myself towards our lady of the solitude taking him at his words i drew from my purse for medios de oro gold coins and begged of him to take upon himself the offering i wished to make this he refused affirming the sum to be thrice too large in vain did i insist i could not prevail on him to accept anything which not a little disconcerted me as i hoped by dint of bribery to obtain from him the information which i needed nevertheless i did not lose all hope from the civility he showed me he even presented me to four other fathers showed me the house the garden and was in raptures at the description i afforded him of different plants of which the community was wholly ignorant at length i was on the point of losing my sub prior when i bethought of inquiring whether there was not a convent of carmelites at oaxaca and how far the city might be distant this time my good monk fell into the snare anxious to appear well informed on what i inquired he afforded me an itinerary so minutely detailed league by league and village after village that the general of an army might have trusted to it for the plan of a march as i had full means afterwards of ascertaining highly charmed after a route of forty leagues in which i had as it were been obliged to feel my way at meeting with a perfect and unsuspected guide i was preparing to take my leave when the brethren obligingly pressed me to take a survey of the upper apartments of their house hence it was that i could but admire the delightful situation of orizaba this city is about three thousand yards long by a thousand in breadth the streets spacious clean and well paved excellent water 
pure as crystal, is found in every quarter. But the cool preceding thence gives such a spurt of vegetation that spite of every precaution, the pavement is overspread with herbage, nay, even the houses, though of stone, are covered with moss, evergreens, and ferns of every species. Its population is 3,000 whites and 1,500 Negroes or Indians. Its manufactures consist of some tanneries and coarse cloths. This is the entrepot for the traffic between Veracruz and the cold countries. Here the caravans of mules are wont to rest and sojourn a while, and here the clerks of different houses fix their prices on the articles brought from the interior and from Europe. The city stands in a valley a league wide. The country about enjoys the advantage of yielding the fruits of Europe by the side of those of America. The air is mild yet lively and the temperature enchanting. At nine in the morning the thermometer of Bourbon denotes twelve degrees above the freezing point. The city is surrounded by insulated mountains which leave between them so many little gorges or openings. The summits of these mountains present the effect of a palisade of pyramids covered with forests of the liveliest verdure, delighting while they ease the eye. Their angular points resemble so many pines, while above them, proudly eminent, rises the volcano of Orizaba, clad in perpetual snow, and presenting at once, in conjunction with the minor mountains, the singular contrast of boreal winter with the summer's grateful garb. Let the reader figure to himself an immense sugar loaf, its apex obliquely truncated towards the city, and evincing a proof that, when it burnt, the ignited eruption rolled towards the plain of Veracruz, and he will have the image of the volcano of Orizaba. The fact of the eruption of the lava in the direction assumed is confirmed by the pumices found by me on the very margin of the Gulf of Mexico in the neighborhood of Veracruz, a fact the more surprising when it is considered the distance is not less than five and thirty leagues from the city of Orizaba, a city which assuredly was not founded previous to the extinction of the volcano, which seems even now to threaten the city. When in the morning the plain was still enveloped with the darkness of night, I saw, and with sentiments of admiration and delight, the towering summit of this lofty mountain, shining like silver, but silver gilt with the saffron beam of day. The convent of the Carmelites, built with a magnificence truly barbarous, possesses in its massive structure somewhat noble and striking, Internally, it is lively, very clean, and kept in excellent order. Paintings in the most extravagant style are lavished on every part, but their bright coloring pleases the eye. The church, as usual, is gilt in ridiculous profusion. But in the sanctuary, worthy of remark, is a very extraordinary picture representing the Assumption of the Virgin. Mary is seen still prostrate, but in a superb chariot with six wheels, two bishops, dressed in copes and mitres, hold the knaves of the wheels in one hand, and a flambeau torch in the other. Six others are mounted behind on the footman's stand. The trainers are twelve cherubims with blue wings, and in Roman dress, a helmet on the head with feathers, and their hair floating in the manner of dancers in a serious opera and they are harnessed to the car, with traces like our cannoneers to the gun. Elias, on the box, with a lily in his hand, held like a whip, acts as a coachman, and his disciple, Elijah, on horseback as a postillion. After having thus surveyed the whole of the convent of the Carmelites, I departed loaded with civility, when in the middle of the street a new incident, which I had not foreseen, disturbed me an instant. I knew every stage on my road by heart, and all but the most essential matter, the gate by which I had to leave the city. I ventured to inquire, 
and a rogue of a shopkeeper directed me opposite to the right i had in consequence to retrace my steps and on return met my gentleman who merely laughed at me but a frowning brow and an angry look i darted upon him changed his countenance and made him pale as death i at length passed the right gate into the road over a bridge that crossed a small river which bathes the exterior of the city a very large street which serves as a suburb led me to the barrier at the foot of another bridge this pass was guarded by customs officers one of them inquired whither i was going i told him to collect plants and that i lodged at the carmelite convent from which i was shortly about to go to vera cruz in turn i put many questions to him and the fellow conceived himself highly honored at having in his power to give information to a foreign physician so learned as myself the chief of the officers then took me aside into a room well furnished with spears pistols and swords and now thought i to myself you are caged i was however quit for a moment's dread and a sight but little agreeable indeed though without danger the spectacle displayed was the consequence of a malady said to have originated in the country where i was and with which our chief was dreadfully affected i prescribed to him a mode of treatment after which dying with impatience to resume my journey i left him in spite of all his offers of service and his invitation to take chocolate i left orizaba satisfied with having some claim of service from a man whom i should else have reason to fear on my return i marched on in high spirits and mended my pace in view of gaining the mountain before me and even of climbing it if possible to enjoy the beautiful prospect i promised myself from its summit but when i had travelled about four leagues i found myself tired and in need of nourishment i resolved on entering an indian cottage on the road where i was well received and treated with bread and eggs all that can well be expected from this wretched class of men but what struck and charmed me far beyond my meal was the perfect beauty of the mistress of the cottage i looked for faultiness in her but almost naked as she was having nothing on but a furbelowed muslin petticoat trimmed with rose-colored cord and a shift which left her shoulders bare the nicest scrutiny discovered no defect her whole figure emulating in symmetry the regularity of her features i told her she was very handsome it seemed to please her and the two old women who were present the one her mother and the other her aunt laughed heartily on the occasion i put many questions to her and learnt she was married and had children these circumstances but rendered her the more interesting and her charms had even a disorderly effect on my senses i ventured to draw forth a piece of gold but recollecting myself wretch said i what wouldst thou is such the object of thy toil in a foreign country friendless and without support environed by myriads of dangers still ever springing beneath your feet wouldst thou lose thyself wouldst yield to the enervations of voluptuousness madman away with these self-reproofs i left the cottage without speaking a word or daring to take another glance and dragged myself sighing along when i had journeyed half a league i found myself better a thousand different ideas came to my assistance and consolation and i found myself quite refreshed proving what is said by la bruyere that nothing more enlivens the spirits than the reflection of avoiding a folly despite of the bad roads i journeyed on a league and a half and found myself opposite to acutzingo where the dedication of a belfry was celebrating i did not choose to stop for i could have halted only at the casa real and i had imbibed such a dread of lodging of this kind that i had no inclination for experiment 
i must observe that in every village the casa real is the court in which the alcalde sits and justice is administered when not appropriated to this august purpose the casa real is only a wretched caravansary or rather penthouse in which travellers obtain shelter gratis commonly the whole furniture consists of two or three frames of bamboo for beds a table a seat and a hemisphere of crescentia a calabash which serves at once for pail for piss-pot and to drink from an indian is kept in guard of these precious articles and to wait on travellers that is to say to fetch them whatever eatable can be found in the village for their money this guardian is denominated a casero he is also a cook but his whole knowledge of cookery is confined to boiling an egg hard and burning a chicken i travelled on and came to about fifty indian huts built on the roadside wavering in opinion whether or no i should stop here or attempt to climb the mountain at the risk of being caught in the rain i remained some time irresolute at length fatigue the dread of losing my way and the more weighty dread of being thoroughly soaked determined me though it was yet broad daylight to enter the last of the indian huts which i saw on the road it was built like the cabins of the charcoal makers in the woods of france but so low as prevented one standing upright i found here a female indian and a little girl busily employed in making tortillas they received me without ceremony but yet with respect they did not comprehend a single word of spanish nor i the least of the mexican tongue so that our conversation was necessarily by signs the mother presented me a tortilla which i took and ate but with no appetite giving her in return a real i presented the little girl a packet of pins which she accepted and found mighty curious immediately another tortilla was served up covered with an egg and chili the latter dish i found excellent and paid for with another real i saw they were preparing me still others but i made them signs to desist tortillas have before been noticed they form the chief food of the indians as for chili it is a mexican sauce made of pimento and tomatoes or love apples pounded together in a mortar and mixed with salt and water it is the common sauce and indifferently for bread meat and fish and is the most delicate ragout known to these worthy people those who are in easy circumstances always keep it by them to eat their tortillas with which are without it insipid the indian when he has no tomato knowing without doubt the affinity between them and nightshade and physalis or the winter cherry ground cherry or tomatillo substitutes alcaquenji or the winter cherry as i frequently remarked on my way a circumstance which puts me on guard in eating this sauce night coming on the father of the family arrived with five children the oldest about fifteen three others one of which was at the breast had remained at home thus in all eight children the father mother and myself were collected under a little roof of shingle in a hut but fifteen feet square the poor indian tired with labor and half starved presented a mild and benignant physiognomy he showed me some little attention but overflowing with affection he smothered his children with kisses while the tenderest love beamed in his looks which were constantly directed to his wife save when from courtesy they were turned to me he spoke a few words of spanish but our conversation was little a profound silence reigned during the whole repast served up consisting of tortillas and chili it was the stillness of delight interrupted at intervals by the tones of a language sweet and short and by sounds which resembled the melodious notes of the bullfinch thus joy tenderness and repose awaited the worthy indian as compensations for his daily toil he gained by his work but two reals i gave him in addition two but profit seemed to interest him little 
avarice finds rarely entrance in the heart of the child of nature awake to the feelings of a husband and a father end of section nine section ten of travels to oaxaca by nicholas joseph thierry de menonville an anonymous translation from the french this librivox recording is in the public domain i laid down to rest my heart full of this scene and adverting in thought to that at my dinner such said i such are the hearts in which you would have plunged ten thousand daggers by the seduction of a wife the joy and only solace of her partner to these reflections a thousand insects joined their troublesome hum to drive away repose i laid stretched on two bad sheepskins but the night was cold and i had no covering the rain even penetrated our slender roof as therefore i could not sleep i rose and left these good people in silence but deeply affected with what i had observed the evening before i noticed near their house a bath of a rather curious construction it was a little house eight feet long and six broad with walls two feet in height its roof shaped like ours covered with ridge tiles overtopped a wall built of brick and resembling that of an oven the floor also was paved with brick it was raised near a fountain or rivulet and beneath its level within the building a fire is kindled as in an oven to heat it the fire is afterwards withdrawn and the streamlet suffered to enter after a few minutes the invalid about to avail himself of the bath is placed in it feet downwards with no means of breathing but by the door which is about eighteen inches square this remedy is rarely used and only in desperate cases as i was enabled to gather from the broken sentences and gestures of the indian of stoves similar to this i met with several on my way i have observed that on quitting the plain the road lays through a gorge which begins at la punta this gorge is bounded on the southwest by Acutzingo and suddenly by an appendage of the volcano of orizaba which forms as it were a kernel or outcropping that unites the frame of the two ranges of mountains which form the gorge in which the cities of cordoba and orizaba are situate this kernel or outcropping it was necessary i should pass to enter into tehuacan i had observed it attentively the day before and noticed the road traced on its reverse however high and steep the mountain this road which is very well planned and paved in certain parts would be far less laborious to traverse were due care taken to repair the injuries to which it is subjected from springs precipitated from the top of the rocks in a thousand singularly curious cascades and from the torrents which during heavy rains bear everything before them i was on this road by two in the morning the atmosphere was replete with moisture owing to the night dew and a thick fog which covered the mountain the cold in consequence was so benumbing that i could scarcely move my fingers i ascended rapidly and by daybreak was on the ridge of the mountain i saw there a number of oaks similar to those of the plain the savin juniper and shrubs which i took to be myrtles but which the obscurity prevented my ascertaining i was pleasing myself with a magnificent prospect i should enjoy the ease with which i should contemplate the volcano and the bird's eye view i should have of the gorge i had quitted and the plain i had to enter on the rising of day as i ascended the mountain but my expectations were frustrated by the fog which did not disperse the whole day long i saw on my way two dealers in poultry and further on two caravans of mules feeding around their encampment scarcely had i gained the summit before i had to descend for the crest of the mountain is barely ten fathoms broad 
I now tripped lightly down, satisfied within myself I had nothing further to apprehend, and as much at my ease as if a thousand leagues from those whom my fears represented in pursuit of me. I fancied myself in quite another country, and in fact nature presented a volume perfectly new to my delighted eyes, and treated them with a most superb display of plants of various genre. Here the geranium, there a species of heliotrope of a very curious species, no seeds of which unfortunately were ripe. Beyond these, mistletoes, cradiscantia of very singular kinds, a species of medlar, yuccas thirty feet high, and finally, at the bottom of the mountain, maguey, a plant which became the most predominant. The gorge I traversed now presented a road of beautiful turf, and now a soft and even sand. At seven in the morning I discovered a village, the huts and houses of which, divided from each other by long intervals, gave me an idea of what the Spaniards call a pueblo. It was Chapulco, divided into a rectory and currency, and about a league in length. This spot may be reckoned the vineyard of the country, but what a vineyard! A valley extending three leagues by half a league in breadth is enclosed by mountains, covered with some cacti, but chiefly with the agave americana, or aloes. This plant, which is indigenous, in addition, is here cultivated and multiplied ad infinitum by the Indians. Its leaves, three or four feet in length by a foot and a half broad, serve the inhabitants in lieu of tiles, and some cottages I have seen were very skillfully covered with them. The plant yields a beverage esteemed by this people delicious, but of which the mere appearance was sufficient to excite disgust in me. It is of a whitish color, thick, constantly turbid, and unsusceptible of clarification. The following is the manner in which it is extracted. Previous to the aloes shooting forth its spear, the Indian, after cutting away some of the leaves in order to form a passage, on arriving at the heart of the plant, tap it to the pith in nearly the same manner as an artichoke. He removes the crown of upper leaves, enclosed the one within the other, and after hollowing in the stem of the plant a cavity capable of containing two or three quarts, he places the crown on again and leaves it. In the course of the day and the following night, the sap of the plant exudes from every part of the young leaves cut off with the crown and falls into the well below. This, the next day, great care is taken in emptying and this process is repeated until the plant becomes exhausted when it perishes. It is then hewn down and renewed by the pipings, basal shoots, it generally bears. This species of aloes is sometimes so large as to measure fifteen feet in diameter. It throws out its leaves like the spheres of chevaux de frise, a medieval cavalry barricade, but of far more solid structure. It occupies all the backs of the hills of Chapulco, a chalky and stony soil. The bottom is sown with barley and other corn. The morn of Port au Prince grows many of this species of aloes. This forms one of the chief objects of culture at Chapulco, which furnishes the consumption of a circuit of 18 leagues radius. There are Indians who have constantly forty of these wells, which I could safely wager they empty every day. I am ignorant at what price this beverage is sold, but it is in great request, and I have seen it on its way in skins to every quarter round about. I had traveled six long leagues without eating, after a very indifferent night, and but a bad supper the evening before. It was no wise astonishing, therefore, that I felt hungry. I inquired of the first Indian I met where the tienda was, the eating house, but neither he nor several others I met with in succession understood me. At last I ventured to enter a hut, 
where i found two women and a young man i made signs to them by pointing to some eggs that i wanted food they brought me half a dozen which i caused to be roasted in their shell and devoured with four tortillas i afterwards for beverage made a kind of lemonade and might have been content with this meal but seeing my sly indian had a fowl in the pot over the fire well seasoned i without ceremony asked him for a part he gave me first one wing then another and afterwards a leg these i ate entirely to the great astonishment of the bystanders who thought me no doubt but ill-equipped in purse for such an appetite to dismiss their suspicions i took four reals from my purse which they received with pleasure and would have made me the remainder of the fowl but this i refused as i did also a beverage made from the maguey and called by them pulque as the whitish troubled and dirty appearance of it inspired me with disgust i afterwards laid me down for an hour to rest in this little hut constructed in the same manner as the huts of our soldiers and but ten feet long but so clean with everything in so much order that nothing can be imagined more so these good people were simplicity personified their language different from that of the indians of aculzingo is singular and little but clucking the only sounds distinguishable are the multitude of ilias and mute ease the man who comprehended and spoke a few spanish words inquired of me how far it was from there to castile i answered two thousand leagues but here i spoke beyond his understanding he readily conceived the numbers ten twenty nay a hundred but beyond this number his ideas did not extend he admired the knot knurl of my cane and its handle my watch and snuff-box observing them with the most innocent curiosity but without desire or anxiety to possess them at nine in the morning finding myself sufficiently refreshed i left my kind hosts a cooling breeze a cloudy sky everything promised me a pleasant journey and i determined on sleeping beyond tehuacan scarcely had i gone a hundred steps before i was accosted by an indian who inquired of me whither i was going i answered oaxaca upon this he offered me horses but as he had a beggarly and idiotish appearance i paid no attention to what he said he continued obstinately to follow me and stopping me at the end of a street he showed me a horse held by a young man his pursuing me engendered suspicion i took him for a thief or at best a spy and treated him in such manner as induced him to go his ways i have since learnt that my suspicions of him were groundless and that he was only one of those people called topis whose office it is to seek horses for travellers and serve them as guides still i was not sorry on learning this that i had not taken advantage of his proffer for he would most assuredly have conducted me on horseback in broad day through the streets of tehuacan a risk would have made me die ten thousand deaths with fear on leaving the pueblo i saw a number of pretty rabbits by no means wild several birds of charming plumage and the arbol peruano which yields a species of pepper after three leagues through beautiful valleys in which the harvest had been reaped some days before and where already the husbandman was employed in sowing again i discovered from an eminence the plain of tehuacan hitherto i had only travelled through the gorge leading to it the scene which afterwards struck me was singularly delightful but the pleasure it occasioned was lessened by the revival of my cursed fears at the sight of a country so well peopled and the reflection that i must necessarily travel through so large a city as tehuacan which i painted to myself swarming with court de guard 
alcaldes and aguaciles of every description as it was too early to wait till nightfall i bethought myself of the expedient of rounding the town without entering it in consequence i continued my way at a quick rate but not so quick as to be blind to the beautiful prospects around from the extremity of the gorge i had just traversed on reaching the slope of the hill is seen the vast and superb plain of tehuacan its breadth is six leagues and it extends in a southeast and northwest direction some twenty leagues beyond jalapa between two chains of mountains which bound it east and west and separate the province of tehuacan from that of mexico proper the river of tehuacan and generally speaking all the waters run in the same direction for the space of fifteen leagues toward the south the eye embraces with delight in a country covered with eternal verdure intersected by innumerable rivers and checkered with five or six cities and villages and pueblos and habitations without number this fine country however minutely examined does not appear to be naturally so fertile as a view of its whole announces the plain properly so called is indeed very productive and yields every grain peculiar to europe but the soil is of a grayish color abounds in clay and requires in order to render it fit for sowing a long continued inundation and when the growing crops appear to suffer from drought it is again watered by means of sluices contrived at its different falls with much ingenuity and care in the banks of the river of tehuacan this is one of the best managed regulations i had hitherto observed in the whole country and doubtless the population were taught in its institution by necessity for the only compost necessary for the soil is water and here it is distributed to all the different farms in the same manner as it is to the sugar plantations of santo domingo the lands are tilled with the plough and they yield two crops annually the one in may the other in september corn does not rise to the same height as in the boos in france but the straw stands thick and the ear is well filled it is trampled on by ten or a score of horses in an area in front of the barns to get out the grain and the straw sells at a very high rate judging by the work sheds i saw the lands appear to be divided into large estates but as there are no slaves in this country and as the small number of negroes here are free and commonly hire themselves out at four piastres per month every process of cultivation necessitates the employment on the part of the proprietor of other hands in addition to those regularly kept in his service to obtain these he is obliged to present a request to the alcalde mayor who assigns him the requisite number of indian laborers at two reals per head per day the alcalde of the pueblos conducts them every morning by eight o'clock to the rendezvous always about two hundred yards out of the village where the bailiffs of the farms meet them and point out their work which continues until sunset these bailiffs remain constantly on horseback all day long exposed to the heat of the sun for the purpose of overlooking their laborers the upper part of the plain which comprehends the midway up the mountain sides is susceptible of no species of culture owing to the impossibility of furnishing water as much as from the nature of the soil which consists of little more than an inch of vegetable earth on a bottom of talc here nothing grows in fact but mimosa cacti and certain shrubs which seen at a distance induce a conception of the soil possessing a degree of fertility the summit of the mountains is covered with many kinds of trees oaks pines etc but whichever way the eye is turned it constantly embraces a view of disruptions erosions and chasms among the mountains 
visibly occasioned by violent convulsions for the ground there seems not to be a deposit of waters but entirely free from such accumulations among the innumerable species of cacti that i distinguished was especially the cactus nobilis icosandria monogynia linnaeus mantissa it does not rise more than a foot from the ground and may be ten inches in diameter i remarked twenty other species which i have nowhere seen described and which unfortunately i had no time to form a description of in order to have brought with me all i found worthy of the school of botany i should have needed an additional cart at every twenty leagues i therefore continued my journey sighing to leave behind me so vast a heap of treasures after crossing a division of the river i arrived at the suburbs of tehuacan i saw a trellis covered with grapes yet green what would i not have given for ripe ones there i left the high road for the plain the corn had been just reaped and i noticed that abundance was left behind yet green and growing which proved to me that it does not ripen evenly an observation which i made everywhere along the road i thus avoided the city as far as to the real bed of the river which runs through it at this part it is six yards broad and about three feet deep in order to pass it i was obliged to undress but at the instant i was about to enter it so prodigious a number of turtles which i had not observed plunged into it that i was extremely frightened on seeing them my apprehensions were dismissed these turtles are no larger than the palm of the hand of an oval shape of a dirty mud color not striated nor crenated plated or in any degree resembling others but even backed like land turtles or tortoises the sternum which is all of a piece is joined by an ossification and level with the back except the openings for the paws the head and the tail of the animal the size appears to be regularly as i have stated for though the number i saw was considerable there was no difference unfortunately i drank of the water of this river i say unfortunately for all the night and all the following day my lips felt as if ulcerated i attributed this inconvenience to a rash proceeding from my drinking it when warm and after being weakened by fatigue but on my return the same accident happening and not to me alone but to several others i learnt that such is the common effect of its waters which are briny but which i had not before observed on account of my eagerness and thirst i entered the extremity of a suburb bought some bread there and drank a glass of wine this refreshed me and of refreshment i had urgent need it was now but three in the afternoon and i had already travelled twelve leagues but desirous of not entering the city i resolved to push on to san francisco still five leagues further i then journeyed east south east and the sun enlightening from behind me the beautiful plain i had in front my prospect was exceedingly varied and enlivened the high road in which i travelled is twenty yards broad and bordered with hedges of cisalpinia and mimosa on every side i distinguish nothing but spacious dwellings lands well cultivated or covered with crops which were being gathered such an afternoon would to me have been most delightful had i not been so perfectly tired after three hours walk i resolved on resting but scarcely had i stretched myself on the turf before i felt my tendons stiffen and my muscles swell i rose hastily in order not to catch cold the sun was on the point of setting the summit of the mountains on my left was beginning to be covered with clouds whence lightnings flashed and the noise of thunder proceeded i feared being caught in the rain and to avoid it determined on halting at the very first inn i inquired of a laboring negro where i should meet with one he answered that there was one at san francisco 
about two leagues further, but that I might meet with shelter at a farm, La Hacienda, of Don Joaquin, the armorer of Castile, which he pointed out to me the distance of a quarter of a league from where I stood. I was fearful of straying from the high road during the night from which I had already deviated, and above all I dreaded the rain. I therefore followed the advice of the negro and repaired to the farmyard. The house was well built. I found in the yard a bailiff employed in causing the corn to be gathered in, which had been trodden from the sheafs and fanned in front of the barn. Mistaking him for the owner, I explained to him my embarrassment and claimed his hospitality, offering at the same time to pay for what I might have. He received me with politeness and informed me he was not the master but if i could wait till he had completed the business which engrossed his attention he would have the pleasure of introducing me to him i consented to wait his leisure and entered the barn where i stretched myself on some trusses of straw there i gave myself up to the reflections suggested by circumstances here said i is corn trusses of straw a barn here is the same mode of culture as in france but what a difference does locality make in sentiments there with what pleasure should i contemplate their labors always mingled with innocent pastimes there with security might i give myself up to the contemplation of nature should i change my sight it would ever be at pleasure and with certainty at a trifle of expense of satisfying all my wants here in the same manner as a malefactor a smuggler it is requisite i should wear disguise that i should dissimulate in order to procure for my fellow citizens the enjoyment of a benefit which nature herself designed no less for them than this jealous nation from which it must be stolen i find myself at length obliged to beg for shelter and subsistence to be indebted to men who, not knowing me, perhaps may treat me with contumely. These ideas, undoubtedly, a presage of what was about to happen, were interrupted by the arrival of the bailiff. He conducted me instantly into the hall of the house, which, properly speaking, was no other than a penthouse, while he went to speak to his master. I saw myself immediately surrounded by a crowd of negroes and Indian servants, some in livery, others in cloaks. I felt cold, approached a stove where chocolate was boiling, and seated myself on the ground, my back to the fire, and wholly indifferent to the stupid admiration and the brutal laughs of the servants' hall. At length, after half an hour had passed, the bailiff made his appearance. He brought the answer of his patron who was willing to allow me shelter, but excused himself from seeing me. Indignant at such behavior, I immediately decided on my reply. I told the bailiff that I thanked his patron, but not being of a quality to bear with indignity, nor accustomed to such uncivil treatment, I would neither sleep under his roof, nor owe the slenderest obligation to a man whose vanity felt a shock at receiving me in person, and raising my voice at the instant, and pulling from my pocket a purse of gold, I took out a piaster, and showing it to the servants, exclaimed, Who will earn this by showing me the way to San Francisco? Twenty voices answered, I, and I was only embarrassed respecting choice. I fixed on a strong and hearty negro of good physiognomy, and took my leave of the bailiff, whom I left confused at the insult I had received. It seemed to me even that this imitation of Spanish pride was not displeasing to the whole troop of servants, and that one and all they blamed the conduct of their master. It will readily be gathered that my offended pride caused me to make this hasty determination, and I must confess that this weighed strong with me, but at the same time it occurred to me that a man who could act in this ignominious manner might be capable of still greater baseness and perfidy 
hence in my resolve a portion of prudence was mingled when i left this unwelcome abode i breathed with greater freedom and as if i had just escaped from some impending danger and whether the result of my indignation whether of the rest i had taken i felt myself reanimated and in a short time reached san francisco but not without a lowering atmosphere which threatened rain then i entered the dwelling of a tradesman as indifferent and easy as most of his countrymen i found in the house nothing to eat save eggs and peas but at the same time some tolerable wine and above all valuable two mattresses of which i availed myself with the more willingness from its being the first time since my departure that i had found so comfortable a lodging i undressed myself and after well barricading the doors of my room slept peacefully End of section 10. Section 11 of Travels to Oaxaca by Nicholas Joseph Thierry de Menonville, an anonymous translation from the French. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The next day I left my host at four in the morning, after paying him six reals, with which he appeared satisfied he informed me that at san antonio two leagues further i should find horses and instructed me how to procure them i travelled along sprightly as the lark the morning cool and refreshing and the road good as on the preceding day before i arrived at san antonio i had to traverse the river tehuacan which at this spot is ninety yards broad its bed twelve yards deep it was now however nearly dry owing to the drainage of the sluices for watering the fields i conjectured from the enormous depth of the bed of this river through a space of five leagues from tehuacan that its swells must be frightful and attributed them to the torrents of the mountains of the northeast in which precipices are frequent whereas in those of the northwest there are none to be seen thus affording a conclusive proof that the heaviest rains throughout the gorge are brought by the winds from the west by then i reached san antonio it was six in the morning this is a vast pueblo of indians extending from one side of the river the space of a league to the first rise of hills which precede the mountains there is but little land in culture the objects attended to are pimento french beans etc the streets are large and covered with a mimosa exceedingly gummy and of which the bark of whatever age the tree is constantly of a bright green i forwarded some seeds of it to the king's garden i took my dinner at the house of the spaniard who keeps the shop at the same time the inn of the hamlet he was a good kind of man he sent for topas for me for horses there was but one mule to be had and while it was got ready i visited the church in the neighborhood it was adorned as much as possible after the spanish manner but before all the saints i noticed bouquets formed of lily flowers white and scarlet in very pleasing clusters I requested the vestry keeper in vain to furnish me with some of its bulbs. He could not comprehend what I asked of him, and I had no leisure to extend my researches the length of seeking for the roots of them. What, however, afforded me the most delight, because it depicted naturally the simple manners of the inhabitants, was the sight of two candelabras of a singular description one on each side of the chief altar these were so many plantain trees which in the shade of the church had risen to the height of thirty feet and nearly touched the roof and why thought i should these simple these natural gifts of heaven seem a less suitable decoration to the temples of the eternal than those vases of gold and silver displayed with such ostentation on his altars must not the sight of these plantains 
so valuable in their productions to man impress more feelingly than those rich metals the benevolence and power of the creator of all on leaving the church i bestrode my mule which was an excellent one and five hours brought me to san sebastiano seven leagues from san antonio the hire was seven reals for the master and two for the topeth or guide who ran before me however great the heat i yet could not refrain from alighting three or four times to collect some pieces of talc so beautiful and so brilliant as at first to be mistaken for native silver or at least the most splendid mother of pearl the whole country was richly cultivated in corn the plants i saw as throughout the whole of the plain are very various the borders of streams yield a species of begonia with yellow flowers and leaves resembling those of the ash bearing a similitude to the begonia stands except in being merely a shrub where the other is a tree which rises to the height of from sixty to one hundred feet the hedges are covered with the passion flower the fruit of which small as cherries are of the same color finally in these trees which bearing plums of a yellow color and tolerably pleasant mimic in appearance so well the pear tree that one might with ease be deceived but above all are remarkable the erect cacti everywhere seen half way up the hill a prodigious size and a great ornament to the landscape cacti of eight or ten different species their common height from thirty to forty feet on a trunk or stem rising from fifteen to sixteen feet and five or six in circumference from this trunk issue vertical branches which give origin to other similar the one supporting the other and dividing like the branches of a chandelier in such manner that the collective stock sometimes occupies a circular space in the air of from forty to fifty feet in diameter and represents a kind of chandelier of a sea-green color and of singular beauty all the branches as well as the main stem are furnished at about ten or fifteen thumbs breadth apart with a fascicle covering the space of an inch and comprising about eight or ten thorns stronger and thicker than the largest needles the fruit similar to that of the opuntia or prickly pear is like that defended externally with thorns in order to eat of it for its taste is pleasant it is necessary to wait till it opens and the pulp of a crimson color falls the indians then extract the pulp with a spoon fastened to a long pole if the birds should not be beforehand with them a vast number of birds build their nests among the branches after the manner of our magpies nothing is more dangerous than the fall of the leaves of these trees these leaves are beams twenty feet long by one broad covered with thorns and would infallibly kill the unfortunate traveller who should happen to be beneath them but as they never fall except on occasion of violent storms or when rotten it is easy to be prepared this singular tree is more common than any other in this gorge throughout a space of thirty leagues the pitaya one of the species of cactus is commonly of minor size its fruit is not covered with thorns but scales which are the leaves of the cup of the flower it is truly a delicious fruit and a vast variety of flavor it is acidulous and has a fragrant taste like raspberries which gives it a great superiority over the other species that have no poignancy within it is of a purple color without brown and its size is that of a small hen's egg in order to gather it the indians make use of a long pole to the end of which is fastened a basket of twisted branches of an oval shape 
open at the sides, closed only at the bottom, and the top covered with two crossbars. They elevate the pole and entangle the fruit in the bars. When the slightest motion disengages it from the tree, it falls into the basket and is emptied into another. This, indeed, is the only method that can be adopted to obtain the fruit, for neither man nor beast can climb the tree. Throughout the whole country, the Indian lives on the fruit of this tree. Even the young branches, when yet but half a foot long, and while the thorns are yet soft, are cooked. He makes ragouts of the buds and of the flowers before they are open, for the seeds, which are black, and covered with a hard skin, he dries them, lays them in store, and pounds them to make him bread. At Oaxaca I saw in the market leaves of a kind of opuntia, which, long, narrow, and slender, are boiled and eaten like asparagus, with butter, oil, or lard. Thus the prudent and frugal inhabitant of these parts, complying without murmur or difficulty, with the laws of nature, draws from the native productions his means of subsistence, while the capricious European, not satisfied with the precious boons of Ceres and Pomona, or the animals which he has succeeded in naturalizing in the country, is yet anxious at an enormous expense for those fruits and viands with which nature here refuses to pamper his insatiable and gluttonous appetite the pueblo of san sebastiano is pleasantly situate it is in particular thickly planted with trees and in the midst is a public square and a casa real for the first time i ventured to alight at this formidable hotel which had been represented to me in such an unfavorable light i called immediately for horses the alcalde who was an indian happened to be intoxicated the casero more sober showed me a schedule in the house on which the charge of travelling on every road was noted as established by royal authority it is commonly a shilling a league for each beast of burden to the topeth one two and sometimes three shillings are given the roads here are excellent and connect the neighbouring cities and hamlets I met here neither with wine nor bread. Fortunately, I had brought some bread with me from San Antonio, which I ate with some eggs, but for drink I was fain to content myself with water. In getting supplied with horses I had no such difficulty, for the providers of them went to loggerheads for who should furnish me. I now set out mounted on a most excellent horse. On leaving this place, the beautiful valley of Tehuacan begins to become narrow and is no more than a league broad. Cultivation is also more spare, the track of fertile land being of less extent. Little is seen but small hills of chalky soil huddled together, clogging the gorge, through which still runs the river of Tehuacan, receiving another stream about a league beyond. Its banks are mostly sowed with corn or maize as far as Los Cues, after which its banks are barren declivities. However, before I reached this village, I saw a sugar plantation, the second only I had seen in culture in all my journey. Here I distinguished canes of monstrous size and height, a mill of wretched structure, molds a foot in height, and loaves of coarse sugar just taken from the pans. In fine, a few negroes who appeared to work very leisurely. Sugar works must necessarily be very expensive in this country. As for hard and laborious works, negroes are indispensable. And as the price of a negro here is from five to six hundred piastres. Indians who can be hired only for a month or forty days, sufficient time for other objects of culture, would not be adaptable to this, as owing to the continual change, they would not have time to learn their business, 
and as moreover they could not very often be obtained at those moments when the sugar works most urgently require their assistance i arrived at los Ques about seven in the evening the necessity i was under of perpetually ascending and descending the hills i have mentioned rendered the way tedious and made rest desirable the village of los Ques, seated on a steep rock and covered with a mount which was represented to me to have been at some time a fortress belonging to the indians seemed a pass which might be with ease fortified all that would be requisite for this purpose would be to place a battery on the mount to command the river and road i ascended this mount to see if i could trace any vestige of a wall but the only thing i noticed was the remains of an indian dwelling on going to the casa real i overtook a spaniard of good appearance who was travelling with two horses after exchange of salutation he offered me some pitayas which i ate with much gratification we conversed together for some time he informed me that there were robbers towards atleta whither i was going but that some of them had been taken i learnt from him also that the topas were by birth the alguaciles of the villages and authorized to arrest all thieves but this however they rarely effected being great cowards except when backed by spaniards at los Ques again i was obliged to have recourse to my stock of bread and to be satisfied with water there is not in the village a single inn or rather it contains nothing to be had except the fruit of certain trees with which it is shaded this shade combined with the cool of a rivulet which trickles through the town give it a pleasing appearance that without these recommendations it would fail to possess here also i was obliged to pass the night on a sofa of bamboos but notwithstanding the hardness of my palate my slumber was sound at three in the morning i awakened my topeth and set off for quiotepec after giving my horse a bundle of sacates green stuffs this caution often seemed to me necessary either on account of the avarice of the owners or the knavery of their servants on the road at the crest of a hill which commanded the highway we travelled i perceived some men who seemed as if concealing themselves behind bushes the relation i had of the existence of robbers in this part now occurred to me and i made preparation to defend myself with my knife the only weapon i had but on nearing the spot we saw the supposed thieves were only a poor indian and his son with poles and baskets gathering pitayas as we set off early we reached quiotepec by ten o'clock at three leagues of this side of it the gorge of tehuacan is but a hundred twaffs broad at the village itself it diminishes to the breadth of the rio grande the name of the river of tehuacan here which previously has received the contribution of the other at this place it has a rapid course over very bulky round pebbles which render it highly difficult for a horse to pass when there is any water in the river as the horse unable to fix his feet with any security risks being carried away with the current we were to the girths in water but arrived at the opposite bank without any accident quiotepec built on the back of the northeastern mountain is a pretty considerable hamlet surrounded by a number of cocoa trees cironelier sapotes etc a copious rivulet washes all its streets and diffuses a delightful cool to the mild and tranquil inhabitants for here as in every other part on my journey mildness and tranquillity are the characteristics of the indians generally they are stout and well made the women are tolerably fair and have pleasing nay mostly handsome features i did not see a single individual either distorted in person or marked with the smallpox they do not seem destitute of industry but they neither possess the liberty 
nor means of putting their talents to use still the spanish mob for persons of any knowledge are far from entertaining such an opinion imagine they possess wealth and conceal their treasures and in consequence of this rooted and popular belief they are subject to continual vexations notwithstanding the positive edicts in their favor issued by the sovereign but again how sillily stupid is the obstinate persistence of the people in maintaining so wild a fancy when a person has gold will he not purchase with it the first objects of necessity will he not seek for more to multiply his means of enjoyment and to possess some property which he may transmit to his children such is the constant bias of the human mind cupidity indeed may induce a miser who prefers to the pleasure of enjoying and diffusing the means of happiness the base and disgraceful employ of hoarding cupidity i say may induce such a being to hide his wealth and he may succeed in concealing it from every eye but to suppose a whole people would subject themselves to a thousand privations while in possession of treasures which would afford them every enjoyment that they should yet roll in wealth where not the slightest trace of it is visible and where so many watchful eyes interested in detecting such a fact have never been successful however well they might be disposed to deceive their cruel oppressors this is a charge against them which never can be admitted by what happened to me at Kiotepec, a judgment may be formed of the extreme poverty of the inhabitants of that pueblo on my arrival i asked for horses which were immediately brought but when about to pay in advance as is usual i found i had no silver upon this i presented a medio de oro but neither the master of the horses nor any one in the village could give me change for it much embarrassed i repaired to the alcalde a very civil indian as all are to whom the spaniards entrust this charge and entreated him to give me small coin for my gold which i showed him but he protested por dios por la madre de dios por todos los santos that he could not he even prostrated himself at my feet and implored me to believe him his astonishment and that exhibited by his whole family at the sight of the medio de oro convinced me still more than his words will spaniards presume to say all this was a farce for my part i cannot think so and i testified my opinion by raising the good indian from the ground i begged of him moreover seeing how impossible it was i could manage otherwise for want of money to order the topeth to conduct me to quicatlan where undoubtedly i should obtain change and would pay him he agreed in the reasonableness of my request and as the fundamental laws of the country expressly enjoin him to give all aid and protection to travellers he accompanied me to the casa real and in a dignified tone of which i did not imagine him capable ordered the topeth to proceed with me to quicatlan i departed therefore at eleven in the morning after taking some refreshments it was necessary in order to pass the mountain at the foot of which quiotepec is situate to ascend by a path only two feet broad cut in the side of the rock let the reader figure to himself two hundred steps of this tremendous staircase from each of which a precipice was visible below six hundred yards deep in which with horrid crash rio grande forced its way and then conceived the dread which froze my faculties i trembled in every limb my head turned dizzy and i was obliged to alight and lead my horse behind me i held him by the bridle but without looking back and constantly ready in case of the least false step 
to leave my hold and let him drink alone of the water of that stream which would for him have been the river of oblivion oftentimes at a slippery spot there was merely the branch of a tree laid on insecure stones to hinder the passenger from rolling into this frightful abyss beyond it was requisite to make a turn in a very narrow passage where the body of a horse could only pass by twisting i know not how the poor animal contrived although one might freely venture a wager he had done so a hundred times by three o'clock i found myself on the crest of this mountain in spite of its elevation as nothing is great but by comparison it seemed but a hillock by side of those mountains i saw on my left we travelled on this crest the space of three hours i found here some new species of cactus with flat and rampant leaves and an aloe with crenellated leaves dentated at the edges with thorns the neighboring mountains however lofty presented to our observation several villages one of them termed san juan del rey but it was not the village of which name we sought i was now enabled to enjoy at leisure one of the most beautiful prospects in nature behind me still more distinctly visible the environs of tehuacan in front the two prominences of la corta a mountain six leagues from oaxaca rio grande ran on my right between frightful steeps finally on the left an immense country consisting of hills and gorges covered with wood extended between me and the mountains on which san juan del rey was situate and terminated with an insensible slope towards tehuacan i began to be fatigued and weary of so long a route when an opening showed me the end of my toils at least for this day this was quicatlan which we discovered two leagues before us in a tolerably handsome gorge we descended into it by a road somewhat less bad than that of the ascent but the aspect it presented was not less horrible it was a perpendicular chasm of eight hundred yards by a breadth of thrice that number seemingly occasioned by a mountain which had been swallowed up in this spot and the fragments and ruins of which strewed around quicatlan formed so many eminences combined with this scene of horror was yet somewhat pleasing on the salient stones of the scissure of the mountain up rose the cactus peruvianus which formed a very grateful decoration but how much was the pleasure of beholding quicatlan interrupted by the appearance of a garita which seemed to forbid my entrance how to pass without being stopped interrogated and delayed by these wretched guards these were the continually renascent subject of my fears to sleep on my horse to counterfeit sickness these were slender stratagems now worn threadbare in which i felt no inclination to repeat i chose a plan more simple founded on the little consideration these kind of people had inspired me with as despicable here as elsewhere on getting near them i descended my horse in a bold and determined manner and my gold cane hanging at my buttonhole and my diamond ring on my finger entered the garita without ceremony and pulling out some gold before the tobacco guards related to them the embarrassment i was under for want of change i mingled the statement with a thousand incidents relating to my dread of thieves and the unevenness of the road finishing with begging change for some medio de oros or doubloons such prattle no doubt made them so silent they never put a single question to me on the contrary i met with civility from them approaching even to meanness and they gave me change for as much as i wanted i then thanked and left them 
inviting the chief of the guard in a manner a superior accosts one beneath him to pay me a visit at the casa real end of section eleven section twelve of travels to oaxaca by nicholas joseph thierry de menonville an anonymous translation from the french this librivox recording is in the public domain Kikatlan, the capital of an ancient kingdom is still a pretty large town containing about two hundred families it is planted with trees of every kind beneath which many fountains of fresh water spread health and coolness i made a tour of the town its population appeared to me considerable for everywhere i saw men walking about and women seated in the current of the rills which flowed from the fountains combing washing and soaping themselves for bathing is very usual with the spanish women here especially the head after well washing the head it is soaked with the crushed root of a plant which i brought back with me and which is sold in the country by the pint with this substitute for soap the shoulders and bosom are likewise washed the sight of the beautiful black hair of these women hanging down the neck and shoulders extremely fair was highly interesting nor did their simple dress delight me less their long hair divided into two tresses and interwove with a rose-colored ribbon falls down to the ground a very white shift a furbelowed muslin petticoat a scarf of gauze or alencon lace sometimes bordered with a fringe of gold or silver this with a little bouquet on the side of the head completes their neat costume a costume if seen which would not be despised even by our nicest coquettes in this place i remarked a degree of emulation in culture which i noticed nowhere else corn is sown and the trees are lopped and grafted i remarked in the hedge which surrounded a very pretty garden a species of crescentia didium angiosperm calabash tree which would have delighted Linné seeing he inquires if any new species exist the leaves of this species are in bundles of the same form and color though smaller than in the one noticed by the father of botany but the fruit which is but two inches in diameter is ten inches long angular and tuberous like the cacao and seeds of the shape of a heart smothered in the pulp are not larger than those of the capsicum the fruit is used in kitchens as a pot herb or in ragouts i met with the same again in the markets of campeche i was solicitous of seeing the parsonage house and the church the first was very commodious its owner the rector received me at first with coolness but on learning i was a botanist he made amends by a profusion of civilities and consulted me on some complaints under which he laboured this clerical gentleman was of good appearance with ruby countenance which bespoke good living the parish church is large well lighted and kept remarkably clean it is true on this occasion it was put in order as the feast of pentecost was to be celebrated the next day a matter that surprised me was to see a schoolmaster there practicing motets for the following day and six choristers repeating the music in very good time to me the air was pleasing and not without taste the belfry is not more singular it is raised on a natural mound of earth one hundred feet high and consists of four posts eighteen feet high fastened and crossed at the top from the crossbars the bell is suspended about three feet from the ground weighing not less than ten thousand weight the roof of the belfry is of straw thatch like the roofs of our ice houses i returned to supper and in the interval arrived the officer of the tobacco guard from whom i learnt whatever i would by means of a few glasses of brandy 
the rogue was perfectly well acquainted with the whole country from panama to acapulco and from cartagena to veracruz he talked fluently on politics declaimed against the government and in case of need assuredly was open to seduction the casero informed me likewise another traveller in an honest franciscan friar about to preach at guatemala i inquired if he was inclined to accompany me in the morning and he consented provided i would wait until he had celebrated mass this being agreed upon i retired to rest and he to supper the next day we set off at five in the morning and arrived after a smart ride of a league and a half at the passage of rio grande rain had fallen in the mountains another day's rain would have rendered the river impracticable here it is much wider than at quiotepec its breadth not being less than four hundred yards and the sides consequently much less precipitous an indian beckoned to from the opposite side came and took the leading horses by the bridle and perfectly naked conducted us over the river for our part we were in the water up to the saddle bow and he to the breast and this took place so leisurely that i had full opportunity of noticing all the danger the current was so rapid that it confounded me i was obliged to steady myself by the pommel my legs on the horse's rump and my breast on its neck the animal itself trembled and advanced not a step without first feeling his way on account of the enormous rounded stones at the bottom at length we got through and my fellow traveller breathless with fear and not less pale than myself remarked in good french that if we had drowned without having first gone to mass the people would not have failed to ascribe our death to a failure of devotion i laughed heartily at the fancy and seeing whom i had to deal with by this sally i was no longer under any constraint with him he was indeed one of the pleasantest fellows for a monk i ever met with and with this a man of sense one who had seen the world lively and inquisitive as much as becomes a man finally he was highly engaging obliging and unceremonious we continually kept along the banks of the river till dinner time it was covered with twenty species of waterfowl both large and small especially crows corvus aquaticus minor linnaeus which i much regretted not having time to examine we arrived at an early hour at don domiguillo where thanks to the good father who took with him a well-supplied larder we made an excellent dinner don domenquillo is situate at the confluence of the rio grande and the rio de las vueltas or the turns so denominated from its frequent windings it abounds in fruit trees and is plentifully watered as we were saddling our horses in order to depart we heard a horn and immediately after saw a spaniard dressed in blue turned up with red with a large silver plate in form of a shield on his side and a small horn of the same metal depending from a cord which passed over the shoulder he was a courier as a specimen of his diligence he left tehuacan the day before and reckoned on reaching oaxaca on the morrow by six in the morning i held discourse with him for a few minutes he seemed inquisitive but i readily concealed from him my designs he took a different road to ours over the mountains in order to avoid crossing the rivers no doubt from apprehension of being stopped by their course as for us we passed through the gorge in which flows the river de las vueltas this gorge is in places a hundred paces broad at others scarcely a dozen yards in order to go in a direct line through the windings of this gorge it is necessary to cross the river seventy times my fellow-travellers reckoned the number 
the muleteer by means of small pebbles and the monk by the beads of his rosary and their accounts tallied for my part after the twentieth time i was tired of counting and was so much fatigued that i could willingly have halted midway in order to take a nap i found on the banks of the river a flowering plant much resembling cockle campion a tree covered with flowers which i recognized immediately for the custard apple or anona but which in this country is commonly called the chiramoya which makes it almost certain that the famous chiramoya of mexico so much extolled is really nothing else than a reticulated anona i moreover found here the mexican solanum arborescent and with large lanceot leaves which i had before noticed in the king's garden and a species of fruit-bearing asclepius with leaves like myrtle a straight stem and yellow flowers of the shape and size of our small yellow jasmine at length the gorge through which we were travelling enlarging to a quarter of a league we left the windings of the river and arrived at atlatwaca a pueblo situate in the gorge and most desirably on account of its excellent water on the left of the mountains and on a glacis the slope of which is towards the river stand the church and the casa real i felt unpleasantly from having my feet so frequently wetted and retired to rest without supper in spite of the solicitations of my fellow traveller tormented by the gnats i rose the next morning by three and awakened everybody it was so cold that we were obliged to make a fire my thermometer stood at nine degrees above the freezing point forty eight and two thirds degree of fahrenheit we made a hearty breakfast from the store of the good father and when about to saddle my horse i was witness to a spectacle which frightened and surprised me exceedingly the riding mule of the master of the house fastened to a post had all night long been sucked some say by a vampire a spirit but really by a living animal a bat which had bit it between the left ear and the mane below the occiput and had drawn from it more than four quarts of blood the whole head and neck of the mule was covered with gore as well as the post against which it no doubt had rubbed in order to disengage itself from this cruel harpy i was in complete astonishment at the sight but i learnt that such events are common and that when one bat has succeeded in thus opening the vein of a horse or mule all the rest come and satiate themselves from this source we guessed this place to be wretchedly poor from the care i noticed with which some women were collecting a few grains of maize from a spot where a caravan of mules had been recently fed i learnt also that the maize which was the most esteemed in the country and most common is long flat and quadrangular and the straw white at about four o'clock we departed and four leagues from atlatwaca after having crossed the river of turns seven or eight times we distinguished hayacatlan charming hamlet no never shall i forget thee i no longer wondered at the anxiety i felt that morning to set off the impatience i experienced to arrive these were doubtless forebodings of my good fortune not mines nor metallic wealth dost thou enjoy perhaps but for me nothing that is curious but thou first presented me with the object of my prayers and researches yes thou art the most lovely of hamlets at hayacatlan it was that for the first time in my life i saw the cochineal alive on the nopal by which it is nourished i even trembled with ecstasy the day before my capuchin who was very well acquainted with the country on detailing its riches and cultivation had mentioned to me cochineal 
i merely expressed to him a desire of having some in my possession that i might the better be enabled to describe it but when he told me it was likewise to be found at los Ques, which i had passed through i was vexed with myself exceedingly at missing the opportunity i had had of finding it sooner and at less expense still i had nothing wherewith to reproach myself for how was i to have known there was cochineal at los Ques? under apprehension of disclosing my secret i had imposed on myself a restriction from even mentioning the word cochineal in this village i met not with a single indian who understood spanish and the only spaniard i encountered though he did indeed speak to me of cochineal by no means even hinted at its being cultivated there i never thought therefore of looking for it at that place and chance alone could have thrown it in my way after all i had no cause to repent my going so far in search of it as my extra journeys afforded me the opportunity of seeing more of it of speaking of it more largely of procuring excellent vanilla and finally of meeting with more safe means of transporting and preserving all my treasures to return to my dear cochineal on arriving at hayacatlan i saw a garden full of nopals and had no doubt i should there find the precious insect i was so desirous to examine i therefore leapt from my horse under pretence of altering my stirrup leathers entered the grounds of the indian proprietor began a conversation with him and inquired to what use he put those plants he answered to cultivate la grana i seemed astonished and begged to see the cochineal but my surprise was real when he brought it me for instead of the red insect i expected there appeared one covered with a white powder i was tormented with the doubts i entertained and to resolve them bethought me of crushing one on white paper and what was the result it yielded the truly royal purple hue intoxicated with joy and admiration i hastily left my indian throwing him two reals for his pains and galloped at full speed after my companion who was waiting for me at a wretched sugar work the canes about which however were superb at last said i to myself i have seen this insect have held it in my hands i shall undoubtedly meet with it again as i am now in the country where it is cultivated the indians assuredly will sell it me and i thus shall be able to bear off my prize the object and end of all my ardent wishes still certain reflections mixed gall with my delight i could not hide from myself the difficulty i should have to bring it to safe haven an animal so light so pliable so easy to crush an animal which once separated from the plant could never settle on it again the shocks of the horse a journey of a hundred leagues by land could i hope with these to preserve it and the enormous plants on which i saw the insect was it possible for me to transport them how was i to hide them and what a case must it not require to contain a tree eight feet high by a diameter of five or six these mournful ideas occasioned me a deep reverie which not all the gaiety of the capuchin could disperse i excused myself by pretending fatigue and the vexation i endured from my horse the worst in real truth i had hitherto crossed to san juan del rey the distance was six leagues with but one intervening mountain called la costa it is nearly a league perpendicular in height and the road over it is almost as difficult as that of quiotepec while to complete our trouble in passing it we were beleaguered by two caravans of loaded mules the road was so narrow that we were obliged to alight from our horses and climb upon rocks in order to leave room for them to pass and made way for five hundred animals 
following each other one by one the sound of the bells and the whistling and smacking of whips of thirty muleteers echoed by the surrounding mountains occasioned a strange confusion a noise with which we were almost stupefied however after attaining a certain height the road becomes wider and of more gentle ascent the soil consists of vegetable earth yielding in abundance excellent herbage on which at their halting the mules are wont to pasture this mountain constantly enveloped in fog is remarkable for its perpetual cool and the deep shades its pines its oaks and the large timber of various kind occasion regret that to remove them to the plains should be a work so difficult and expensive the prospect from the crest of the mountain is wonderful behind is seen kikatlan and that mountain of tehuacan from which we had distinguished the one on which we were in part extended the magnificent plain of oaxaca and the valley between two chains of mountains which reaches to guatemala three hundred leagues distant on the right and left the eye embraces distinctly a scope of forty leagues of beautiful country but in front it was that a real paradise was displayed the views of oaxaca in the distance and of fifty villages or hamlets on this side of it vying with each other in beauty and pleasantness of sight the splendor of the stone with which they are built their roofs of curved tiles as in lorraine the gardens and charming trees with which they are encompassed had certainly a ravishing effect the road presented us with objects no less curious i might have collected more than twenty herbaceous plants and shrubs of a curious and novel kind but all my attention was attracted by a flower of a splendid blood-red color it was a lily of st iago amaryllis formosissima the whole neighborhood was covered with it i recollected having seen it in flower in the royal apartments at versailles and i promised myself to pluck some bulbs of it on my return for my friend mr Twain, the head gardener of his majesty he had made me a present of two for the purpose of naturalizing them at santo domingo but having left that island so soon after reaching it i had entrusted them with an inhabitant of the colony by whose negligence they perished and here i cannot refrain from remarking how little curiosity invention or industry except indeed in what regards the peculiar objects of culture such as coffee sugar or indigo is displayed by the inhabitants of santo domingo his immediate culture alone engrosses all his faculties what is merely commodious or ornamental never enters his fancy from such a character is not to be expected any care for the naturalization of different fruits and flowers or a solicitude of perfecting such as have been transplanted there why should i he questions am i not sufficiently occupied in making my fortune i look at the end of my labors for enjoyment of life and next year i shall set off even ten years after the colonist is still found on the island and finally there he terminates his days we arrived at san juan del rey at noon the lands sown with corn through which we traveled reminded me of europe the first thing that struck me on entering the pueblo was a plantation of nopals in most excellent order i was dying with impatience to enter it but was obliged to accompany my party to the casa real while however supper was being prepared i slipped away thinking it the house of the rector of the village to whom the plantation of nopal was stated to belong i entered that of a tall and stout negro who was the alcalde of the place after first compliments i fixed my attention on a pewter basin on the table in which i saw a quantity of dry cochineal mixed with dirt respecting it i put a thousand questions to him 
and stated how much i should be gratified in seeing his plantation of nopals my request seemed to please him as much as my condescension for this description of people is in general treated by european spaniards with the most profound contempt he led me with readiness to his garden at the gate of which i saw a singular affixture it was a leaf of the nopal nailed to the threshold on which fastened by as many pins were stuck a number of caterpillars and two or three species of cochinelli one of which was the cochinella cacti cochinelli fairy coleopterus atris duobus punctus luteus linnaeus the yellow and black ladybug this at first i regarded as some amulet or charm and a bad augury with respect to the religion of my african but the lady of the alcalde though as black as her husband undeceived me in the most satisfactory manner by informing me that they were los enemigos de la grana the enemies of the cochineal which were thus immolated at every harvest and which were placed there in order that they might be universally known and devoted to general persecution the plantation of nopals might have an extent equal to an acre and a half it was neat kept in good order and the trees loaded with the last crop which appeared to me a very abundant one the nopals all of them of the same age were about four feet high by as many broad the order in which they were planted like as hayacatlan was from east to west I fancied that I discovered the male insect in a species of cochinellus of a very lively red color, but I have since been satisfied by experience that I was in error. The proprietor informed me that he collected from four to eight arrobas of cochineal annually, and that its price on the spot was from eighteen to twenty-four reals the pound. While in conversation with the alcalde, my traveling companion became impatient for his dinner and sent out in search of me i ate with a good appetite imagining we should make another stage after dinner and reach oaxaca that day from which we were yet eight leagues distant but the monk who loved his ease signified that he did not mean to proceed further for my part i resolved on setting off immediately after dinner and returning thanks to my monk as well as his major domo to whom i made a small present i jumped on my horse and already anticipated the sound of the clack of the whip in the faubourgs of oaxaca how wide in my reckoning was i the rascally topeth had furnished me with a mare in foal which could not be made to exceed a walk i was perfectly in a rage but soon became calm from the reflections to which the incident gave rise. I saw, confirmed, the old observation that the depravity of man is in proportion to the extent of society. In fact, all the Indians I had seen in my way as far as San Juan del Rey were, generally speaking, simple, mild, and ingenuous, because at distance from great towns but from this place to oaxaca they are sly subtle and even knavish and idle it may truly be said that the neighborhood of european spaniards has been a pest a plague equally unfortunate and prompt of diffusion End of section twelve Section 13 of Travels to Oaxaca by Nicholas Joseph Thierry de Menonville, an anonymous translation from the French. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. How different the conduct of the topists who had been my conductors before this one! I had had tolerable good horses, or at least had not been led into error, but this scoundrel had had the impudence to extol the excellence of the mare i rode though a truly good-for-nothing beast but this was not all 
tired at last with the obstinacy of the wretched animal i inquired if there was no place where i might rest the topeth answered no i had heard of the band of thieves of etla and now had strong suspicions not only that my conductor was a rogue but also that he might be one of the band night was drawing on i scarcely knew what plan to adopt when fortunately i distinguished a procession which satisfied me we were but a short distance from etla i made all diligence to reach the rectory alighted from my horse kissed the sleeve of the rector's surplice according to the custom of the place and inquired for the casa real we entered by the lower part of the hamlet he pointed out the casa in the upper part about a quarter of a league distant whither i repaired it is situate in an immense esplanade and forms part of a large pile of building which seemed to me a farmhouse in front there is a large gallery paved on the left a prison on the right a tienda or shop kept by the lieutenant of the alcalde on the northeast the esplanade is terminated by an immense building which seemed a magnificent castle i had the curiosity to visit it and found it to be a convent of dominicans which had formerly belonged to the jesuits but which their successors had suffered to fall to decay the architecture of it half roman half arabesque notwithstanding the excellence of the masonry was in my eyes poor i entered the hall in which the courts are held the ornaments of which announced that the district of this alcaldia is large while waiting for the return of the lieutenant of the alcalde in order to procure supper ten or twelve men in cloaks passed in succession before me making low bows and as if desirous of accosting me their little promising physiognomy was a sufficient inducement with me to send them about their business and i afterwards learnt that they were idle scoundrels who lived in the language of our excellent la fontaine merely by franch le pay or sponging men fit for those employments only which exact neither labour nor fidelity i concluded as must every one that such fellows are of no value and that the sooner the country should be quit of them the better in the meantime the lieutenant of the alcalde returned i paid him a visit and found him seated at his counter in the middle of the shop he received me with the gravity of a monarch giving audience to ambassadors and scarcely vouchsafed a look but i had for my part too contemptible an opinion of the wretch to take any offence at my reception all i wanted of him was somewhat for supper he furnished me with bread four eggs and a gallon of wine but shortly after i had occasion for him for perceiving that my knave of a topeth gave my horse nothing to eat i requested the interference of the lieutenant of the alcalde who attended to my request and even threatened to make him pay for its food himself after this i laid myself down to rest on some very clean mats in the auditory and slept with that tranquillity a many may do in a court of justice who have nothing to dread from the laws the next morning i departed at daybreak the cold very sharp my mare thanks to my pains went somewhat better than she had done the day before but she soon became tired and at two leagues from edla i was fain to fend away my topeth not without a strong inclination to give him a sound thrashing fortunately for him pity interposed and pleaded his cause so that he escaped punishment i continued my road on foot the town was no more than a league and a half distant the country along the road delightful i fancied myself transported into our plains in europe and proceeded to oaxaca between hedges filled with trees and plants unknown to me among those were a junipera sabina of twelve feet in diameter convolvuli palos cordovans etc 
the suburbs of oaxaca were thickly set with plantations of nopals at which i glanced an eye occasionally but without exhibiting any symptoms of curiosity finally i entered the town with the appearance of a person who had recently left it for a walk and halted at an inn pointed out to me on my right a hundred paces distant from nuestra senora de la soledad the term of my pilgrimage nothing can be conceived more magnificent than the site of oaxaca from san juan de rey to this town opens a plain two leagues in breadth which extends the length of five or six to the environs of the town on the lowest part of the slope of a hill which appends to the chain of mountains on the northeast stands oaxaca the capital of the province of the same name at a distance of somewhat more than a league from the mountains it fronts the opening of three plains that of san juan del rey which leads to guatemala on the southeast and another on the southwest of which i forget the name this position has rendered it a center at which the first sale takes place of all the aniseed cochineal and vanilla collected in the gorges between the high mountains by which it is encompassed at distance of five six and seven leagues it is amply furnished with cereal productions and fruit of all kinds from the plain the foot of the slope on which it is built is bathed by a beautiful river and well-planned aqueducts supply it with abundance of water of the utmost excellence the air constantly refreshed by eastern breezes in the morning and at evening by others from the west is pure and delightful and of such moderate temperature that at eight in the morning in may my thermometer denoted sixteen degrees above the freezing point and at noon twenty two degrees note sixty eight degrees fahrenheit in the morning and eighty one and one half degrees of fahrenheit at noon from this happy circumstance notwithstanding it is situate about the twentieth degree of latitude it enjoys an ever blooming spring finally magnificent and highly ornamented prospects excellence of soil profusion of fruits as well european as american which succeed each other in unremitting continuance would make an actual paradise of oaxaca were it only possessed by a more industrious and active race of men its numerous steeples and elevated domes give this city at a distance an air of grandeur and it may be truly affirmed that its interior corresponds it is sixteen hundred fathoms long by about a thousand broad and nearly quadrangular if the suburbs be included which are replete as i have before remarked with plantations of nopals and gardens its streets are wide straight well paved and level the houses on each side are built with stone two stories high at the time i was there a town house was building on a plan which evinced some taste and will prove a great ornament to the great square on which it is built the stone is of a sea green color the same square is adorned by the bishop's palace and the church which form two of its sides and both of which after the manner of the spaniards are entirely surrounded by arcades strongly constructed and of infinite utility in protecting passengers from the sun and from rain to conclude all the churches which are numerous and finely built are neatly whitened without and richly ornamented within the population of this city including negroes mulattoes and indians amounts to six thousand it is the residence of a bishop and a governor of the province and is under the jurisdiction of the audiencia of guatemala to the viceroy of which province the governor of oaxaca is subordinate the inn to which i had been directed was so wretched and filthy that i could not rest satisfied with making it my abode i made haste in dressing myself and deposited in my room the packet of clothes which i had constantly carried with me 
and which I found, however small, yet cumbersome, and left the place, much embarrassed at my appearance, and not knowing whither to go. Without a cloak, I looked at once a foreigner. A net for my hair and a broad-brimmed hat scarcely in any degree protected me from a crowd of inquisitive eyes. To get rid of the curiosity of the people, I entered the first church I met with, and thus, without suspecting it, accomplished my vow, for it turned out to be that of Nuestra Señora de la Soledad. After admiring its treasure, its gildings, the dome, in bad taste, but built of brick, varnished externally with checker work, and a multitude of ex votos, equally ridiculous and fanatic, I left the church as little forwarded as, and in no better heart than when I entered. I wandered about at random in the streets, when at last I noticed that I was followed by a man in a cloak whom I had seen at the inn. He was loaded with rosaries and scapularies, and at first sight might be mistaken for a very devout zealot. When in the church he kneeled as I kneeled, rose as I rose, walked in my steps, and stopped when I halted. I was seized with fear. I imagined him to be a spy, employed by the police, and fixed there purposely to watch my motions, or perhaps those of all new comers. I resolved on knowing the truth, and accosted him, inquiring whether his rosaries were for sale. He answered in the affirmative, but that he had another occupation, which was to learn where I should pass the day. Where I please was my instant answer, in a tone demonstrating a greater fund of assurance than what I actually possessed. But why this question? Because, said he, simpering, and in a mysterious manner, I should feel myself so happy if it should be in my power to procure any enjoyment to a stranger so kind and generous as you appear to be. At these words, which at once unmasked his character, I breathed with greater freedom. I now perfectly comprehended that this gentleman was no other than what at court, where all things are painted in their fairest colors, is termed the prince's friend. Gracious powers, said I to myself, and is it in the very sanctuary of the Immaculate Virgin that vice perfumes under the veil of hypocrisy to exhibit her allurements? Turning then to the unknown, friend, said I, you follow then a pretty and very obliging sort of trade, but I have no need of you and beware how you follow me any further. After this incident, I penetrated into the city, where I met with some tolerably handsome coaches and crowds of people. I was solicitous of seeing the cathedral. It was now the third festival of Whitsuntide, and high mass was celebrating. The music was fine, grave, and majestic, the voices excellent, the cadences in good measure, and the numerous and solemn pauses well calculated to inspire devotion and reflecting thoughts. I was in a profound ecstasy when, at the elevation of the host, a gray-headed priest holding a silver cross in one hand, like our choristers in France, and in the other a wand of the same metal, like our porters, touched me gently with the latter and requested me to take off the net from my hair, which hitherto I had constantly worn unnoticed in all the churches. I did immediately as I was desired, and could but admire this regulation, though feeling hurt at the species of affront I had unwarily drawn upon me. I immediately left the church. I had occasion for some repairs to my watch, and after looking about at length found a watchmaker's. He was absent, but his wife received me in such a manner as almost to put me to the blush. She was a woman of six and thirty, a brunette, who had been handsome, 
and was still tormented with that immoderate desire of pleasing which some women lose only with life itself she made me a thousand questions and succeeded in learning i was a botanist she concluded thence that i was a physician and endeavored to persuade me to fix at oaxaca telling me that notwithstanding the extent of the city there was not in it either a physician or surgeon and that she would vouch that her husband who was a corregidor should forward me to the full of his ability she even in pretty distinct terms told me she could herself be of service to me and i began to feel somewhat for the gratitude she might expect when fortunately her husband entered he was an excellent machinist and drew extremely well as he satisfied me by a multitude of works which he displayed as well in relief as on paper of his doing he had moreover rather a curious garden in which i gathered some seeds of mirasol and sage with cornrows flowers after leaving the corregidor i obtained a direction to a trunk maker's my plan required i should be furnished with cases or coffers easy of transport the tradesman to whom i was directed showed me some of all sizes i chose eight two feet long by fourteen inches broad and of similar depth they were of a white and very light wood dovetailed even bound at the corners and with locks they were moreover so solid and so well made that better could not have been produced in any workshop in paris the price also was reasonable they cost me seventeen reals the pair or about four shillings each i asked for no abatement and my liberality purchased me the present of a basket of apricots which had just been given to the trunk maker in which he observed me notice with longing eyes this european fruit is so much degenerated from not having been grafted that it is but little larger than the montmorency cherry it has notwithstanding preserved its original flavor i now perceived that i should never have been able at los Ques to have met with the same resources as at oaxaca there indeed i might have obtained cochineal but this was not sufficient the means of transporting it were alike necessary i was consequently very well satisfied with my bargain i merely conditioned over and above the purchase to have partitions made in each of the boxes and i brought away with me the keys delighted at having thus assured in a degree success in my undertaking astonished at finding myself so far advanced and at having so readily overcome all the difficulties i had to fight against i was scarcely able to bear my weight of joy and imagined myself in a dream from which i dreaded to awake but which every instant i found would be the case the greater the facility i had hitherto met with the more was i apprehensive of the obstacles which i painted to myself would attend the future this mixture of satisfaction and inquietude occasioned an oppression on my mind a melancholy which i was utterly unable to shake off in this state i walked through the streets without well knowing whither i went at length i found myself in one of the suburbs called de las vueltas or the turnings a name distinctive of the gardens of this country where it is considered beauty to intersect them with walls and partitions which occasion so many windings and recesses in the same enclosure among others were some plantations of nopals the order of the rows in which i observed to be still the same as i before had noticed that is to say from east to west but in almost all of which the crops had been recently gathered in some plantations i saw men employed lopping off the branches in others planting at length i distinguished one which appeared to me magnificent 
and so thickly loaded with cochineal that not a single leaf could be taken from the nopal without crushing a thousand of the insects in order to take a survey at leisure i entered into a garden parted from the plantation only by a hedge under pretense of buying flowers the first objects in this garden which excited my attention was a violet colored aster as large as those grown with us but produced on a shrub resembling by its pinnated leaves our elder tree and which had a very fine effect what however engrossed almost the whole of my attention and thoughts was the beautiful plantation of nopals and while the bouquet i had ordered was being gathered i satiated my eyes with the spectacle before me the nopals were thickly planted at about four feet distance in lines six feet apart i learnt that this nopal ground belonged to a negro who was not there at that time i fed myself with hopes of buying of him both the nopal and some of the insects after traversing several other gardens i returned to the city and caused those to be pointed out to me belonging to an apothecary whose name was don antonio pisa and which had been highly extolled by the gardeners i had spoken with the proprietor conceiving by my dress that i was a frenchman showed me the utmost civility and proffered to me his services after which informing him that being a botanist i was anxious to see his garden he caused his nephew to accompany me to it politely excusing himself from not being of the party owing to his advanced age and infirmities this garden intersected by five or six walls which no doubt announced so many fresh acquisitions appeared to have been framed at great expense a copious fountain very pleasingly ornamented delivered its waters at the height of eight feet into an antique vase whence through four spouts they descended into a spacious basin from which they were conducted into different reservoirs a number of indifferent pinks a quantity of salvia othecas a species of sage some agaves malolote blue everlastings oxal or sorrel pot herbs mallows apricots grapes and peaches these formed the whole of the rarities i found in this garden which moreover was kept in very indifferent order while i was there i saw a female enter the garden the lady of a corregidor in a rich veil of black velvet trimmed with gold fringe she came escorted by a very handsome man for the purpose of seeing as i afterwards learnt the face of a frenchman i paid my respects to her in the most polite manner yet hurt at thus becoming the object of general curiosity and much vexed at my foreign appearance after she had retired i went to return thanks to the apothecary and spoke in high terms of his garden much pleased with me don antonio pisa was solicitous i should visit another garden no less curious i repaired thither and did indeed find a garden which would have done honor to the marshes of paris by the fine display it afforded of cabbages artichokes raspberries apricots and grapes water was everywhere distributed in little gutters along plots planted with parsley turnips radishes and well-hearted lettuce five or six workmen indians or of mixed breed were at work here here also i found the owner don gregorio meuta one of the corregidores of the city a man about five and forty of handsome countenance and graceful deportment he condescended to applaud my researches and curiosity and pointed out to me everything that was curious what however appeared to me most worthy of remark was a tree which at first sight resembled much a reine cloud plum tree but which was no other than a malpighia which i had not hitherto seen i begged the proprietor to allow me to gather some of the fruit in order to obtain the stones 
the fruit it yields is as large as our white heart cherries i wished to pay for what i gathered but was not suffered nor would even the indian workmen who attended accept the two reals which i proffered them i again returned to my apothecary and having given him a picture of the wretched inn at which i had taken up my abode a picture which from the difficulty i had to express myself in spanish made him laugh till the tears dropped i besought him to point out to me some one where i might get a decent meal and this he promised to do the conversation next turned on the different objects of culture in the country he inquired if i was acquainted with them to which i answered in the affirmative with the exception of vanilla which i was anxious of seeing in order to describe it with the precision of a botanist a priest who happened to be present interrupted me to state that he had some in a wood dependent on a farm belonging to him about six leagues thence and that if i wished it he would send one of his indians thither with me the next day as a guide he even offered to obtain a horse for me and this with all that politeness and kind anticipation which we frenchmen are wont to deem peculiar to ourselves i then took my leave exceedingly pleased with my day's work and well convinced that with a little hardihood and activity much may be effected i repaired to my new inn recommended by don antonio pisa conducted by a servant of that gentleman it was kept by a frenchman who had been cook to the late governor i accosted my countrymen with a sensation of pleasure and with that confidence which might easily be conceived by any one who for the instant would place himself in my situation i did not even take into account the difference of our stations in life nor had i any reason to repent my condescension for he was really and not merely in appearance a very good kind of man i could perceive he was rich though he complained of his bad fortune and plainly saw that this was only the better to hide his prosperity and not excite envy in a people always jealous of our industry and success and at the same time possibly that he might the better be enabled to leave the country at a favorable opportunity i begged of him to give me a good supper assuring him that it would be the first since my leaving france he promised he would and kept his word for i had one truly worthy of a governor's table and afterwards was enabled to take a delicious night's rest undressed and between sheets on a tolerably good bed an enjoyment i had not experienced for a length of time the plan i had arranged to purchase some nopals and cochineal on the succeeding day occasioned me to wake very early in the morning i was up therefore by three o'clock and taking with me two indian servants belonging to the inn each with a large basket and towels i repaired to the plantation of nopals i had seen the day before i left the servants at the gate on entering and myself took charge of their baskets the negro owner was scarcely awake he came towards me with a simple modest and civil air quite different from what is usual among people of his stamp in the kingdom of mexico i informed him that being a physician i wanted for the purpose of making an ointment for the gout a few leaves of the nopal with the cochineal upon them which i begged him to sell me as the case was urgent telling him i was willing to pay for them whatever he might require he permitted me to take as much as i pleased i did not require twice bidding but immediately selected eight of the handsomest branches each two feet long and consisting of seven or eight leaves in length but so perfectly covered with cochineals as to be quite white with them i cut them off myself placed them in the best possible manner in the boxes and covered them with the towels i then inquired what they were worth 
he protested they were well worth two reals i readily believed him i who would not have held them dear at as many quadruples but that i might not render him aware of how good a bargain i reckoned upon having made i merely gave him a dollar telling him i had no change and begging him to keep the remainder to drink my health with the good old negro rubbed his eyes fancying himself still asleep and while he overwhelmed me with gratitude i called in my indians loaded them with the two baskets and made off with the rapidity of lightning end of section 13section fourteen of travels to oaxaca by nicholas joseph thierry de menonville an anonymous translation from the french this librivox recording is in the public domain my heart beat in a manner that beggars description it seemed to me as if i was bearing away the golden fleece but at the same time as if the furious dragon placed over it as a guard was following close at my heels all the way along i kept humming the famous line at length i have it in my power and should willingly have sung it aloud but for fear of being overheard i arrived at my inn out of breath and slipped in unperceived and without having met with a single person in the streets the dawn was opening but nobody yet had risen in the house I shut myself up in my room and then packed my dear nopals with inexpressible satisfaction and in the tenderest manner imaginable in two of my small boxes taking the precaution to lay them two at top and two at bottom separating them by the partition and sticks of a dry and pliant wood thus by five in the morning i found myself in possession of a fine cargo of cochineal which not a soul had either seen me purchase or pack the negro who sold it me was a simple good kind of man and the indians whom i liberally rewarded in joining them at the same time to secrecy with respect to where they had been with me in the morning were themselves ignorant of what the precious load they carried tranquil on this head i went to enjoy beneath some orange trees in the court the pleasure of my reflections and the cool of morning waiting the period of my host rising never had the sky before appeared so beautiful never the climate so pleasing the day before my imagination was filled with monstrous chimera this day everything was of charming aspect and admitted of my giving the reins to fancy whatever my future fortune may be said i to myself i have now completed the end of my journey i may now set off yes even directly but no vanilla which i had been told could be obtained no nearer than at a distance of twenty leagues hence vanilla comes as it were of itself to invite my taking it let us effect this second conquest at length the people of the house roused from their slumbers breakfast was served up to which i did more justice than any one and at which i noticed a singular fruit it was an apple the pulp of which was soft and black as raisin the spaniards call it sapota negra i opened several and took out their kernels as i meant to set out at noon in search of vanilla i ordered a good dinner to be provided for me at eleven o'clock I then sent my compliments to the priest, Don José Ortiz, and reminded him of his promise, after which I dressed myself for the purpose of taking a survey of the city. My countryman, who was my guide, had the kindness to lend me a cloak. With this, my hair in a net, and my broad-brimmed hat, I looked perfectly a Spaniard, and had no longer the vexation to endure of hearing constantly rung in my ears aqui está francés there goes a frenchman we made the whole tour of the city and i measured its streets it appeared to me on this occasion even more handsome than it had done the day before the only thing which seemed wanting 
and which not only here but throughout spanish america if mexico be accepted is everywhere a desideratum is an alley of trees or a promenade one indeed had been planned here below the aqueduct there are even basins of stone prepared for conducting water to it from a fountain and this spot its situation considered would without doubt have been a most delightful one for a public walk but the plantation was never carried into effect and the whole plan dropped to the ground we visited the market one the best supplied of any i had seen since i left the havana i found in it all kinds of fruit but what most forcibly struck me was the sight of raw cochineal exposed for sale when i say raw i mean undried and with the insects yet alive the price of it was eight reals the pound i at length returned home loaded with plants leaves and branches of all kinds among the rest with a species of palma christi or racinus of an uncommon species which i have since dispatched for the king's garden after having packed my plants in my chamber i went to a man who had been pointed out to me for one who led horses and without a syllable said to my host on the subject who reckoned on having me as a guest at least for a fortnight to come i hired five horses at eight reals each to carry me the next morning to san juan del rey at eleven o'clock i had another meal worthy of a governor's table and served with equal promptitude and elegance but what again doubtless the reader in perusing this narrative will take me for an absolute glutton but let him pause an instant i was intoxicated with joy i sought for gratifications as a compensation for my labors and possibly this was of a less dangerous nature than another for there surely could be no harm in strengthening my poor body weakened by the fasts and bad fare it had endured and rendering it capable of withstanding the mortifications it had yet to undergo don ortiz had not forgot me by noon his horses were at my door i immediately rose from table and leapt into the saddle loading the muleteer my guide with a linen sack four feet high which i had bought for the purpose in the morning after this we set off at full speed each of us with a handkerchief round the head covered by a large flapped hat and the crown of this surmounted with a cone-shaped cap of cotton to cause a divergency of the rays of the sun a precaution highly necessary we reached without halting a mountain four leagues from the city which it took us a quarter of an hour to ascend after this we went down into a valley in which the farm of don ortiz was situate the produce of the valley nothing but wood and maize we continued our journey two leagues further when we met some people belonging to the farm i wished to address them in order to know where we might find what we were in search of but the muleteer pretended to know vanilla very well and boasted that he could show it me himself we in consequence alighted and during half an hour sought for it in vain among all the trees i still waited for my muleteer doctor to point it out to me and at last whether from ignorance whether from design he showed me instead of it an arum scadens with palmated leaves the item of which it must be confessed pretty much resembles that of vanilla i told him he was an ass and that instead of thus making me lose my time he would have done much better had he called for one of the indians it was in fact five o'clock and i was under the greatest anxiety lest i should be obliged to return without the vanilla or have to sleep at the farm which would defer my intended departure on the next morning i was almost mad with vexation at length an indian with a hoe in his hand made his appearance brother said i holding out a dollar show me some vanilla and this is yours he coolly bade me follow him and advancing a few steps through the underwood into a thicket in which were a number of trees 
he immediately climbed up one threw down to me two pods of vanilla perfectly ripe and pointed out to me a branch on which several others were hanging yet green together with two faded flowers of which the nectarium still remained i recognized it for an epidendrum the form of the leaves the stone and the fruit perfectly well described the peculiar smell of the plant everything convinced me it was the real vanilla in everything corresponding with such i had seen at the house of don atenas at vera cruz all the trees in this little copse were covered with it i saw a quantity of green fruit but collected no more than six specimens of these and four large pods which were ripe i caused the indian afterwards to part from the root some of the scions which had sprung up these i tied well together wrapping up the whole in the leaves of an arum which at their base are three feet wide after thus packing a faggot which weighed upwards of thirty pounds i placed it in my large sack which i fastened on the rump of my horse i was so well satisfied with my indian that besides the gourd i had promised him i gave him in addition two reals for his part unwilling to be outdone in generosity he ran to his hut and brought me three other pods of vanilla who now was more confused than my mulatto for me i was highly pleased with not having listened to him we again mounted our horses and we made such good speed that by nine in the evening we reached oaxaca i directed my guide to make my best respects to his master and repeat how much i held myself obliged to him i gave him for the use of the horses six piastres and two for his individual trouble after which i again entered my inn with the vanilla without any one knowing what it was it was late and i supped by myself after supper i desired my landlord and countryman to make out his account and announced my departure on the next morning he seemed greatly surprised at my intention but answered that he had no demand to make that he had entertained me with great pleasure as a countryman but without any view of gain i easily comprehended his drift and presenting him three dollars inquired if that was sufficient he still assumed that he had received me as a friend and that i might pay him nothing if i pleased to this i dryly answered that he being a frenchman was capable of discerning by my exterior manners that i was not a person to be treated gratuitously by him and that moreover his situation in life obliged him to sell his services to every one i thought it right with this to add three more dollars to those i had placed on the table at the same time requesting him to prepare me a few provisions when our host noticed the tone i assumed with a satisfied look he placed the six dollars in his pocket and in very polite terms returned me thanks shortly after he sent me what i had required i now shut myself up in my chamber and passed a part of the night in examining and arranging all my plants in my boxes two of these were destined for the vanilla which i marked and mingled with a thousand other plants collected at hazard as while doing this i frequently opened and shut the boxes my hostess on hearing the noise became exceedingly curious and sought to satisfy her inquisitiveness under pretense of making me a small present of chocolate she therefore knocked three or four times at the door of my room but i constantly objected to opening it so that at last she was tired out and decided on leaving the chocolate on a chair in the adjoining room i slept but a little time by four in the morning my horses being come i awakened mine host his astonishment was at its height for i had not apprised him of the measures i had taken my cases and baggage were all laid on my cattle in an instant i mounted on one of the horses and obliged the topeth to lead on the others before me at a good rate daylight had not yet beamed on oaxaca when i set off on account of my train i found the streets exceedingly long 
for I was anxious to avoid examination and the excitement of curiosity. At length, by daybreak, I gained the open country. The morning was remarkably cool. I struck my heels into the sides of my horse and increased our pace. My horses turned out to be excellent ones and speeded so well that by half-past seven we reached Etla, whence, without halting for refreshment, I proceeded onwards to San Juan del Rey, occasionally alighting to gather plants. On the road I met with a doctor who, conversing on the objects of culture, informed me that Nopals had been transported into Castile for the purpose of attempting the naturalization of the cochineal, but that the project failed from which he drew the very wise conclusion that it was impossible the culture of it should succeed anywhere but in the kingdom of mexico this anecdote whether fabulous or true was calculated notwithstanding to give me at the time some uneasiness but now while writing this that i am well assured of the fallacy of the assumption i cannot but smile at the folly of those people who make deductions which they generalize from circumstances true only in particular cases by then i entered san juan del rey it was eleven o'clock i was in hopes of purchasing here some cochineal but the black alcalde not being at home i determined to wait till his wife returned she came in a little time and i immediately asked her for four branches from her nopals and without giving leisure for reflection showed her a dollar which persuaded better than words i at the same time inquired of her respecting a variety of matters which i had either omitted to obtain information upon before or which i thought might need comparison with what i had learnt at oaxaca though chiefly respecting the mixture of the silvestri or wood cochineal with the black or fine she illustrated the different points i questioned her upon and to my satisfaction and permitted me to select four branches from the nopals which i placed in a fifth box after taking a nap i set off precisely at noon and again ascended the famous mountain la costa frequently casting back an anxious eye on the beautiful country i was about to leave how numerous were the curious plants i beheld how much did i regret my incapacity of carrying away specimens of all i did however alight to pull up some of the bulbs of the lily of st iago or amaryllis sermosissima i collected six dozen of the roots though with extraordinary difficulty on account of their being a foot deep in the ground and that stiff and very hard as the soil was i had nothing but a knife with which to remove it while a vertical sun darted its noontide rays on my back i likewise found a violet with a bulbous root like that of the lily of which i dug up a dozen roots i gathered moreover a hundred oxales sorrels with bulbous roots folus octonatus pelatus osatus i moreover gathered some seeds of a thistle large as our artichoke plants some of the fruit of a sort of medlar some of the sabina juniperus and certain acorns large as our largest walnuts while thus endeavoring to dissipate the tiresomeness incidental on a long journey i perceived that my muleteer had turned out of the king's highway which topists are expressly forbidden to do and i was violently enraged at his conduct promising within myself at least to hold his trink guilt or drink money however we began to descend by roads very bad it is true but which lessened our way by a league i then allowed that my guide was not so much in the wrong and was pacified at the bottom of the slope i found the beautiful sage with corn rose flowers which i had seen at oaxaca from this i extracted seeds as well as from another variety with blue and highly beautiful flowers while threading a narrow path cut out of the rock i had a singular encounter it was of an indian who was driving two hogs to oaxaca they were of monstrous size and i was obliged 
to stand aside in order to allow them to pass while in consequence i was attentively looking at them i observed and not without a hearty laugh at the while that they had pumps or rather boots on what said i to myself a hog in pumps while the poor indian that drives them is barefoot the hogs had really on each of the joints of their parted hoof a boot with a sole of strong leather and the whole so neatly sewed and fitting with such exactitude that at first i thought them natural appendages belonging to the animal it was in vain for me to puzzle my brain for the reason of such a whim and i was fain to apply for information to the indian for him he seemed to pity my ignorance astonishment and laughter and in a very phlegmatic manner answered that it was to prevent their becoming footsore reflection made the motive seem but reasonable for the animals were so fat and are naturally so lazy that if they wound their feet they would have fallen away and even have remained on the road when at dinner at an after period with the intendant of santo domingo on his asking me respecting the roads in mexico i felt a strong inclination of relating this fact in order to qualify him to form himself an opinion but as there was a large company at table to whom i was unknown i was fearful on giving account of a circumstance so singular to pass for an inventor of fables i therefore merely answered his interrogation by telling him in general terms that i found them very bad and in good truth though the road i was now travelling was that of guatemala and the only highway on which is transported the various produce of a valley which extends four hundred and eighty leagues i did not find thirty leagues of road on which a carriage could pass after a long journey of sixteen larger leagues i again revisited my charming hamlet of galiatitlan i saluted it on arrival full of gratitude for its having first presented me with the delightful spectacle of a plantation of nopals it was too late and i was too much fatigued to visit the indian into whose grounds i had entered on my way to oaxaca i therefore thought only of getting my supper and retiring to rest i slept but little i had judged it requisite to give air to my plants and for the purpose placed my boxes opened in the court of the casa real and every half hour paid them a visit in the intervals between i took a walk in the churchyard which was at no great distance a beautiful moonlight showed me the way and with pleasure i collected the roots of amaryllis from the tomb at this instant calling to mind the night thoughts of young i said to myself is it then really consequent that reflection on the immortality of the soul should give rise to melancholy as the case with that gloomy doctor by no means but rather let us while through this vale we speed call every floweret in our way at two in the morning i again closed my cases carried them indoors and laid down to sleep till dawn as soon as i arose i hastened to the garden of my indian the cochineal harvest had been gathered and i merely took from him four plants of the nopal which had already rooted and for which i gave him six reals it is to be observed that i burthened myself with these nopals and with four other plants which i collected at san antonio de los Cues, apparently from an excess of caution and that i might not have anything wherewith to blame myself but how wise this caution will be seen for all of the branches loaded with cochineal which i had bought at oaxaca and san juan del rey and on which i placed my chief dependence not one was preserved to the end of my voyage as i had the affliction of seeing them all rot one after the other and of being obliged to throw them into the sea while traversing the gulf of mexico it was to those plants on which i placed the least reliance that i had to ascribe the ultimate success of my project 
as these were the only ones which survived the voyage and which have multiplied the indian who sold me the nopal plants was the same who let me my horses and his son acted as my topeth this afforded me means to hold a very interesting conversation and acquire considerable information respecting that culture to which he paid his chief attention it was this man who presented me with some of the fibrous network of the cocoa of which he informed me the nest for the cochineal was made it was from him also i understood and at his plantation that i saw that the mother cochineals for the succeeding harvest are preserved in open air and on the same plant and not as averred by the abbe reynal and that even in his last edition on detached branches put under shelter in the house i made as very natural remark on hearing this that i should have thought them liable to be destroyed by the rains but this objection he set at rest by the answer he gave which was that in the stormy season of the year se tapan con petales they are sheltered under leaves at the plantation of this indian i likewise as i had done before in some of the churchyards collected some buds of a beautiful syringa asperifolis lilac but they perished when on point of departure with his son we perceived near a fountain his young sister who at that instant was fetching water she was a lovely brunette about nine or ten years of age with blue eyes and the most beautiful complexion i had just before given her a real she drew nigh her brother and without uttering a syllable slipped it into his hand my poor brother she no doubt reasoned is now about to travel on foot over six weary leagues of ground for merely a wretched real and which even my father puts in his pocket and has but four tortillas and some pimento for his dinner suppose i give him this real he will be able to fare better and better be able to endure the tediousness of the way and the burning heat of the sun such in short was the reflection i read in the expressive eyes full of interest and compassion of this amiable child and in the look of gratitude the young lad directed at his sister i was deeply affected by this little incident come hither my child said i she came blushing and uneasy about the motive of my calling her i gave her another real which i bade her keep for herself the little maid laughed with joy took the real and turned her back on me without the slightest thanks but what thanks were necessary did she not smile throughout the whole morning i amused myself with pleasing reflections on fraternal love and this incident confirmed me in the idea i had ever entertained that a tender affection for their brothers is not uncommon with females and that it could not have been scenes like this which originated the observation of rara concordia fratrum incidents like these it is which render one disposed to love mankind but how rare are they in large associations of the species and where did i meet with this was it not among the steepest mountains in the most distant parts of america amid people little removed from the wild state of nature end of section fourteen Section 15 of Travels to Oaxaca by Nicholas Joseph Thierry de Menonville, an anonymous translation from the French. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. After proceeding three leagues on my way, I met a herd of swine consisting of about sixty, all of them in new boots. Now indeed, said I, accosting the Indian who was driving them along, I plainly see that this is not a mere whim, but a fashion, quite the fashion of the country. In truth, now all that these gentry want to draw down not only admiration, but even the envy of their drivers, 
would be to make an addition to their dress dress of a cloak hat and ruffles but all i could say failed of exciting a smile for the indian was of a most grave and serious turn of mind when i arrived at atletwaka i was obliged to go to the rector to change some gold he appeared to me to have great partiality for this shining metal and to be ready if needed to give me silver for all i had he showed me the stuffed skins of two animals which he called tigers but which were just as much the skins of tigers as of mexican bears of this i am satisfied as at an after period i bought some of both the one and the other these much smaller those of the rector were six feet in length from head to tail and two feet and a half in height the head face hair and teeth of them were similar to those of the cat but the color of the hair was that of the fawn very bright perfectly smooth and without any longitudinal stripes or oscillary spots these monstrous animals said to be very ferocious and sanguinary had been killed within two leagues of the village would i could have borne them away with me the rector would assuredly have parted with them for gold on dismissing my topeth i gave him another real as well because he was the brother of the sweet little indian girl as because he had conducted himself with propriety and that on such occasions i seldom restricted myself to abiding by the regular prescriptions for drink money these kind of people are commonly so wretched and at the same time appeared to me so worthy that i always considered a real or two extra not idly thrown away i again crossed the numerous windings of the river de las vueltas and again with the like impatience and vexation but at the same time with less inconvenience on account of being better mounted i was unable however to reach don dominquillo before night where i again met with a jubilee and procession for it had been ordained i think that from paris to mexico had i gone i should constantly see nothing else this one i found interesting the music of the charming salve maria which i took down in notes is really excellent it was sung in chorus the parts given in perfect unison and was a piece of music altogether capable of pleasing even the most delicate when justice and peace tired of living with mortals by whom they daily were insulted abandoned for ever their ungrateful hosts fame says they took refuge in heaven from whence they came the rumor here was wrong after wandering over the different portions of the globe constantly vagabonds and constantly abused these celestial beings withdrew to a corner of north america yes the village of don dominquillo this little hamlet simple in appearance unadorned by the meretricious works of art but rich but charming from its site on the slope of a hill at the confluence of the rio grande and that of las vueltas appeared to them worthy of their abode and here i enjoyed the mild preference of these amiable but slighted powers the circumstance which called for this remark i shall relate while i was at supper i sent for a topeth with whom i had entered into contract for furnishing me with horses for kikatlan the knave had the address to cheat me of three piastres without my noticing the fraud his lively and seemingly ingenuous looks and possibly the cares with which my head were filled combined to lay me open to deception the keeper of the casa real however perceived the fraud and pointed it out to me but the topeth was already out of sight with my money in the meantime after the procession while walking in the public square i saw two indians carrying each of them a staff six feet long on which they supported both their hands i paid at first but little attention to this incident till at length 
I heard a cry repeated thrice in the Mexican language, and three whistles. In an instant, my rogue of a guide presents himself, out of breath with running, and makes a number of low bows to the men with staffs, the distinctive marks of their office. The one was the alcalde, the other his assessor. As I saw them advancing towards me, I met them halfway. In my presence, in a very deliberate manner, they interrogated the topeth respecting the number of horses I had requested and the price he had asked. He confessed the whole he had asked, except two reals. They next inquired of me how much I had paid. I told them the exact sum. Turning next to the topeth, they asked him if he had shown me the table of fares, and on his confessing that he had never even mentioned it to me, the alcalde very severely, though at the same time without the least symptom of passion, reprimanded him, first for having exacted more than the ordinance prescribed, and secondly for having stated the sum he had received at two reals less than what it really was. While they were speaking, I minutely observed, by help of the moonlight, the features of these simple officers. They exhibited not the least symptom of rage or indignation, nor even the least emotion. Immutable as the law, they judged and decided by its rule, and never did senator, counselor, or judge, with all their sumptuous paraphernalia of office, in silk and ermined robes, in scarlet or in black, in coronets, caps, or periwigs. Never, I say, did either look more august or majestic than did, on this occasion, these poor and tattered Indians. After convicting the culprit on his own confession, they made him restore the whole sum he had received, after which, entering my apartment, where it was a light, they attempted to calculate what was justly his due. But little use to handle money, they were unable to succeed, and I was obliged to take upon myself this task, when having shown to their satisfaction that I had given three dollars and two reals more than I should have done to the topeth, the alcalde restored them to me, and gave the remainder to the topeth, enjoining him to have his horses ready at the hour appointed. I was dumb with admiration. I thought myself in a dream, a judgment so unartificial, so speedy, so perfectly equitable, was what I could not conceive. Actuated by the enthusiasm by which I was filled, I gave the casero, by whose instituting the process I had enjoyed this interesting spectacle, a dollar, and begged the alcalde to keep in his own hands the three dollars and two reals for the purpose of distributing them among the poor of the hamlet. I would willingly have given, had I means, a thousand piastres to have perpetuated the memory of this honorable act of justice. For it cannot be disguised that the best means of enforcing among mankind the practice of wisdom and virtue is to honor and reward even the most insignificant actions which denote its existence. Men always act from some interested motive, and what motive can be regarded as more valuable than that which has for its end the esteem of one's fellow creatures and posterity? Let us then but applaud good actions, and those same applauses will prove the seeds of others. With these pleasing fancies I retired to rest, and sweet was the slumber I enjoyed. But at two in the morning, solicitous of making a long day, I awoke my topeth. The rogue was out of temper, which I noticed the most plainly in the passage of Rio Grande. In this river I saw an animal swimming, which I took to be either a crocodile or a caiman though its muzzle did not yet seem to be so long as theirs. I inquired what animal it was, but instead of informing me, in order to prevent the gratification I might receive 
from satisfying my curiosity by a more minute examination the malicious rogue picked up a stone and threw it with such nicety that at eighty paces distant he struck it on the head which occasioned it to dive under water and it did not appear again at dinner he met with his reward as i neither gave him a meal nor money to buy drink as i was else accustomed to do i reached kikatlan at nine and after purchasing a provision of bread left that place at ten passing without stopping by the guardhouse the chief of it whose good will i had insured on passing before whether on this account whether owing to his being employed in counting the mules laden for oaxaca paid no attention to mine but made a sign to my topeth to proceed without unloading his cases i squeezed his hand in token of gratitude and clapped spurs into my horse but little afternoon the sun almost at its zenith and vertical above me i had to climb the terrible and fatiguing mountain Kiotepec. i found it necessary in order to bear up against the distress occasioned by the toil and the heat of the day to seek revivification and advertence to my worthy and faithful friends in france this was my ordinary practice perpetually were they present to my imagination and often did i hold converse with them oh could you only see me here said i and with what formidable difficulties i have to contend then partners of my heart then would you learn the cost at which i seek to merit your esteem at length i attained the summit of the mountain by half past one as i found by the clock then striking at kikatlan the sound of which i still distinguished and by three had attained its foot on the banks of the rio grande here it was i first saw the sylvester cochineal on a thorny cactus with leaves nearly round i took away two articulations which i preserved for a long time at sea but which at last decayed i had laid in a store of bread but this was not enough i recollected the bad fare i had to expect if i depended on the supply of the hamlet whither i was journeying fortunately i saw an indian who had just been fishing in answer to my interrogatory of what success he had experienced i learnt he had caught a trout but this pretended trout turned out to be a species of mullet which however was delicious while changing horses at Kiotepec, i gathered from the margin of a fountain a panarachium folus lingalatus strictissimus which i continued to cultivate at port au prince but on this occasion my curiosity or rather my imprudence for i made use in raising the plant of my hands was nigh costing me dear a serpent four feet long of a yellowish color issued from the ground i had just been disturbing but without doing me the least injury it glided under some other plants this serpent was the first that i met with in my botanical collections in north america further on on crossing the rio grande i saw a lilaceous plant less eminent but which was similar to that i had found on the brink of the fountain at Quiotepec. i did not reach los Ques before half past nine at night i was dying of hunger and my fish was most welcome it was so large even that i was enabled to spare a part for my topeth who had been able to procure nothing better throughout the whole hamlet than a couple of tortillas of blue maize so much resembling pieces of slate in their appearance that i was obliged to bite them in order to be convinced of the contrary as sauce for these he had some little chili the next day trinity sunday i proposed as it would be the last time i should meet with plantations of nopals to make some fresh purchases of nopal and cochineal informed of the existence of them at this place by my franciscan on seeking i readily found them nay 
there was one close even to the house at which i lodged this however did not appear to have been sown so thinly was the cochineal spread over the leaves i then entered another in which were many young plants that had taken root and were loaded with fine cochineal i was very solicitous of procuring some of these but the owner was at mass in a third i met with some women who consented to sell me eight branches richly loaded for ten reals this was rather dear especially when compared with what my good negro of oaxaca had asked me but on my expressing such to be my opinion they remarked to me that there was upon them at least twelve ounces of cochineal and on the other hand these were what i wanted i saw in addition the plantation of a poor cultivator who was drying the seeds of the cactus with which to make bread the garden had not been planted more than fifteen months and from him for six reals i bought as many small rooted plants he was willing even to have spared me a greater number and at this rate even would gladly have parted with his whole garden but i was now most amply supplied and had great difficulty to stow my last purchase i however succeeded and set off with my cases mounted on an ass which transported me to san antonio by noon according to the estimation i made by a singular means i noticed that the ears of my ass at every turn whether eastward or westward to the north or the south constantly both the one and the other threw their shadow on the earth at an equal distance from the head and body the shade of which latter was immediately under the belly of the animal followed that the sun must be at its zenith and consequently that the hour was noon this meridian so novel and so whimsical made me laugh much and for an instant consigned to oblivion my cares and jading ride at san sebastiano i swallowed two new-laid eggs and immediately set off again with excellent horses the one i rode however was difficult to manage and had no bridle a circumstance to which i failed to pay attention on setting off or till i had left the village everything however went on well until i reached san antonio thrice had i alighted to collect seeds from plants and thrice had i again quickly mounted but the fourth time the restive beast rising on its hind legs struck at me on the stomach with the four ones and with such force as to fell me to the ground not content he spurned again his hind legs at me and galloped away at full speed for an instant i thought all was over with me and far as the little power of reflection allowed which remained with me i was anxious only for my dear cochineal i dreaded lest it would yet remain buried in mexico and be for ever lost to my country the thought went near to kill me however resuming after a few instants the faculty of breathing and my stomach by degrees recovering its tone i gathered that i did not immediately need extreme unction collecting strength i rose though with great difficulty and drew as a conclusion from the incident that a botanist should travel on foot i took no trouble about the horse it carried away not any of my property and should i have recovered i should not have mounted him again so giving him heartily to the devil i continued my journey on foot at a very gentle pace quit for a few grazes and a torn jacket in vain did i call after my topeth who travelled at a brisk rate before me and when i arrived at san francisco i found he had already been there an hour i related to him what had happened and was apprehensive he might insist on my paying for the runaway but he was satisfied with merely asking for a note which might account for his not taking it back 
which I gave him, stating the restiveness of the animal and the want of a bridle as the cause. I, moreover, presented my guide with four reals for himself. The next day I took care to be provided with gentler horses and more complete furniture, and by ten o'clock arrived in sight of Tehuacan. In the course of my journey I remarked a Nicotiana tobacco plant with narrow and pointed leaves, which was conspicuous as a weed among the corn of this beautiful plain. I was anxious to pass round Tehuacan, as I had done on my way coming, but with all my baggage this was not practicable, and the Topoth, in short, flatly refused. It was necessary, therefore, I should travel through it. The town appeared to me a desert, and I compared it to those enchanted cities the work of a genie, when a magician of the most formidable kind, in my eyes, made his appearance before me and drove away the pleasing ideas of enchantment. This magician was no other than a stout, sharking customs officer, mounted on an excellent horse, his saddle bow beset both in front and behind with pistols. This redoubted champion advancing summoned me in the king's name to return to the customs house. I answered to him in a tone of voice which denoted vexation, that I certainly should pay all the respect due to the king's orders, but that if he had had the least notion of civility, he would not have suffered me to have rode through the whole of the town merely for the pleasure of making me return. However high the tone I assumed, my heart was chilled with fear. The word customs house turned my brain, and I gave up all for lost. I shall have, said I, to open all my cases. My pilferings will all be exposed. There may be laws which prohibit the transport of cochineal on Nopals. Nay, this ought necessarily to form a part of the policy and ordinances of this people, one so anxious to maintain the exclusive possession of this commerce. Should this be the case, adieu to all my treasures, all will be ravished from me and confiscated. What grief for me! What shame! Cursed encounter! Unlucky travels! I was in a dreadful state, though it must be allowed that at times danger affords resources which are gathered merely from its presence. On reaching the customs house, I instantly determined on my plan. Composing my countenance, therefore, I entered with an easy air, and expressed much discontent at the trouble which had thus unnecessarily been occasioned me. I found two Spaniards in the office, one of whom, the director, lessened my color by the affable and prepossessing manner in which he received me. I told him that I was a botanist, that I had been employed in collecting medicinal plants throughout the whole province with which my trunks were full, and that I had with me nothing else. I added, moreover, that I begged they would satisfy themselves on this head and proceed through the examination as speedily as possible, as I was solicitous of reaching Veracruz for the purpose of going on shipboard. The director said that this was enough and entered into the most friendly conversation with me. However, I notwithstanding caused my boxes to be opened, although against his inclination, for the purpose of satisfying him and out of bravado toward his deputy, who appeared to be inquisitive and suspicious. On looking over the cases, in which among a variety of herbs and roots, with which he was altogether unacquainted, was the vanilla, which was equally unknown to him. He shrugged up his shoulders and smiled. I opened others, which contained cochineal, covered and mingled with other plants, Aquista grana, this is cochineal, said he, apparently with surprise, but at the same time with an air of indifference, which argued nothing displeasing. In my notice of his observation, I seemed equally indifferent. He afterwards noticed the double bottoms, and fancied for an instant he had caught his bird, signifying as much by a glance, which at the same time, seemed to hint that he could shut his eyes occasionally 
to what he could not see without injuring, but rendered bold by the assurance I had acquired that no objection would be taken to my cochineal, I raised the bottoms, partitions, and the pieces of wood which separated the plants, when my nopals were distinguished among other plants, carefully folded in fine white paper. What are these nopals for, this cochineal? For an unguent, for what malady, the gout. Ah, ah, but do see, exclaimed he then, laughing heartily as he pointed out among my collection the nuts of the most common fruits of the country, and seeds even of its most despised herbs. The director now obliged me to shut all my cases. Before I did this, I picked up even the smallest leaves which had fallen, but with so much care that they could entertain not the slightest doubt of my placing on them a value far greater than on the cochineal. They could not, indeed, help admiring to see a Frenchman come from such a distance to collect some of the meanest herbs of the country, and frankly confessed that no Spaniard could be found possessed of equal resolution. Walking in the court, I saw drying in the sun the fruit of a certain cactus, not larger than currants. In turn, I inquired what use it was applied to. To making of tarts was the answer. He invited me, moreover, to taste them. I found them delicious and preserved some of the grains." From all he had seen, the director concluded within himself that I was an eminent doctor, and in consequence entreated me to visit a friend of his who was ill. I told him that unless his majesty himself required my assistance, I could on no account procrastinate my stay. At the same time, I inquired of him to whom I had to address myself to obtain horses. He informed me I must apply to the alcalde mayor. This circumstance displeased me. I apprehended a second inquisition, and could not hope perpetually to be favored as I had hitherto been by good fortune. However, no choice was left, nor could I draw back. I therefore paid him a visit, and found him employed with a man dressed in black, whom at first I mistook for the alcalde himself. It was not long, however, before I was undeceived. Don Marcos Chopin, Caballero de San Iago, Gobernador de Tehuacan, Alcalde Mayor, informed me in person that it was he to whom I had to address myself. He conversed with me with an affability, a suavity of manners which could not be surpassed by the most amiable among our French gentry and immediately directed an alguacil to go in search of horses for me. I entreated that they might be gentle and with good bridles, as a cause of which injunction I related the adventure which had befallen me. He laughed heartily at my narrative, and observed that I must in this case have been but an indifferent horseman. "'Pardon me, senor,' replied I." but my horse was unusually restive. End of section 15